War and Peace, something that is on the top of all of these lists of top books that you must read and literature that will change your life. By all accounts, this is a novel as someone who is really into history, someone that loves philosophy, is set up to be the ideal book for a person like me to read. But what's that mean for you? So myself and my recording partner, Crypto, who I'll introduce to you in a minute, have gone through this book. Crypto being a by trade historian and me myself being very passionate about the subject. We wanted to really dive into this and kind of look at, you know, what was the conversation around War and Peace? There's even like this podcast that does like 365 days of War and Peace, one for each section. Kind of interesting how that broke out. But as we got into it, just the sheer size of this, the 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 way you're thrown into the chaos of the narrative at the time, it just didn't work for me. It was too much to juggle. I couldn't keep it all straight. My goal with this video here was to create one video that encapsulates our entire four or five month journey through this. All of our discussions as we're learning about these characters and what do we think they mean. And as Tolstoy just like toys with you and gives you ideas just to rip them down later and then give you another idea and you're like, oh, okay, I'm on board. And then he rips that idea down later. It's fascinating the way that Tolstoy takes you through a narrative that makes you question your own expectations of how you interpret events. So obviously, if this is your favorite book, feel free to consume all the hours of this all at once. But we fully understand that if you are coming back and forth through this as you read or even just bite sized points throughout your day, feel free to leave time codes down below to know where you are. And trust me, I wouldn't want to sit here and look at my face. I've kind of got a face for a podcast, if you know what I mean. But feel free to ask questions, obviously, as you move through this, because that was the biggest part for me is having a conversational part through War and Peace. So here's the thing. As I said, the book plops you off in a very tumultuous time, and not just Russia's history, but Europe and the world even's history. And I'm going to leave a link to a before you read video that is a quick little presentation of all the information that I think really will help open this up. But let's kick off today's discussion with the French Revolution. What was it? Well, like most of Europe, France at the time had a monarchy that led the country to poverty, poor economic policies, and resulted in somewhat limited resources. So the French people said, yeah, we don't like this. Let's get rid of the king. Yay! But that's when Napoleon swooped in and eventually crowned himself the new emperor of France. <laughs> Contention filled the air across the continent as the elephant, France, threatens the whale, Britain. For many reasons, occupation of Malta, distribution of resources and trading. And oh, yeah, there's that whole assassination attempt on Napoleon that I don't think went over too well. But it's with this news, the assassination of Duc de Guillaume, that we murder the last of the possible return to Bourbon monarchy. The death of monarchies. War was inevitable in Europe. Napoleon even writes to King George, and I quote, Peace is the desire of my heart, but war has never been contrary to my glory. And this was the precursor to this novel. A precursor to what historians argue might be the first total war. A war that encompasses an entire nation, from thoughts to resources. Everything almost changes to be dedicated to ensuring your nation wins the war. This event changed warfare in Europe forever. So many authors will present things to you and kind of let you make up your own mind on things. Well, that's kind of not what's going to happen with Tolstoy. He was a very opinionated person. So we encourage you to join us as we maybe look at what Tolstoy's arguments are, what his thesis of history and philosophy of life, of morality even is, as this is a book that is so broad, you can spend a lifetime studying it. So join us in challenging that, questioning ourselves, and even looking at how do we potentially look at things differently or need to reevaluate things in the same way that these countries were really evaluating their lives, their monarchies, their morality even in this culture. So we invite you to join us and we find out together what is War and Peace all about. So part one, we have the Shearer party, the bear party, <laughs> the Rostov dinner party. The party in the night. <laughs> well, and funeraling. Oh. Yeah, oh. and we got the Bolkhansky estate in the, in the uh, rural areas of Russia, I guess. Did the funeral really feel like a funeral? It didn't feel like a downer to me too much. <laughs> <laughs> it was more like a thriller. It was, whew, it's, it's a it hoot, did, I tell yeah, It didn't you. feel very somber, that's what I'm saying. 
So we open up in July of 1805, and what would a Russian party be without some philosophy and discussion of the death penalty, right? I mean, I know I throw all my parties with a little philosophy in the beginning before we get to the crazy part. (laughs) So Anna believes that war is coming to the East, right? And Russia is going to be Europe's savior. And, you know, we've talked about the, the, you know, the first two wars of the coalition and how that this has impacted things. But what's interesting here is Russia is going through this identity question, right? Because, you know, this is still fresh on the mind of Catherine the Great, who just recently had passed away. And she did a lot of uh, bringing a French culture. Radical changes for what Russia was used to, right? Especially in the realm of aristocrats and monarchs and women in power and choice and freedoms and bucking the system and changing the norms. Things are getting crazy in Russia at this time. Right. And a lot of that is due to Catherine. I mean, Catherine loved French culture. She loved the Enlightenment, the ideals of it, liberty and all. But hey, uh, yeah, I'm still going to maintain power and I couldn't quite free the serfs. But hey, there was a lot of other elements that I liked. I think it's important to note that Catherine the Great is somebody that is very well educated and is Polish uh, born and she's educated by all of these other, you know, uh, Western philosophers and ideas in Europe. And she, when she brings them to Russia, it, it is something that is new for them, but is a standard way of life for her. And if we're going to talk about patriotism or even nationalism, in a sense, you and I have discussed before George Orwell. And I'll put a link down below to all the citations as we move through them. But he had a great little uh, essay, if you will, on his notes on nationalism. And he says, by patriotism, I mean devotion to a particular place and a particular way of life, which one believes to be the best in the world but has no wish to force upon other people. Patriotism is of its nature defensive, both militarily and culturally. And I think that's where we're starting to kind of have those questions of, you know, patriotism being a defensive stance and nationalism being an offensive stance. And I think you're going to see a lot of questions about that with these characters and their uh, bravado, right? When does when does bravery and belief in your country, when does that go on the offensive? And when does that offensive become nationalism and not listening to other ideas or thoughts? I also believe, and I, I, I love the Orwell quote, and I think that he's right about it at the time that this is taking place, but I also see that this is an evolution of patriotism and nationalism as they almost almost they almost seem to be switching roles where you're not patriotic unless you're aggressively defending the belief that, you know, the Russian way is best, the French way is best, the, the German way is best. And just being nationally prideful of your nation is more of kind of that laid back of like, yeah, that's what I am. It's cool because we're seeing that kind of reverse in these aristocrats where you're not getting the honor unless you're going out and fighting. You're not courageous. You aren't a true Russian if you're going out and, you know, participating and battling those evil Frenchmen to save the continent. We see that flip-flop of evolution of the ideologies of patriotism versus nationalism. And that's going to that's, that's be huge for the next two centuries until almost World War I. Now, at this party, we got a lot of self-interest too, right? You got Prince, you know, Vasily, who's basically pushing Anna Pavlovna about a position for his son in Vienna. We have uh, Princess Drubetskoy, who is grabbing Prince Vasily's hand and pushing for her son, Boris, basically. But you see how (laughs) you got a lot of people that are using Marry me, marry me, marry me, marry me. That's what I felt like. It was like, you get a wife, you get a wife, you get a wife. (laughs) It's well, it's who you know, right? And it's also who you marry is not just for love. It's a way of social advancements. It's social mobility. It's increasing your land even. Money, status, power, influence. Yeah, this is definitely not for love. Although there's a little bit of there's a little romance sprinkled in there for you people that need that. <laughs> well, I mean, it's certainly not short for uh, Prince Andre, who's talking about how you shouldn't get married and women ruin life and slow you down. He is completely disenfranchised with this concept of love, as is probably Tolstoy as he's writing this. But he's definitely kind of the more aggressive stance compared to some of these others that. It's symbiotic in a sense of getting something in terms of social advancement, but Prince Andre is saying that this is not even worth it almost, and he's so disillusioned. That's his reason for going to war. It's not even this the patriotism. It's just to escape the social mire that he's in. 
I also feel like it, Tolstoy is setting the stage for not, I don't want to say how terrible these people are, but to give us some insight on the humanity or how they believe humanity should be in Russian society at this time period. Yeah. Now, we also have his uh, wife, you know, Lisa, Liza, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, and Pierre, they arrive. And Pierre is kind of the guy that's been educated out in the West. So, ooh, there's that West versus East thing coming in, right? And by <laughs> him him being educated out West and him sympathizing with the French, whoa, that doesn't fit with our national uh, or patriot uh, patriotic agenda here in Russia. And Pierre, ooh, mm social social stigma here right we don't like pierre right we need to get rid of him because he's not fitting in with the social agenda he is a social pariah Ooh, they don't want to touch him with a 10-fold pole no 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 so the viscount de mortemar he comes in and tells the story of duke dongyon and this is probably the part when i got for, well, the first time i got super excited while reading this book because I, I think you may know that there's an actual Duc de Guillon that was very popular in the time because, well, um, Napoleon pissed a lot of people off with it. <laughs> so going back to our intro, we did have the discussion about how, uh, you know, French becoming the first non-monarchy country. Whoa, like all the monarchs are freaking out, right? And for him to go and, you know, there was, there was attempts on his life and it was, you know, guillotine or imprisonment, stuff like that. But this was like a case where he was taking out the last in the lines of the Kunduz. And with the death of him, he's kind of like taking out the possible return to monarchy symbolically. And boy, did this set Europe on fire when he did this. And in conjunction with that, remember, Napoleon is a self-appointed emperor even regarded higher than a king and he he gives himself the crown he won't even let the pope you know anoint him you know the new emperor of france this has all the monarchs shaking their books boots because this is a direct violation of the divine right of kings and that anybody can rise up to power this is changing the norm of european feudalism which has been the standard for nearly five centuries mind blown you better believe they were shaken scared and they were get they would do anything to get him out of power because he's setting a scary new normal and small note for other history lovers like us it is july so he crowns himself emperor in december he's first consul now uh, i don't remember if he's already first consul for life but he's basically rewriting the constitution he's making himself this and he does this through appealing to the people directly and you'll notice we don't really do that in the united states or a lot of countries because that's kind of sidestepping politics it's sidestepping opponents and it makes it look like you're the choice of the people he, napoleon did a lot of things that were considered machiavellian to put himself into power and he continues that that reign throughout his his career if you will and very much supported by the people because he's giving them what they want. He, he took away and got rid of the monarch. He's feeding them. He's giving them jobs. He's, he's increasing that idea of French patriotism and French nationality. And he's expanding their empires. He's making life better for these people. He has the support of the people, especially coming out of the reign of terror where they were chopping everybody's heads off. He, he's given them stability, something they haven't had for many, many years, probably two or three decades. So when Pierre's all like, yeah, Napoleon, he's, he seems like a cool guy. Like Prince Andre's like, yeah, we, we got to go, Pierre. Like this isn't working out. <laughs> so where do we go? Let's go to another party where we're gambling and have bears. <laughs> I really like this part. I feel like it, it again, it gives us more of that um, gritty human feel. That was the first time I know that it gets grittier and grittier as we go along. But I really like we, we get a true sense of what these guys are really like. You know, they're kind of hoity-toity in their party and putting on the, the fake personas. Here we get to see their true nature, natures of the drinking and the gambling and the socializing and, you know, the, the, the manly nature. Because they kind of start, you know, boasting a little bit here in this part of the story. Really, I feel like starts moving forward a little bit of what's going to take place for these guys in the future. Well, it's kind of the Anna Karenina world too, right? Where we see how much society can influence us, right? Pierre is very impetuous, right? And you have like the Dolukov, oh gosh, I'm so bad at pronunciations. You have the guy that drank a lot of rum and was bet to sit, sit on the windowsill and, and pound this bottle of rum, right? You have these like 
college frat house like behaviors that are coming on as a influence as a as a result the of the drink society. off right <laughs> yeah you start to see how these characters react to these social pressures because that's exactly what russia was it was a gigantic social pressure pushing down on each other until the bigger weight won and then the story kind of pivots to a new shift of bringing in death and count buzukov dies and the big question is, where will this money go? I mean, it wouldn't be a Russian story if we weren't talking about death and inheritance. Well, I think almost the plot pivots, but I think the theme stays there, right? Because you oh, still yeah, plot. have- Oh yeah, plot, I'm sorry, yes, plot, you're right, you're right. Because you have still the self-interest of the characters. You still have Prince Vasily like, trying to sneak in in the middle of the last rites, uh, um, I'm sorry, extreme unction for Christian Orthodoxy, and he's trying to like sneak in to see this will. And uh, honestly, Pierre's kind of a doof until this scene where I start to solve some of the humanity with him, right? The fact that he cared uh, as an illegitimate son, I believe, if, if I'm not mixing things up, that he was an illegitimate son and still cared about, you know, the count as he was passing away. He cared about humanity. He saw him as a person and expressed that and grieved with him. Well, Vasily and, you know, Katish, they're sneaking around trying to figure out who's going to earn the money. Arguably, we go back to the whole monarchy thing, right? In monarchies, who you were, you were given that. It's what you were born as, right? As opposed to now, here comes Westernization with, you know, Napoleon, who could make himself a self-made man. You know, Prince Vasily is the guy that's more worried about what's going to be handed to him and what's his wealth going to be. You hit the nail on the head. This is the definition of how callous these people are. And I think that's what Tolstoy's driving forward here because we're going to see the evolutions of these characters as we move through the novel. You know what I think it's time for? Another party. Another Let's party. Go to the Rostov's dinner party, right? The after after party. <laughs> And now you know what time it is. It is time to head out to the country, to the Polkonski, the Polkonski Parties are over. State. Parties are over, in a sense. But Prince <laughs> Nikolai. Now, again, there's going to be a difference between Prince Nikolai Polkonski and Nikolai Rostov, right? And they'll just call him Nikolai if it's just Rostov. And it'll be Prince Nikolai if it's uh, Polkonski. So Polkonski, his children are Prince Andrei and Maria, Right. And you see him tending to his estate, you know, raising his daughter, Maria, and the tutoring. And he's stiff with her, but he does care about her in a sense. And that's when Maria gets back to her room with the letter from Julie uh, Kerrigan, her closest childhood friend, who basically writes and sends her flattering comments and says, Yo, here in Moscow, they're all super obsessed with this war. Can you believe that? Yeah, this, I think this is really where you start to see the contrast in the characters and the people that are those callous individuals and the ones that really true about and those ones that really truly care about the cost of human life and that these aren't just numbers on a page. These aren't just dots on a map that these are people that are eventually going to die. I wonder, too, we've read a lot of Tolstoy and you know that he viewed that Moscow was more the old Russian way. And I think it was culturally too. And in St. Petersburg, you know, hey, that's farther off uh, to the West. That's that's closer over there to all those European people. That was more progress. That was Westernization, right? And in, in Moscow, they're all worried about gossip, right? And it's almost like this symbolic letter because I think Boris earlier was talking about how all Moscow carries about is gossip. So it's like the old monarchy, uh, symbols of that in terms of the gossip, in terms of Prince Vasily uh, worrying about the the income and, and how that's going to be passed down. Did you think that uh, Tolstoy was critiquing that? Like, I don't know if he was so much authorially critiquing it, but he certainly put it out there as a juxtaposition to the westernization that's happening with Napoleon. I definitely think that he's kind of taking a little jab here and saying, hey, you know, this is the way we've always done this and we need to look at things better because the, it was always that standard of, for the aristocrats that eh, war is just the way of life for us and they didn't really care about the loss of life. And he's like, well, maybe we should care. The, these are people's, you know, fathers and sons and brothers that are giving up their lives for for what? Well, I mean, with Prince Andre, it's really strange the way that he's just so disenfranchised with his life that he's willing to go. And I think it was rather touching with Mario wishing him goodbye. As touching as it gets, um, I tr I was really trying to connect with these characters. Part one. Do you I think it was not... genuine, though? 
I do. I do. I think okay. it was the most genuine for me, but at the same time, I honestly had a hard time connecting with the characters at this point, like in book part one. Um, I wasn't the most invested yet, but I did like the characters, but I wasn't like, ex I was expecting to be super in love with them, right? And here comes Maria, who is set up to, I don't know, she seems like she's going to be the moral compass of this story, right? Like, we always have these authors that like to pick one character, they're like, this is the character that always knows what's right, right? Yeah. And it seems to me like Maria is going to be that moral compass for the story. She's giving, you know, her atheist brother who's going off to war and can't find himself. I mean, he's young. He doesn't know himself, but she gives him this cross and gives him a vision of what you're fighting for that he himself doesn't perhaps know yet. Yeah, I don't know. I guess I, I struggled with this of who was the clear protagonist of the story? Who Who's going to take us through this adventure? Uh, I mean, Pierre's barely in it. Uh, we, we, we could pick several of the princes, right? Prince Andre, uh, Prince Drubesky, I don't know how to say that, uh, Natasha Rostov. I mean, who, who is our who is our main character? I don't feel like we really have one. Yeah, Natasha, I mean, she was barely in it, and except for like that weird triangle. You're, you're right. I, I didn't have like a clear main protagonist. Uh, I don't know if I have to have one, but I feel like there's something that was is not pulling me forward besides the ideas, which I do love. Um, or the anticipation that this is going to be that contrast of war and peace. And we've seen the peace now. We've got to get to the war. And that's what's drawing you into this narrative, I feel like, as they're talking about all this war. Eventually, it has to happen, right? It does. And it's almost kind of like the war is symbolic of the Russian soul. The Russian soul, the Russian culture at this point is searching for who are they going to be, this westernization versus this patriotism of the old Russian way. You know, and, and along comes Napoleon, and there's this question of him forcing, you know, client states, and will he push these liberal values and these ideas of, you know, monarchies are a thing of the past across all of Europe. I think this is not just a battle for Europe. I think this is a battle for the Russian soul of, of who are we going to be. Well, uh, you bring up a lot of good points. And the last thing I want to talk about before we move on to the next book is that whatever it's going to be, it's going to have a lot of French. Woo! <laughs> There's a lot of French. Uh, many, you know, historical literature, historians, peoples study this book, and they estimate that nearly 2% of the novel is in French. And depending on which translation you get, you may or may not even have that French and, and lose out on a tremendous amount of the story. I mean, 2% in a thousand page book or whatever your version is is a lot and that's kind of important because many critics of the story say that french is used to represent or be be pretentious or uh, deceitful in the story because you'll notice that certain characters like prince nokolai uh he never uses french and that might be a play on well, his character as an individual of you know what does that say about him uh and then you have other characters that, you know, hate the French, but then they only speak French. And it's like, oh, okay, this is this is Napoleon, you know, I hate him, but I'm going to use French. Like, what? Like, I love the irony there. So we start off in October 1805. Oh, wait, if it is October 1805, I lied earlier because that means he was crowned in December of 1804. He crowned himself emperor of 1804. And I think I misspoke and said 1805. So yeah, I think so he's been I emperor like, almost a year. Yeah. Yeah. So there's probably already a comment to someone like being like, Uno was wrong when he was correcting. Okay. I, I caught it first. <laughs> I didn't say it though. And I'm the historian. So we'll forgive him. <laughs> I can't believe you didn't correct me. Or maybe you actually, maybe I was so confident you believed me. So the Russian troops. I thought you said 1804, but. Maybe I did. Okay. Ignore everything I just said if I said 1804. The Russian troops are stationed in Austria. Right. We're finally here. We're starting to get, um, you know, Tolstoy was famous for realism. And I think there's something to be said about this book with how fiction and reality, it's not, it, it's, it's almost pejorative to call this like historical fiction. It's almost like a lie to say it's part fiction, part reality. Tolstoy really created, I feel like, something unique with how he blends historical fact with testimonials and how he injects that into a fictional setting and characters. You definitely have a sense of a new ambiance of the story in this part of the book where you do have that really ramped up gritty realism. While it's kind of hinted at at some of the parties and the funeral and the letter and the drinking, uh, you know, and the the 
the mansplaining of everything, <laughs> you, you really start to see it ramp up here in the, the action of the book. So Commander-in-Chief, the well-dressed Katusov, who is actually a real person and is super cool to see how he's realized in this book, uh, is stationed in the soldiers pour in, and they're kind of like confused. They're like, uh, do we go in, stay nice and dressed? Do, do we sleep and get ready to march tomorrow? <laughs> like, it really starts to show the confusion of war. It starts to show where pomp and circumstance still exist, even within the, the army and navy, right? Uh, as opposed to the preparations and strategery of, of, of how often and how fast you have to move. Because I'll tell you what, Napoleon changed a lot in this war and really showed Europe how you can win battle with your feet instead of your arms. I thought it was hilarious. I love the, this part of the story. We really get to see that a lot of times these leaders don't know what they're doing. And when you hear stories about like the horrific things that happen, and then you hear these kind of like dumbfounded, like they just walked in and why were they shooting their own people? Like they didn't know they were there. And of course you're like, well, they didn't have radios and the technology is very different. But to know that sometimes the left hand was not talking to the right hand at all. <laughs> they didn't even know they were both hands. So the characters begin to talk about their social advancements after the war, bringing in kind of like that, um, the war is a means to an end, not to save necessarily Europe, but to advance my own social standing in society. I did want to point out real quick, as they're addressing each other, I did notice that there is a difference here, as in part one, everybody is introduced with their full titles, their full names. And maybe that's just because of the beginning of the story. But again, we see that abrupt change here in this part where everybody is usually referred to just by their last names. I think that's because we have less characters, but I think it is important to point out. Yeah, and I think, you know, when you think about even American military, private and then last name was like a common thing. And as you know people, you use their first names as a thing too, right? There, there's a little bit of a social element here that Tolstoy would be making that that there's that less formal military atmosphere. Everybody kind of lets their hair down a little bit that, that these people are seen more as an equal. They're not, but they are treating each other a little bit better than they would back at those aristocratic parties. There's no princes here out on the battlefield. Well, there's a couple exceptions, but th those are some of the subplots that we'll get into. <laughs> well, isn't isn't it mostly princes? Like, I thought um, the way the Russian military worked is that you kind of had to serve and that it was more upper class, per se. There wasn't as many, like, serfs serving in the war. I, th I don't know. I could be totally off on that one. Um, but you do bring up a good point about class that regardless of whatever i mean you know whether that was true or not yeah the etiquette in in russia or in the etiquette in moscow is very different than the etiquette out here in austria when they're on the battlefield but you still have somewhat of the ladder climbers right because we do have at this point dolokhov was promised the epaulets right and he was the one that was just like drinking the rum at the third story window in chapter one and now he's like trying to kind of like advance himself through the military so even though the setting is totally different you still see some themes about trying to advance yourself in society in a sense you can take the boy out of the city, but you can't take the city out of the boy. <laughs> <laughs> so Prince Andre is ordered to stay near Kutusov, if you will. And he barges in and informs him of Austria's loss at the Battle of Ulm, which is so cool. Um, I don't know how much... Do you know this battle well, Crypto? I actually had to refresh myself on this a little bit because we don't study this one too often in world history. We jump right to, you know, the good stuff of uh, 1812 when things kind of start going down for Napoleon, when the Russians finally do start winning. So um, I just know that it is a Napoleonic victory and he uses kind of the same strategy he's done before and before. Uh, he overwhelms with force and he hides his forces and attacks from basically ambush. Let's look at this map here. As you have Austria over here on the right-hand side and French on the left. I'm going to draw in some of the armies here. And you'll see that Mac right here, the Austrian force of 72,000. Again, these are coming from a couple different sources, so the numbers kind of vary and go up and down because number counting wasn't the same back then as it is now. But they're waiting on Kutusov, right? So here's where we are. We're with Kutusov, and they're heading west to meet up with Mac because they're going to team up and they're going to pound Napoleon, right? And you've got Charles and John in the south because they think Napoleon's coming through Italy. 
right? So Max, like, all right, cool. I'm going to go crush Bavar- Bavaria real quick. No big deal. Uh, Katusov, meet me over at, you know, Bavaria in, in Ulm, and we'll, we'll team up on Napoleon, right? And it's like, okay, cool. Great plan, right? And Napoleon, he's all the way over on the other side of France. There's no way he's going to be here in time, you know, past a couple weeks into September. And, oh, I was immediately wrong. <laughs> Yeah. And I think that it may be, you know, interesting that people may not understand that these feints weren't commonplace. Back then, there was no such thing as Napoleonic tactics. He's kind of inventing all this. That's why he's seen as such a military genius and strategist is nobody had done this before because we might be like, well, duh, that, 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 that makes complete sense. The Russians, the Austrians, the British, everybody else is flabbergasted by this. They'd never seen anything done like that before. Right. Right. And what's really cool about this one, too, is Napoleon, he just broke the troops into smaller corps. He let met them kind of like live off the land as opposed to having supply chains that slowed the army down. And also if that supply chain was cut off, well, the army was screwed. So it really allowed him to, as we said earlier, win the battle with feet. And as a result of, of him coming to Mac and surrounding Mac and getting the entire army to surrender, literally, where Mac had, you know, was down to 23,000 uh, soldiers is the estimate. And you go to the aftermath and you look at Napoleon's losses of 500 losses, which any loss is terrible. But it's catastrophic when you look at Austria with 10,000 lives lost. And if you look at abandoned, yeah, 20,000 yeah. 20, people just left off of Austria's side. That's how complete and, and, uh, and destructive this battle was for France to basically win it instantly like that. And I, yeah, I don't want to sound, you know, obtuse, but yeah, a, a few hundred compared to tens of thousands is inconsequential. And this sets him up for his next big victory that's going to happen in December, where he does the exact same thing and they don't learn their lesson. And he just steamrolls right through into Germany. Well, he, yeah, well, he, he moves right through, like in the story, he heads to Vienna first, right? Because by taking out Mac and Katusov still being too, so far away, he's got a straight shot to Vienna and the Southern Austrian troops kind of have to retreat a little bit. Like, it's like this, this totally disrupted their entire plan, which is, which is why I think it's so interesting. So that announcement to Katusov when they come and say, oh, Mac surrendered and it like, you know, he got macked. Like it becoming a noun. <laughs> yeah. It's it's hysterical, right? And I think it's actually kind of interesting because now it's like, well, what are we gonna do? You know, Katusov's army was fifty thousand compared to Napoleon's. He needed help. He had to back up to wait to meet up with other resources and probably head towards Prussia because Prussia was still, uh, I think they were neutral at this point in time and they were kind of hoping that Prussia would join and be like, hey, help us out, man. We need to kick Napoleon back. He's taken over our lands. Uh, The retreat wasn't, you know, a lot of history books talk about it being kind of like they were running away. It was a strategic retreat is, is what I would say to what Kutusov's doing here. They're scared. Napoleon is coming in fast. They've already gotten their butts kicked twice by Napoleon, but it also is strategic and there is a point to the retreat. When the story transitions to Austria, we have uh, Rostov and he's, you know, with the squadron commander, uh, Denisov, and he's, you know, Denisov's like, you know, hey, I trust you. Will you count my money Um, after all this bad luck I've had, you know, and losing cards and stuff. And here's we get some of the drama taking place out on the battlefield. And I kind of love this. Um, Denisov realizes that his money is missing. And it's like, oh, no, what are we going to do? Um, and Rostov, you know, grabs his, you know, weapon and he rushes out. And he's like, I know who's taking it. Uh, and, you know, little, do we tattle on him? What, what do we do? Like, you know, who, who gets in trouble and what happens here? Because in the military, you know, it, it, that's going to be a serious accusation. We're going to have a lot of problems here. Uh, but I guess, does this subplot pay off eventually? Because I felt like it kind of left me hanging. Well, I think maybe we have to look at it from, maybe from more Russian eyes if possible. They say that you'll never understand the Russian soul as a Westerner, right? So, okay, got it. No, I, I get it. But we can try, right? We can try to understand some of these things. And I think we've talked about this in the past that in a lot of Eastern countries, and including like Japan or even Korea, the we, or even communism too, we matters more than the I. And Rostov could get some personal glory by finding and vindicating the honor of his, uh, you know, squad, or his captain, Denisov. But then that kind of dishonors the whole clan, 
in a sense, right? And it's a little bit of a, do you dishonor your family? Do you dishonor your whole, you know, squadron here? Or do you let it slide? And uh, here in this culture, there, Rostov is making the decision that there's bigger forces at play here. We need to win this war. And let's just let this one slide so that we don't dishonor this, this you know, squadron and potentially put things at risk that could, you know, harm our future gains, I guess, is, is how I interpreted it. I guess I just thought about, I know that they would flog this guy and maybe he doesn't want, you know, his, you know, comrade at arms to get flogged, but your answer is much smarter. (laughs) Well, I think it serves as a personal lesson for Rostov, right? Like instead of looking and constantly like Vasily, if we look at, you know, Prince Vasily, if he was here or Boris, who's always looking for that social advancement and that cheddar, right? They would have absolutely (laughs) turned that guy in. And then there would have been problems in terms of the squadron getting in trouble and stuff like that. So I think, and I uh, I guess it would have betrayed their trust and they would have looked down upon him. Right, 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 right. So it's kind of like a a, a different way of flipping that coin that Tolstoy does a really good job of looking at it from a lot of different angles, right? Like, why wouldn't you look for personal advancement? Well, hey, sometimes there's bigger forces at play here and you need to think those things through. So we fast forward a little bit in time and it's October 23rd in Ennis, Eens. Don't know how to say that exactly. I'm sorry. Um, But the Russians and the French come to head to head over a bridge and there's confusion among them. Again, I love that there's this confusion that like nobody knows what's going on. And they're like, do you destroy the bridge? Do they destroy the bridge? Well, if they destroy it, should we destroy it before them? And it just it, it 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 adds a little bit element of for me humor in the story because you could see these guys running around like chickens with their heads cut off of like what are they supposed to do with this bridge yeah i was reading in the book that i bought the napoleonic wars there's actually it's not it's not i don't know for a fact but i was reading something i was like huh that sounds awfully familiar and we know that tolstoy read a lot of historic documents and interviews and that he could have potentially grabbed these elements and maybe infused some fictionality to them but in in history in real life Page 202 in this book, it talks about how there was a real story where two French generals crossed the bridge and basically lied and said, oh, hey, guys, you can't blow up this bridge. That would violate this uh, armistice, this treaty uh, that we're signing right now. Uh, so, so you can't blow that up. And they're like, oh, crap, we can't do that. So the French cross the dang bridge, take control of it. <laughs> before they could blow it up and that's how they basically snuck their way over the bridge like by just basically playing on social engineering and tricking the other side and again it seems so simplistic to us but these were new tactics because there is you know that honor in war of you know you're supposed to meet your enemy head on and you're supposed to fight them a certain way and napoleon's throwing all the rules out and writing a new book and that's why this is such an incredible time in history of when he is making these new norms of this is how warfare will be done. We're not doing it that stupid old way anymore. Yeah. And I think Rostov is starting to realize that about how war is not what he expected at all. So the Russian army retreats and they know they cannot defeat Napoleon. Uh, so their best bet is to meet up with the rest of the Russian army. They get a victory as they retreat finally <laughs> after two weeks. And uh, Prince Andre is injured. Right. And I think uh, this is kind of what we were talking about earlier. If their treats are typically treated as pejorative, I think, in a lot of Western textbooks. But when you look into it, they really were strategic in trying to meet up with the rest of the Russian army to buy time to get closer to Russia, a potential future ally, if they could convince them to join arms into the coalition. So now Andre's injured. He basically comes like a messenger boy and he has to go to the minister of war. Uh, not the emperor, mind you. He won't meet with him. Uh, and we get the introduction of Billy Bean. I, I yeah. don't know how to say that. That's a tough name. And I'm not sure if it's Russian, actually. I, it, it sounds like a different nation, uh, nationality. I don't know. Regardless, I'm going to butcher it because, you know, that's what I do. Uh, and this guy, I feel like, is hilarious. He's the, he's the true comic relief of the story. Uh, he's a Russian diplomat, and he is the guy that loves, loves the French and they get a little bit of an argument over this again, and we kind of see that, um, you know, bravado come back again um, between between these characters. I think you see a little bit, too, about how when the Austrians were asking him questions, they cared about Austrian topics. Did the Austrians win any wars? And the Russians were concerned about Russian things. Did the Russians win any battles when we were out on the field? 
This is where the character Bilibin, I think, exemplifies the idea that we talked about earlier of patriotism. And, you know, he's Austrian himself, but he's always referring everything as we, we this, we that, because these are different countries and nationalities and ethnicities that are fighting together against this big, bad French cause. And he's somebody that's, you know, trying to work together where, as you've pointed out many, many times, it's always the me, me, me. These guys are looking to move up in high society through their military prowess because that's how things were always done. And he's not doing that where, you know, everybody else thinking, hey, I can move up. You know, war is the great socializer and equalizer for everything. And he isn't doing that. And he's pushing more of that we propaganda that we're going to see for the very first time, um, I kind of think, in in history of, of warfare. And so now Prince Andrew, he finally answers to to basically the, the higher ups. And he has to answer a bunch of superfluous questions that the Emperor Franz of Austria was asking him, and he didn't really want to deliver that info. However, upon returning, he finds Bilibin frantically packing and announcing that the French have crossed a bridge of Tabor, and they have uh, blown by the alleys and, and allies and are now advancing on their position. So Prince Andre is uh, fleeing. He he. Well, instead of fleeing, he heads into battle. I guess I should say. And I think there's kind of um. No, he he was told to flee though, wasn't he? And he kind of he goes against well, he, the orders, right? He kind of he kind of had the option to, right? And I think this yeah. is this is part of Tolstoy's critique on um, motivations, right? You have these characters, you have everything in this novel. And to your point about it being so broad earlier, you've got these characters that are self interested. The diplomats are all about high society, social advancement. Uh, you have the emperors who are just about looking good. And you've got Prince Andre, who's probably the most complex character in, in my eyes in this book, because he's ready to head back, not because he's looking to receive honor from someone else, but because internally, intrinsically, I think he thinks that's what will give him honor because he's so disenfranchised with society and ladder climbing. He's looking for a different way to extract value in his life. And he's the only character that we really feel the the bloodshed has affected him of for the right reasons that he's he's doing this for the betterment of his country, not to just move up. Well, yeah, because on his way back, remember, he helps that woman cross when the military's like, rrr, 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 we're military. And uh, I think it to me, it showed kind of how um, he still saw people, I guess, in a sense. It's it's very. I feel very conflicted with with Prince Andrew, to be honest. But doesn't he feel like the the good person? I mean, you have the military here that are killing each other uh, when they're going through. They're catcalling the women. Uh, you, you you have that macho bravado through all of it. There's a lot of negative things that Tolstoy is putting on this military style of life. And he seems to be embodying a little bit of positivity there, uh, a glimmer of light in a, in a sea of darkness. It's gritty realism, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Well, so we head back. We meet Prince Bergation, a real figure again. So this is that uh, kind of like that that real life entering fiction or being inspired in through fiction, I guess, in a sense. And uh, he basically takes a small group of soldiers and fakes being the larger Russian army. And this was a real thing that actually happened when you read about it in the history books. And the idea was we need to slow down this French advance. And honestly, this was kind of a big deal because if they didn't do that, Napoleon would do the same thing that he did with Mac, where he'd basically take an overwhelming force, he'd use his uh, fleet movement to basically outmaneuver them and force them to surrender on his terms, right? And I think when you look at like the numbers, there were a lot of losses. I think there was 30,000 losses that uh, Bogration's uh, troops took here, but... It was, again, trying to like justify the numbers of war always sounds kind of uh, difficult, but there's there's like this almost like understanding of utilitarianism when you think when you talk about war, like you always have to play it by the numbers almost. So from a utilitarian standpoint, they lost 30,000, but saved potentially the war and other forces by being able to meet up to potentially put up a resistance against Napoleon. Spoiler alert, totally doesn't happen. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I think that a lot of times we become distance ourselves. And that's what is pretty meta here in the story of how the Russian aristocrats felt 
of, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter. It's not a big deal. But when you think about 30,000 people losing their lives or being captured or injured, that's almost unfathomable. I mean, today, think about that's half of a football stadium of people that are, are going to have something tragic happen to them. And that that social pageantry of, you know, callousness that they have back in in Moscow and in, in, in Russia, you don't see that out on the battlefield. When these soldiers start meeting up with one another, uh, we, we see that in the story here, you know, that they taunt and they laugh and they kind of joke because they know that, that, that the killing is coming and that it's going to get ugly. Yeah. Well, I think even you pointed out too, also, like there was like that letter that was going around, like they're trying to stall and um, Napoleon is just ruthless where he's like what are you doing take them out and like when you i was looking at my book there really was letters from napoleon where he's just like no take them out while you have the chance it's about that utilitarian win at any cost the machiavellian mindset of doing whatever is necessary to get your way yeah and there is some historical accuracy to those letters i don't think they're verbatim from the letters that Napoleon will end up writing to his commanders. Uh, but there are huge chunks of that that are word for word. And again, in my translation, it's in French. Uh, so I'm pretty sure it's pretty accurate uh, that that those are real things that were actually happening. And again, it just immerses you in this story of like, oh, you know, this, this it, you feel like you're there. Uh, and I, I just, I, 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 I'm, I'm giddy over this section of the, the story. Yeah, this was, this was great. This was our section. I know there are some people, um, that don't like the war section and that's fine it's not wrong of you not to like it like we loved this section as people who like to understand history and, and, and research it and get closer to it this was important for us i think from a perspective of trying to understand what motivates countries and nationalism and patriotism at this point in time now with that said it ain't all rosy for our characters this is when things start to turn upside down right because uh prince andrew's inspecting the troops and then psh, Grape shot Boom. hits the sky, and that's when everything just hits the fan. You know, you had Rostov, who was on his troops. Uh, I think he was he um was he he was a cavalry man, right? He was on a horse. He got somehow he injured his arm and got thrown off, and like kind of like ran and hid in like with some other riflemen. Like it it wasn't glorious what was happening. Grape shots hit the ground, and everything that was envisioned in all of these characters' minds was nothing to the horrors that war brought into their lives for real. And if you don't know what a grape shot is, basically imagine like two tennis balls together with a the chain between them. And so when it's shot, it, it just kind of acts like, a, you know, a blunt knife going through. It, it is absolute carnage. Right. And, and, we and have this, our- is, well, this is a trick, you know, that, that Napoleon used, you know, profusely through the revolution when he was taking over France uh, that, that he used and perfected back when fighting the British when he was a captain uh, back in the 1790s. So our characters are not heroes, right? The, the, what they thought it meant to be a hero is not right. Zirkov doesn't even follow his orders, just just abandons his post in a sense. And then you've got like Tushin who's like, yeah, it's like war. <laughs> like you literally have like the full gamut of reactions in, gosh, I mean, what are we like page 200? Like Tolstoy really made sure that you had every view of life, except maybe the female view. Not so good at that, but everything else pretty, pretty represented. <laughs> And I think this is telling of these characters that he's created of why they would respond the way that they do. Yeah. So night falls, right? The Russians escape, right? In the end of the end of this chapter and Prince Andrew kind of sticks up for Tushin's escape and um, the loss of several uh, military men. And I think this calls back to the, Rost- the Rostov thing that we were talking about earlier, right? When do you stick up and when do you put your personal honor on the line in a sense? And, um, you know, I don't know, there, there's not as much, uh, historical data that I could find that backed up some of that stuff, but I think overall we have what is ultimately for me, a very exciting chapter two. I think Tolstoy is doing a great job of using his historical imagination to maybe filling in some of those fun stories to give us more of that human, that human perspective. Part Who's going to marry my child 
<laughs> in the Battle of Austerlitz. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a game show. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Petersburg, Prince Vasily is a man with worldly success, right? He's like, all right, Helen, Helena, we got to get you married, right? And, uh, well, there's this guy named Pierre, and he just so happened to get a lot of money that I didn't get. You should totally hook up with him so that I could get that money. <laughs> get that chip. They are so <laughs> not subtle about this, right? It's just like, oh, it's like, it doesn't matter if you're attracted to him. It doesn't matter, you know, who they are. I'm marrying you off. Like, this is, like, the worst arranged marriage as you can imagine. Well, and as for how poo-poo I was on Pierre in part one, now I'm starting to get, like, sympathy for him because he is totally on the struggle bus as he's got all these new responsibilities, all these people coming to him for money, and uh, just being taken advantage of. And I kind of feel bad for him in the sense of, like, he was mocked, I guess, in part one, right? Like, what are you doing? Agreed. Sympath sympathizing with the French. Oh, you've got money. Oh, you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. Why don't you meet my daughter? Why don't you get married to her? It's um, it's unfortunate to see humans use other humans as objects as opposed to seeing humanity in them. Well, I don't even know if they're seen as objects. They're seen as tools of manipulation. Where I mean, you 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 have children being married off to children here. I mean, that's really what it is, right? I mean. Not maybe not for the time periods, but that's how I kind of viewed it. I was reading it, and when um, I think it was was it Prince Vasily who, when he was talking, he's just like, "Oh, they're married," even though like they hadn't said it, like it's not what they even wanted. Like they were literally like forcing it on their children. I was like, I was like, did I read that correctly? Let me go back a page. Like it was really like abrupt and sudden, and they're like, "Yeah, this is happening," and I'm going to make sure that you marry the person I think you would need to marry. Oh, it's it, it's cringeworthy. That's how I would describe it. But again, I think that that's wonderful because, I mean, Tolstoy is invoking that emotion in me. And I think he's supposed to because we're seeing, again, that very, very uh, decisive contrast between the aristocrats and, and the war and that these relationships are taking place even while war is happening because these people are so out of touch of reality. Yeah. Now, now that one daughter's married off, we got to talk about Anatole. Right. So, so Anatole, I'm not sure how to pronounce it exactly. Uh, I think he takes him to the Bolkonsky mistake because we're going to marry Maria. Remember the, the sister that gave the cross to Prince Andrew in part one? Well, we're going to marry her because they're rich. Right. And when Nikolai, Prince Nikolai uh, Bolkonsky finds out, he becomes grumpy. Right. He's he's the dad that like is sitting on the porch in his underwear cleaning the shotgun like like you gonna take my daughter. <laughs> I totally get that. Yes, that's a perfect envision. I probably was thinking that at the same time. Well, and I also felt a little bit for Maria here, too. Right. Because she I think she does care about people. Right. She's worried about fulfilling that role as a wife here again, uh, putting people into roles. I get it. But the point being, she cared. Right. She wasn't, oh, how do I scheme and fix the, my son up with a rich woman? She's like, how do I fulfill and be a good partner to someone? And I thought that was kind of touching is is when you see those little moments of humanity in the characters. Do you think that that's because of something that she experienced in her past? Because I kind of feel like she's had come of those romantic misadventures and she wants better for you know others not to have to go through that or is there something more there i am vacillating between the idea that she's young and naive is one okay. option like she's she has this romantic vision of what love should be and if we go back to part one, she was the religious slash moral compass of this novel is is she doing this because that's what her religion tells her to do I don't know. Or is it because she's described by Tolstoy, again, does not write women well. She's the <laughs> plain one. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. she's settling, which is so sad. Like, Tolstoy, yeah. bro, you could yeah. do better. You're one of the greatest yeah. authors of all time. Get in and, touch uh, with your feminine side. <laughs> the plain one. Ugh. That's like the biggest insult ever. And it doesn't help but that like the uh, suitor, Anatole, is sitting there running around with these other chicks like, oh, yeah, don't worry about this, Mario. We're, we'll get married, but I'm going to have some fun with these other chicks while we're here. And it just makes you hate. Uh, honestly, the, the Prince Vasily. All of them? Uh, all, yeah, <laughs> it really does makes you hate all yeah. of them. Yeah. 
So at the same time, we have the Rostovs receive word that their son, Nikolai Rostov, uh, was injured, right? And I think they are concerned, but I think they also, you know, they're in society still. They still use that as a tool of like, oh, my son, the war hero, he's off serving Russia, like he's doing Russia so much good. And when you look at like what actually happened to him, like, I mean, he kind of like dislocated his arm from falling off the horse, I think it was, and then hid in the bushes. Like, <laughs> yep. it wasn't the most like heroic thing. Uh, I get you. I mean, yeah, kind of. Coward I would do the and, same. I'm not looking down upon him. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a lover, not a fighter. <laughs> I don't fault him at all. I mean, war. I ugh, but. Well, let's say this. War makes you do a lot of things that, that you wouldn't normally do. Right. And in the war, right, we head back to Rostov, who's trying to borrow money. And there's that situation with Boris. Right. And I, I mean, I think it comes down to Boris is a ladder climber. We see how he's still trying to do that here. And I think Rostov is trying to figure out where does honor come from for him? Does it come from this moment? Right? Or does it have to be given to you? And I think that's what a lot of the misconception that Tolstoy is portraying here of the Russian people is that it has to be given to you and you don't earn it. Well, either way, I think we see a very human element to Nikolai here where he's like really exaggerating the injury. Like he's playing it up until Prince Andrew comes in and is like, what are you doing? Like, this this injury, this boasting, this isn't what gets you honor. What gets you honor is serving good on the battlefield. And they you have like a lot of opposites in this scene of, of how honor is viewed and then how social advancement is viewed. All three of these characters, I think, want the same thing. But I think each one goes about it in a very different way. Yeah, agreed. I mean... Nikolai is the guy that has his arm in a sling and has the thing around his neck or whatever. He's like, I, I did my best. I fought hard. <laughs> well, and, and Andrew's that person. It's like, you didn't earn that, right? Take off, take off that fake valor. You've got to earn your valor, basically. Now, yeah, I mean, everybody needs that friend or that guy that's going to call you out on your BS. Yeah. And, <laughs> and Prince Andre is the guy that's going to do that, right. which will make... I think Nikolai, a better person, soldier, or whatever. At least that's the hope, right? Mm, interesting, interesting. And you got Boris, Boris, in the background. It's just like, yeah, let me know when the boss comes. I'm going to take a nap in the back right here. Let me know when the boss comes around. I'll look like I'm doing something productive. <laughs> <laughs> We've all had that partner in class. <laughs> yes, we have. We have. Now, the next day, Emperor Alexander arrives, rides up to kind of see the army stand before him. And I think he's immediately admired. Right. And I don't think this is just because he's the well, I mean, yes, it is because he's the monarchy symbol. Let's not be <laughs> let's not be obtuse here. But I think also he's young. He's still yeah. pushing out these liberal reforms in terms of setting up universities in Russia. He's still learning what it means to be a leader. And um I think he's still learning what it means to be on the battlefield because this is the first time an emperor has been on the battlefield since Peter the Great. So this is this is a huge lifting of spirits because these are people who are appointed by God in the view in the in the viewpoint of of, of the Russians, right? This this is a a divine seat to them with how the state and, and church are combined in a sense. That this isn't a self made man. This is someone who is going to righteously deliver us victory in war, which means I will lay down my life and trust and put faith into him as a result. I think it's important to note that he is young. Uh, many historians have researched and he's been described as kind of mild mannered. So he wasn't somebody that was too, you know, intimidating or imposing, but he is out there. And that says a lot about his character. And I think that does help raise the morale of his men who have been getting their butts kicked lately by Napoleon. And Napoleon's out there leading his men. And as you said, he, he steps up to the plate, and I think that is kind of inspiring, and I think it's kind of cool. Again, I get giddy when these real characters are in this, you know, this fiction book, and I was like, oh, oh I, I'm like, oh, oh, I know him, I know him, I teach about him, uh, you know, he's in my my real history book, and uh, I, I think that Tolstoy did a great job of, of writing him, you know, not too hot, not too cold, just right. Right, right. And you talked earlier about how I think a lot of times, at least in our Western, at least in American textbooks, we learn about the War of 1812 and about Napoleon and how the, the I mean, a lot of our books focus on how the environment was used to defeat them. It's almost like symbolic of Russia, like the country defeated Napoleon. 
But in terms of like pro Napoleon views, like what's coming up now, this ba- battle of Austerlitz is frequently talked about as it has to be one of his most crowning achievements from like a battle perspective. It really showed his strategic uh, mastery over how to direct troops and how to manipulate forces to move the way that he needed to. He, he it was like he was like a, a, a orchestrator of battle, if you will. Yeah, th- this is the one battle that I teach up to uh, when we get to 1812 and 1814 in the fall of Napoleon eventually. Uh, the, the Battle of Auschwitz is is the one that I teach uh, because it really is kind of that midpoint. It is a defining characteristic. Uh, you could even see it as kind of like the conclusion of what historians would call the Ulm campaign of mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. He, he takes all this and from here on out, he marches his way, you know, almost to, to Moscow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Rostov sees that the Emperor Alexander I and is moved to tears, as we were talking about. And Dolgorukov is in charge of negotiations, and he's like 100% offense 100% of the time. Like, yes, Russia, Alexander's here. We can defeat anything. Like, it's part of like that divine spirit, that, that Russian soul that's coming out for these characters. And you got to get he, behind this guy, though, right? You love his enthusiasm. This is the cheerleader that you want in your corner, though, when you're down a couple of points. <laughs> well, this is uh, there's there's also um, dramatic irony here where you and I know what's happening. We know that Napoleon is faking weakness like he's using his spies to spread rumors. It's a feign, man, he's the best at it. He's using his spy network to feign like weakness. He's giving up. Literally, he's on the top of the hill, which at this time was where you wanted to be because you had oversight, you know, it was easier to aim downhill, et cetera, et cetera. Gives up the power play position, has less <laughs> troops. So you mentioned earlier that Napoleon frequently overwhelmed and outmaneuvered. He had less troops here in this battle than than the Russian army did, the combined Russian and Germanic armies and such. Um, it's It's really the crowning achievement of how he manipulates and wins this war that I think is interesting. He gives you up the high ground. How did he win? <laughs> Kenobi would have been so upset with him with that move. But he still won. Yeah. The dark side is powerful with Napoleon. Yeah, yeah. yeah it really is. All right, so way rather, again, another real historical fact, um, is one that is kind of representing Tolstoy's pride, I think. He comes into this war room and is just like, all right, guys, this is what we're going to do. And any objection that you have, he's already got planned what the counter is to it. He's the guy that's arguing from rhetoric and from like pre-planned moves rather than actually listening to people. And you've got people like Katusov who's just like, no, he's not weak. We shouldn't pursue him. And Weyrother's like, no, I've already thought about that. This is why we're going to go crush Napoleon. And he's almost like his version of honor and valor is leading these troops to victory. And he doesn't even know if he can do it. Like, he's totally wrong in this situation. Through the course of our discussion, we've come back to that me versus we thing several times. And I feel like Weyrother is kind of that embodiment of the individual. And he thinks he has all the answers. But the answers isn't an individual. It is that collective nature of all these people working together to be able to take down Napoleon. And spoiler alert, that's eventually what does happen But I think it's kind of that play that Tolstoy is having here of which one of these is going to win the war. And he knows the outcome, obviously, like we do. But I love that these people in this story don't know, do we go with the individual that is like Napoleon, that is confident, or is it going to be that we thing that we come together and ultimately become the victor? What if we get to like the War of 1812 and like Tolstoy just like randomly is like, yeah, Russia, like, what if he writes it totally different than what happened? Like you say, spoiler alert, because you know what happens in history. We have no idea how, how Tolstoy will write this in the book, though. <laughs> no, we, we do. I mean, the way that he's written this so historically accurate with these correct characters, the way he's written the, you know, Tsar, the Tsar Nicholas, the way he's written Napoleon. I, he knows these characters inside now. There's no way that he's going to change the outcome of these battles, even the, the couple of battles we've seen so far. Oh, he, he wrote absolutely. very historically accurately. Oh, he absolutely did, right? Like because way rather when you and look will it up continue the, <laughs> when you look and when you look it up in the history books, way rather extremely incompetent commander 
Like the troops were literally like you can read reports about how like they were the lines were marching into each other. They weren't sure what the orders were. He was terrible. And and Tolstoy depicts him perfectly of coming in and just being like, this is what we need to do. And like, it, yeah, it, it's it's actually very accurate. I guess as we move forward, like, what do you think about Kostustov falling asleep? Like, is this exhaustion? Is this uh, depression? Is he giving up? Um for me, I think the way that Tolstoy has written these characters, everything seems to be um, not what it seems. And I, I think that this is him just kind of be like, all right, I'm going to go ahead and go over here and just pretend to take a few Z's so that nobody pays attention to me. That seems to be the thing is nobody is doing what they mm. feel. Everybody just oh. seems to be putting on a front or a mask uh besides napoleon i mean he's the only one and again because i guess he's probably considered the villain of the story he, he's the only one that's self-assured everybody else is is growing through the story because napoleon has already made himself of who he is hmm. uh, and we don't see much growth for him i like that take i think i had a much simpler take where i was just kind of viewing maybe it's just because i've been reading some stoicism here lately i kind of took it as katusov was just giving up that he's just like yep yeah, I'm not going to be able to win this battle. And, you know, when, you know, Alexander comes to the field, he's the new numero uno, right? Like everything Alexander says goes, and he knows Alexander is going to be influenced to try to prove himself. And, you know, when you look at the historical documents, there was motivation for Austria to push this attack. They wanted to regain their land, right? Like while they had Russian support and help in the area, and they did have the numbers, they did have the high ground. Everything on paper <laughs> made sense and Katusov, even though he didn't believe in it, knew that he probably wasn't going to be able to change it. So he just gave up knowing that he had no influence was the way I looked at it. That's a good way, too. I like that. So Tolstoy now shows us Prince Andrei and Rostov's thoughts. And we see Andrei kind of daydreaming about being a war hero, being promoted, winning battles. And Rostov is dreaming of gaining Emperor Alexander's favor. Right? Like he's He's just so smitten with him. And then that's when kind of gunfire kind of goes off and he realizes that he's going to be able to, to uh, prove himself. But this is honestly the French trap being sprung, right? Like if we look at a map up on this hill, the, the, the Russians took the hill thinking they had the power ground here, right? And down here, down below, you see that these French are feigning weakness. Oh, we're overextended here. This is going to be easy for you to take, not realizing that there's some, I don't remember what it was, it was like twelve or 20,000 people that are coming to reinforce just in the nick of time uh, to really spring the trap. And then when Russia, you know, also overextends. Yeah, cavalrymen. Uh, okay, okay. And then when Russia also overextends chasing, you know, this chance at victory, uh-oh, now they're overextended. And with the reinforcements, now France isn't. And that's when they kind of cut off Again, split the forces, to your point earlier, classic Napoleon move, pushes them towards the lake, starts firing cannonballs into the lake. Oh, real historical event. Everybody knows that part about the Battle of Austerlitz. Like, that's kind of like a romantic view of the war. That's what the paintings are of. That's what, you know, in the movie scenes would be. Yeah. Yeah. It's, It's crazy how historically accurate it is and also still how haunting it is to read. Uh, to be pinned between a, a, an oncoming force, and normally it's like, okay, we give up, and you know, you know, there's there's people taken and and, and surrendering, but Napoleon is written ruthless in this, is he not? Yeah, for sure. I mean, were you hoping that it would be changed? I mean, because you had talked about it earlier that you know maybe maybe Tolstoy will change with this. I was I was hoping for not the realism and grittiness here because it just it it kind of depressed me. Like, man. This is brutal. He is a ruthless SOB. It's it's very real. This He's part. so much smarter than everybody else. And he knew he it. He, he knew is. it. And you see how Tolstoy plays up how weak the Russians were here, like with Rostov running around, like, we're not sure what to do. <laughs> and there's just cannonballs going off and the Russians are being pinned. Um, I I don't think, while I believe, you know, obviously Tolstoy believes in Russia, I don't think he believes it in a point to depict. I think he puts reality and truth above that. And he realizes that there was hubris at play here. He realizes that there were forces that had 
bigger impact and outthought the Russian mind and Russian bravery. Russian bravery wasn't enough to win this battle. And I think he depicts that. I guess one of my questions I'd have for that is, is he depicting this as an anti-war novel or a war novel? I I don't think either. I think the way I thought of it is Tolstoy is a, a fantastic historian and writer, and he's able to combine those together because he, he's writing it knowing that knowing the outcome, which obviously gives him an advantage to writing the story, but he knows that ultimately it really wasn't Russia that won the war. It was Napoleon beat himself. He does eventually overextend himself and become too cocky. And yes, the Russians do make some, you know, big gains and have some big battles, but it was the weather. It was, you know, the, 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 the years and years and years of war. And I, I think that, I think it's written fairly by Tolstoy of how this is playing out because the Russians do make some great strides towards the end of the war when we get closer, you know, 1812, 1813, 1814. But here in the beginning, they are kind of bumbling and stumbling. Mm -hmm. Well, and, okay, so now let's move to a more romantic side of Mr. Tolstoy, right? Because while we praise him for his realism, there is definitely some romanticism at the end of this chapter with Andre kind of being knocked down. He's looking up at the heavens and Napoleon, you know, finally entering this chapter. He's like looking down on him and says, you know, something about it's a good day to die. And there really is a historical quote about, <laughs> about not him. exactly, but you're paraphrasing. <laughs> well, I, okay. I don't have the exact quote, but th uh, I guess I do recall like from reading the history books where he talks about there are going to be it's romantic enough, right? Whatever it is. <laughs> it's written that he had said something to the effect of how there's going to be a lot of Russian women crying. In, in Russia tomorrow uh, after this victory. And you have Andre who's sitting there looking up at the sky and we're like, okay, is he going to die? Like, it's kind of like a cliffhanger at the end. But I almost took the sky as him finally looking up, um, seeing that there's something bigger than him. Because I think he's, we've talked about how he's disenfranchised with society. We see how war is not what he depicted at all. I wonder, are we going to see him become that, that trope of an atheist turning Christian uh, kind of like how I think Mario was hoping for him to turn. Like she gave him that that icon when he left and maybe that he'll kind of turn a more religious life. I, it's kind of a cliffhanger at this point in time. I don't know where it's going to go, but that's my gut feel. Oh, you think he lives? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He ain't going okay. anywhere. I think he's sticker. I think he's sticking I mean, around. That that last paragraph is is like he's dead. Like it, it was very clear cut that this guy's dying. So, I mean... If he does live, then either, yes, it will definitely be a religious revival or it will be, again, him finding honor, courage, strength within, and it will be his hero's journey of, you know, he overcame this obstacle. Now what's the next obstacle that he has to overcome to, you know, propel him up to, you know, hero status? Well, I mean, symbolically, Russia's devastated right now, right? Like the fact that for the first time since Peter the Great, who dominated in war, right, the first time since him, a Russian emperor led the battle and lost terribly with the high ground, with more numbers, and just got demolished by Napoleon. The Russians are very, um, I think, I think reality isn't living up to their expectations of what their bravery could accomplish. Let's say that. And I did find that quote. It says, that's a fine death. That's what Napoleon said. And I was going to ask you what you thought that meant. <laughs> and it sounds to me like you think he actually is going to die. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that this comes down to at the end, it is setting the stage for how horrific battles and war was and that Tolstoy is saying the Russians weren't prepared for this. Europe was not prepared for this. They had not seen this uh, in hundreds of years. Not that things had been peaceful, but this Napoleonic time period is unlike anything that Europe has ever seen. The loss of life, the devastation everything is is a new norm and i know i've said that several times but that the scope and the expanse of this is is something that is breathtaking that i think only somebody like tolstoy can to encapsulate into a novel oh i just got an idea okay i hadn't thought about this what if there's some foil action going on right here where prince andre has believed in nothing almost in a sense you know trying to find himself i think tolstoy writes these characters um as having room to grow I think all these characters have room to grow, right? Like I don't think any of them are perfect, <laughs> right? So, so Andre is looking for who is he? Who's he going to be? And he looks up to the heavens. I think he's going to live, and he sees 
I think, an opportunity in the divine and God there. Now, Rostov is the foil, where his God was the divinely appointing Prince Alexander, Emperor Alexander. And his God's the one that was fleeing from the battle almost, like looking dejected. And like his is the opposite, where him having faith in that Russian pride and soul is now being, is now failing him. And he's, he's like on like the decline as opposed to Prince Andre is on the incline in Tolstoy's view of, of, of the world, I think. Yeah, that could be good. I mean, because Andre, too, who didn't worship Napoleon, has just, ha- you know, basically got whooped by him. And then Napoleon looks down on him and is like, yeah, you're dirt beneath my boot. And so I think that, <laughs> yeah, I I mean, Andre's probably going to survive, but uh, yeah. The near-death experience is going to change him, obviously. Remember that scene in Bill and Ted's when they go and get Napoleon from the past and bring him to Waterloo? And doesn't he, like... And he eats the ice cream? Well, he gets pushed down the slide. Like, I kind of picture that, like, when Andre's, like, about to die, like, on... Like, he just pushes him, like, with a... Like, it fades to black, like, the camera. (laughs) I like that. Yeah. Napoleon, the water slide taker. (laughs) Book four or book two, part one, with a crazy naming. All right. But it is 1806. That's what matters. And the War of the Third Coalition's over. War of the Fourth Coalition's coming over. But we get a little bit of peace first. And I love it. I love these characters now. I, I'm, a, I'm converted. I am now liking these characters in this part. Which character is your favorite? I'm interested to hear. Denisov, dude, totally. When when Rostov comes home with Denisov and he's all like, oh, why you Wasovs? <laughs> he talks like Elmer <laughs> Fudd. <laughs> well, definitely not my favorite. Uh, I'm, I'm a fan of Pierre. I felt like this was kind of his time to unshine Ooh. or, I don't know, devolve, I guess. And I thought it was interesting because I don't know where the, his character is going to go from here up or down. So I'm kind of excited to see what happens when he gets back to the war. Well, I wonder, too, am I enjoying the switch in the characters, right? Because Rostov, when we saw him in part one, you know, they're 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 not a well to do family. And, you know, he's going to war being all patriotic, kind of wanting this. And he goes to war and gets his butt kicked, <laughs> hides yeah. in the bushes. Right. But he comes home. The first battle. Different... The first battle. Yes. Yeah. 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 But but he comes home and has on this Hungarian uniform and he's now like, oh, Sonia, we don't need to get together. I'm going to go bang some other chicks like he's a different person now, basically. Yeah, this is true. This is true. I wonder, too, they say war changes you and it's not just for the PTSD. I think sometimes I wonder, does Rostov feel like he deserves more? Like what what is his reason for for kind of I mean, Sonia is looking more attractive than the first time. Why would he be a man about town now Be after becoming this war hero? Is it the attention? Is is he drawn to uh, higher mobility, perhaps, instead of true love? Is that perhaps the commentary that's kind of being snuck in here? I, I think it's pride. He has gone and done something other people's only talk about in the Russian, you know, social system. And he's come back uh, not dead and... Uh, he's not a war hero, but in his small circle, he may be somewhat of a war hero. And I think he loves, like you said, that attention. And that's that's changing. It's going to his head, right? That, that, that's the easiest way to say it. The attention and the notoriety has gone to his head. Well, and he's not the only one, right? Papa Rostov, you know, Count, he's throwing a party for uh, Bagration. Right. For being the big war hero, he is lauded for winning victories. And even though Katusov we saw was probably better strategically minded in behind the scenes, he's kind of booed because he was in charge of those that lost. Right. We we laud the heroes that win. We boo the heroes that lose, even though we can see there's a lot more going on behind these scenes uh, for the war engine. Right. And. Yeah, I think I really enjoyed this section, even though it doesn't have the the war stuff that I kind of enjoy, the action and uh, learning the histories and stuff of that. I did like this section because you see that little bit of loss of innocence of what war does to to young people. And I think that when they're coming home, they, they're enjoying, they're, they're almost like aggressive about, you know, 
hey, well, this is what happened to me. You know, they're all trying to get their stories out there. Uh, and a little, there's a little bit of grandstanding, right? And I think that uh, we're, we're seeing their mentalities of war change a little bit because they have all these ideas, the preconceived notions of war. They go off to the battles. They see how it's awful and terrible and what it's truly like. But now they come home and get that positive, positive affirmation and they kind of become like single-minded of, okay, I, I, I can do this because I want more of this. I like this. It's good to come back as, you know, a victor. Now, someone who did not come back as a victor is Pierre. So at this party, you know, leading up to it, there's all these rumors about Dolokhov hooking up with Ellen, and he's kind of had enough of it. And when Dolokhov starts cheering all the beautiful ladies, that's it. Gloves are off. Duel is on. Pierre, the eternal fish out of water, challenges the battle-hardened Dolokhov, who has, like, no scruples, right? I don't know about you. I don't go around challenging men who have these bear antics at parties. Do you know anyone that wins duels with people who have bear antics? Name one. I don't think you can. <laughs> I think that he wants to be respected. And then, you know, it, it, and it's not all his fault, I think, for the duel. I mean, um, Dolokhov grabs the the piece of paper from him, I think, rudely. And I think mm -hmm, this is the last mm -hmm. straw, you know. And, and, and again, it's that young man trying to impress the women. And I, I think he's, yes, he's at fault, but I, I, it takes two to tango. And I think that he, he, he is not solely at fault here. And I like that he's standing up for himself. He's standing up for himself a little bit. I, I'm, I'm Team Pierre. Do you think Dolokhov wanted to duel him so that he could connect with Ellen? Because Ellen, for all we know, you know, she claims that it never happened afterwards. After he surprisingly wins the duel, <laughs> kind no, of no, a Dolokhov turn of loses. events there. Dolokhov That's loses. what I mean is because Pierre oh. wins, um, he goes home, talks to Ellen. Ellen says, no, I never cheated on him. Do we think Dolokhov wanted to duel because he thought he would win, basically? It's a win-win for him no matter what. If he wins, he 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 you know has more bravado, but if he loses, he gets the sympathy. He's the good guy here no matter what happens. I mean, as long as he survives. I mean, a duel serious business, brother. You don't always walk away from those. Yeah, and I was actually really surprised that Tolstoy wrote it that, you know, spoiler alerts, Pierre wins this duel and Dolokhov doesn't die. He ends up surviving, which is crazy. And that doesn't happen in these type of novels. Like, you you get shot, you're dead. <laughs> so I actually, I enjoyed that uh, kind of, you know, a change of pace and reality. Yeah, I was wondering if it was going to be written kind of like Pushkin, where he's injured in the duel du and dies a little bit later. But, you know, there's, oh, there's definitely some said. foreshadowing here. I think that that is important to note that uh, this is going to come back to bite maybe both of them in the butt. There's something to be said, though, about this being a miniature of war um, in the sense of of two sides having a disagreement. You know, you almost have like the third parties, the seconds trying to broker peace like, oh, come on, guys, you really shouldn't fight. And, you know, at the end, you know, Pierre walks away without I don't think he has the pride he thought he'd have from winning the duel. Like he's almost kind of destroyed from it. And even Dolokhov, while you say that he won, I think we see a different side of him. I think, I think when you see that, you know, he's the mama's boy when he goes back home and stuff like that, that there's, there's a lot of uh, sadness and that he has a lot more to live for than if he had died during the duel. So I don't know. I don't know. I think, I think you can kind of view this in the sense of there's not always a clear winner when it comes to duel in the same way that maybe, maybe this is my own narrative, but I don't think there's always a clear winner when it comes to war either. I think there's losses on both sides. No, yeah, no, the old saying goes that nobody really wins in war because there's going to be loss of life. When you said the word miniature, it kind of got me thinking of I one reason I really enjoyed this section, I think over the, you know, socialite drama sections of the, the first part uh, volume of, of the book is for me, I felt like it sped up. Did it feel that way to you? Because it felt like the narrative got a little bit tighter. We honed in on just a few characters the chapters are really short, uh, much shorter. This section in its entirety is half as long as the previous one, uh, the previous part of the book. Uh, so I feel like things are speeding up, and I, I would like the pace of that. Like, what what's happening? Like, what, what is this pressure that I'm feeling for what's going to happen in the next section of the book? Because I feel like death is looming over me. And I, did, did you feel that? 
it felt faster for sure, but also I feel like I'm getting a stronger grasp on the themes and maybe some things to kind of like what what might have been some main takeaways at this point in time. Uh, did you get a feeling of you know, the the love with the Rostovs, the love with even Dolokhov and his mom. There's a lot of familial love. Like those are very warming and, and exciting to see. But interestingly enough, I think there's a lot of problems with the romantic love. When you look at every relationship that doesn't work out here, like in terms of, well, eventually we'll get to Natasha turning down here, but we have Sonia <laughs> and Rostov not working out. We've got Pierre and Ellen not working out. And if you remember, all bo- all of those were almost forms of of social mobility. Like they weren't true love marriages. And I couldn't help but wonder, is Tolstoy maybe putting some patterns out here of what does it mean to truly connect and truly have a happy life? Because clearly the people that are doing it for social mobility, they ain't happy. Is Is it love or is it all just lust? And I feel like that it's just this pure, young, raw, sexual innuendos that are there. <laughs> that that's that's what it is. I, I don't think this is true love at all. Uh, maybe it's moving towards that something, but as we move th- and progress, um, and we get some of the negative foreshadowing, and we and we finally do have a death here, uh, and then and, and, and Sonia suffering um, and having this unhappy life. Uh, yeah, I, I don't I don't think it's love. So let's move into the last part, the Bolkonski farm, right? Where we think Prince Andre is dead, Maria is praying. Okay, again, the religious compass of this novel, no, novel, no surprise there. And that's when Prince Andre arrives, right as his wife is having the baby. And the look, did, did you notice how the look was written for this scene? Uh, no, I, I read this a little while ago, so I don't remember. Refresh my memory. She. It was almost like a look of... There's two looks, right? There's when it first happens, it is in the opposite of later on at the funeral. But she's almost like a little bit happy. And I couldn't help but wonder, do you remember when we read the story of an hour and the wife who wanted to be free when she felt oh, yeah, relief. She wasn't yes, free, yes. Was was something like that what what actually killed her instead of the childbirth, right? Like was it I don't know. It, it it's a complicated emotion because we're seeing it through Prince Andre almost, I think. it's The narration's kind of moving around, but it's this omniscient view, of, I think, but you mostly get Andre's perspective, in which case it changes, right? There's like the joy during childbirth, and then there's almost scorn and upset during death later on. Oh, yeah, I like that. I could see that. I, I think that... I think that I, I just, it's a relief, right, of that I don't have to deal with this anymore, Um Again, it kind of comes back to the idea that maybe there isn't a love here, that this is out of obligation and not something that they, you know, wanted to do, that, that she wanted to do. Moving in back to the Rostovs here, we had kind of like the final scenes where we had the dance where I, I thought my boy Denisov was going to win over Natasha Rostov. Uh, I was really excited for that because I thought they actually cared about each other. I really did. And it didn't work out. So I was kind of sad about that. So I'm like, dang it, Tolstoy, where are you going with this one? And um, and then when we look at Rostov and kind of the dissension with um, D- Dolokhov over, over Sonia, and you see them kind of gambling, you see them putting their bravado on the line again. It was uh, kind of kind of sad to see how self-destructive some of these men will be for the purpose of of name, of honor, of of a social norm more so than anything else. Yeah, the, the gambling thing, again, is I think it comes back to what you said earlier about the religious element. Back in this time period, from my understanding, there was basically three things that a husband did that were usually frowned upon. And that is going to be, you know, sleeping around, drinking and gambling. Like those are the three big sins. And like, oh, he's out drinking out of the bar or, oh, he's out, you know, at the brothel or he's down there, you know, gambling with his buddies and it's just these guys fall into these tropes time and time again. And it's like, why are you trying to show off for this? It, it, it doesn't impress the ladies. This isn't helping your cause at all. And I, I get so mad at the gambling. And then it comes back to the fact that he has to go have daddy pay it off for him. And it's like, oh, you were you were taking three steps back. You took one step forward. 
uh, you know, becoming a better person and evolving here. And then it just, you, you take all these steps back. You've undone all of your growth. It's very, very frustrating, but it's realistic. And that's why it's wonderful is because Tol Tolstoy is nailing this. You know, these situations are, are amazing. And, and you kind of see these parallels of how these characters are, are behaving and they're falling into their stereotypes of what you would expect of them. So I hope we see some dramatic growth and change in the next couple of parts. In the first part, we had dueling with the guns. Now we have the dueling with the wallets, right? The the men will find whatever they can to fight over the women, to fight over their honor. It's 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 not. It, it's like the ongoing struggle in this novel is men will constantly fight over something, and they'll find something to fight with. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Uh, and, and, and that's kind of the whole theme of the whole book, right? We, we literally have that war piece. So they're warring at home. They're warring with Napoleon. They're warring within themselves because they, they don't know what they want. They don't know what they want to do. Uh, you know, especially poor Pierre, my boy. Uh, he just he, he's making mistakes left and right, you know, and, and Dolokhov isn't any better off. I don't think either. And the War of the Fourth Coalition is coming up, right? The next chapter is literally titled 1806 to 1807. We got the peace back to war, right? <laughs> <laughs> yep, back to war. Part five. Now, Pierre is leaving for Petersburg and stumbles across a man that changes his life. A man that introduces him to the Freemasons community, if you will. <laughs> I like that. That's good. <laughs> this bars Steve inducts him and i guess people write online how i guess tolstoy did a lot of research and that they actually are kind of accurate some of these ceremonies but he goes on this holy path of joining the freemasons even though his life is in shambles as Vasily's just like oh you left ln i'm gonna make sure you're ruined type of deal it makes for a good story i mean it's it's entertaining 1806 new year new party at the shears new war starts right <laughs> and uh boris still macking on the ladies and Ellen, kind of eyeing, eyeing that piece of booty that uh, not much has changed, honestly. <laughs> yeah, he's kind of trying to get that piece. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So Prince Nikolai is one of Russia's now eight militia commander-in-chiefs. Sometimes kissing a little butt pays off. And Maria's watching her nephew, little Prince Nikolai, as Andrew has been given an estate and is tending to that and avoiding all talks of the war, even though his father sends him pictures about the victory. I'm going to put that in air quotes here at a Lao. Uh, great. So you won without me there. Makes me feel great. Thanks pops. <laughs> <laughs> but kind of ignores his baby, sadly. So now that Pierre is all Freemasonified, he heads to Kiev to free all of his serfs, right? He's going to go through his liberal reforms. And when he checks back in in the spring of 1807, the stewards put on this show. Right, like, oh yeah, we we built this church for you, and like, oh look, you know the the peasants are are working and, and earning great, even though all the money's coming out of their rent, and and it's just all it's all hoax, basically. Big hoax. So Pierre heads to talk to Prince Andrew, and is like, yo, look how liberal I am, and look how awesome I'm doing, and they kind of have their debate about God and whether Andrew should truly believe in the purpose of life, if you will. He continues to be dismissive, if you didn't catch that. And then there's this whole Rostov plot, right, where he returns to the army. He feels he can be a good person while there. Versus outside, he, what, ratchets up this huge gambling debt for his family, so he's kind of embarrassed about that. His family's not even rich to begin with, right? And um, that's when he sees Denisov kind of making some moralistic questionable decisions like stealing food trucks from other army resource surpluses and uh yeah it's it's uh it's shenanigans in the army if you will so nothing's changed there either has it no not really it's kind of i guess expected for some of these characters we don't see a lot of growth they seem to be just falling back into their traditional ways it, it makes me question the title war and peace right where's the war <laughs> we're skipping that part everybody's trying to get their peace i already told you that <laughs> yeah they're going to the party to get their pieces right so so we miss the battle of trafalgar uh i, I get it no sea battles right okay that makes sense right that's, that's not really a russian story and, and that's what tolstoy is representing here but to kind of just gloss over the battle of elau was kind of sad because, you know, if you look at like what, what Tolstoy is doing with this novel, he's showing how the influence of little men rides up, right? War, 
it's very easy to say it's a big machine and we can't change things, but he shows how these little men have influences in the bigger picture of things. And that's such an interesting story too, because if you didn't know, the Russians were going to get absolutely rolled in the batter of Ilala. He was going to be a slaughter. And what happens was like this little dispatch boy that had this uncoded message about what Napoleon's plans were, got intercepted. He got captured by a Cossack patrol and he ended up not being able to destroy the letter in times. And so the Russians are like, oh, the gods are shining on us. So this is totally going to change the uh, course of battle. Yeah, let's pull out, guys. Napoleon's about to surround us. We got to go. <laughs> but it fits that idea of how uh, little men, like small choices, can impact bigger things. I guess for me, I, I was I was a little bit disappointed. Of course, there wasn't more of war because we enjoyed those pieces looking at them historically. But for the, bit of, the Battle of Ilau, I guess this one, it, it's glossed over a little bit because in the grand scheme of things, it was kind of a stalemate. Both sides suffer heavy, heavy losses. Uh, it stalls Napoleon a little bit, but it doesn't really stop him at all. But for me, I kept thinking of that the battle is kind of seen through the letter and we don't get a lot of it because I think that's apropos kind of what is going on with these men is they aren't on the front lines. They're only living through these, you know, proxies that are happening. And I think that is, is kind of the, the standard for the, the Russian elite and nobles of how this war is going for them is it, it kind of doesn't matter. And for the grand scheme of things, it, historically, the Battle of the Lao doesn't really matter too much. And I think it fits uh, the whole Andrew story, too. Like, if he were there, his heart is no longer in war, right? Like, when you have the men no longer caring or bumbling, it's these small events that might have been skipped over. Like, the, the Russian army could have been slaughtered had they not been paying attention like Andrew might have. So I, th I think it fits that model. But also, I mean, Andrew, Prince Andrew, he's going through big changes, right? He just oh, yeah. had his life flash through his eyes. His wife passed away. He's got birth of his baby coming in, but he's still going through this existential crisis. Now, we see definitely the spiritual, philosophical kind of soul of the novel so far really come out in this part. And I feel like that there's definitely this connection between the material war part of it and the spiritual, you know, struggles that he's having of what do I do? How can I benefit my family? during you know such tragedy during the, this this war time period when we saw prince andrew in the first few chapters he was living for that glory right like he wanted to go to war to find purpose in his life and now when he kind of looks at life you'll see there's even maybe a little bit of class argument where he's talking with pierre here about how like well they're meant to lead right it's they're the proletariat it's the peasants who have to die the peasants who have to do the work and i think you see this this almost like approach to life where he's he's shifting his values, I think trying to find them. And one of the things that he's going through with Pierre is what is the correct way in which we should conduct ourselves in this world? Yeah, I think that we see kind of that parallel between the two and not that they're making different choices or even the same choices, but I feel like I feel like they're both trying to cut themselves off so they can have that internal uh, aha moment, you know, that epiphany of, hey, this war is bad, it, but I need to find meaning in life for me, and the war is not it. How am I going to do that? Uh, a, a lot of emotional developed during this time period, and, and, and I, fe I felt for both of these men. You also notice that this Freemason thing was actually, uh, came out of left field for me. Like, whenever people talk about this book, no one ever tells me about this great you know, epistemological or theological discussion that happens. And I thought it was, I thought it was amazing so far. Um, Pierre is the fish out of water, right? He, he can't fit in in society. Even when he's rich, he doesn't fit in. There's all the old people, all the young people in the room. He doesn't fit with them with either of them. He sees these Freemasons, like a stand in for religion is kind of how I took it. And any religion that is. And he sees, Oh, this is a place I could finally belong. And they even talk about the four different types of, of Freemasons, the four type of religious followers, the ones that truly believe, the ones that are just there for community, uh, the ones that are looking there for social advancement and such. And Pierre, I wonder, you know, as the guy that never fits in anywhere, is he using religion as a place to finally fit in? Oh, yeah. I think we're all looking for acceptance. And when you don't know yourself, 
and you're trying to find acceptance like Pierre, the first time somebody accepts you, you're like, this is where I fit. This is, these are my people. And I, and I think Pierre has found himself where Prince Andrew has not, right? He's still searching for his personality. Who am I going to be? Because I think you have to understand yourself before you can understand which group you're going to fit in. Otherwise, you still won't fit in. I think Pierre thinks he's found himself at this point in time, okay, right? Okay, fair but enough. Like, yeah, I agree with that. He um he even had that line, remember, where he said he couldn't really express himself in Russian, right? Like there was that line, uh, what was it? Unaccustomed to speak of abstract matters in Russian. What does that mean, right? Like We talk about how French is the commentary of the bourgeois, the, the commentary of uh, the language of, of enlightenment. Is he questioning, I mean, even his name, Pierre, it ain't no Russian name, right? Yeah. He is like this mixture of nationality that he's kind of exploring, I would say. I think Pierre is is lost. I think that he he thinks he's supposed to be better than everybody because everybody else acts the same way and he's trying to fit in with them. So he's trying to have that air of aristocracy, but he doesn't do it well because he's not genuine with it because I don't think he really believes it. But then is he supposed to be French that is the true, you know, kind of snobbiness of the novel, in my opinion. I think that's kind of how Tolstoy wrote it with how much French is in the novel and who speaks French and who does not. But I think that Pierre is is so lost uh, that he's grasping for straws and he, he he's, he's bouncing back and forth. He has no real commitment, does he? Did I miss this? He, he mentioned that his biggest weakness is women. Is that his biggest week? I mean, I believe that for Boris, but like, yeah, but for Pierre, what? Yeah, no. okay. So it's not just me. Okay, all right. I read that and I was like, does Pierre know Pierre? Like, what's going on? And, and that's the thing is, I don't think Pierre knows Pierre, um, or we're not supposed to know him yet. Maybe he does know himself, and that will come out later in the story. I hope that it does. But yeah, I, I, I was, it was a little bit off. It was a little bit jarring compared to, I'm like, come on, you are not a player. You're, you're not that guy, Pierre. The other people in the story, they're that guy. <laughs> okay, so we agree. Prince Andrew, not sure who he is, had a recent brush of, of closeness of death with family, isn't finding his purpose in life, isn't finding his purpose in war. Pierre is pushing himself into religion, but doesn't know himself, and he's being told to look internal. Yes. Questionable Perfect. what's going to happen next. <laughs> Part six, treaty time. Russia is now BFFs with France. I'll bet some of you didn't know that was coming. I'll bet you you did, though, Mr. Crypto. Come on. I need, this has got to be wartime. <laughs> we got to talk about the Treaty of Tilsit because I've got some artwork that I need to share with you here. Was that the hybrid version? War and peace and treaties <laughs> and parties? <It's> strange opening. <laughs> and then Prince Andre is able to just suddenly do all the reforms that Pierre couldn't, right? Like, hey, we're, we're going super liberal. I didn't need religion to do all this, right? But uh, it's 1809, and Prince Andre is traveling uh, towards the Rostovs, and basically they pass this huge oak tree. It's all twisted, evil-looking, ominous, much, much like Prince Andrew's life, right? And they, <laughs> yeah. they arrive, and Count Rostov uh, is, you know, he's there regarding his son's inheritance, right? And uh, they're all, they see Natasha, and she's all live, laugh, love, running around the farm, smiling, being a girl, I guess. I don't really like the way Tolstoy wrote Natasha. I'm starting to get irritated by Natasha, to be honest. She's just very one-dimensional to me. But, very uh, one-dimensional. It's very sad because there could have been a lot of character in both there, but we know that Tolstoy is going to focus on the two main characters, uh, what I believe the two main characters of Andre and, 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 and Pierre, but that's okay. So when Andrew leaves, magically, this twisted oak tree is full of life, and clearly you're never too old to bloom, according to that oak tree, right? <laughs> I mean, that, that's kind of the 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 point of this. The, all of this chapter is here's how you live a good life. And if you don't, then bad things can happen to you. I mean, that, that, I feel like that was the, the whole crux of this chapter. Yeah, this he part. sees his wife's photo. His wife's no longer reproaching him. I think a little hint to Pushkin, if you remember, the Queen of Spades, if you will. Now, later, Prince uh, Andrew heads to Petersburg, where he meets the father of Russian liberalism, Mikhail Sparensky. We know him. A real historical figure. 
and he gets a job and they BFF out as well. And they become all enamored with these ideas of liberalism and how to, you know, reform society. And they all get super duper excited. Now, yeah, everything, what, every, yeah everything's going to be hunky dory now. <laughs> Well, what's weird is now the chat, it kind of goes back in time. At least that's how I, I interpreted this. I think um, Pierre is is head of the Freemasons and he goes on this trip pondering the point of Freemasons and he tells them, hey, guys, I got this plan. We just got to kind of take over, start this, gov- you know, universal government. Everybody reports to us. We, we purify them like it's, it's going to be great. Right. Well, you guys down for that? And everyone's just kind of like, um, yeah, who, who's going to tell Pierre like and they're like this this is not how we roll we're about self purification we're not really about governing others and i think maybe to our earlier chapter talk that goes to that slave mentality versus leadership mentality right like religion isn't there to be leaders per se religion is there to be um people who discover themselves and how if you are a leader how do you pull that out right like it's it's a very different uh flavor than what pierre is putting out to the chapter at this point in time i would say agreed so back in time, also, the Rostovs have become poorer. The Count moves them to Petersburg to get a job, which I think is the job that um, Andrew goes to see them at, right? When, when they're all behind the game of, of keeping up with the Joneses in Petersburg. Because in Petersburg, you know, you might be down here, but in Moscow, you were up here, right? Yeah. Where you are matters, I guess, physically <laughs> and, I don't know, emotionally. Yeah, well, it's kind of all over in this chapter, right? Like when Berg proposes to to Vera in this chapter, uh, Count Rostov has to even give him like an IOU for the dowry. Like, yeah, I don't really have all the money right now because, you know, social status. <laughs> yeah, I thought you were going to I knew the treaty stuff was funny because we've been talking about like, where's the war? But I really thought you were going to be like, all right, marriage time. Everybody's getting hitched. <laughs> uh, soon there's a grand ball. And the emperor is there in attendance, and everybody's so excited. And uh, Natasha and Prince Andrew reconnect and dance. And then Tolstoy noodles around for way too many pages with characters and their tensions. But eventually, if Andrew proposes to Natasha, they have to postpone it a year because Grumpy Daddy told them they had to. And uh, Maria prays that the outcomes are good as part of God's will. And... Um, Suffering is a way to deal with the death of a loved one, kind of. I don't know. We need to talk about that. All right. Where are we starting? Because as you said, it's all over the place. It is. This is a chapter that's all over the place. And I think let's start with the treaty because, uh, you know, the Treaty of Tilsit was kind of a big deal. Like, I don't know if you know this. Have you seen these paintings of uh, Napoleon and Alexander embracing each other? Yeah. uh, Some crazy guy has been texting me these pictures all day. <laughs> and there's even one of the big old smooch. We got a smoochy in the tenty at Tilsit. And uh, I think this is the original 19th century BFF bromance, right? Oh, yeah. This, they were total bromance. Yeah, I love it. I love it. <laughs> they would definitely have a video or podcast or something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that the way Tolstoy writes this, the way that, you know, he shows how the French and the Russians are suddenly getting along, going to each other's tents, hanging out, and, and and they're a little bit, some of the characters are aghast, but for the most part, everyone's kind of accepting it. I think it's interesting the way that he did kind of show that people can come together, even, even through war. Like, you could see how they're like, well, we both hate England, so we're best friends now. <laughs> you think this is maybe foreshadowing some of the demise that's to probably come. This is the the calm before the storm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because, to, I mean, Napoleon actually believed that he was totally, like, broken out, right? Like, he wrote to Josephine that, like, man, if Alexander was a chick, he would be my mistress. His wife's probably like, oh, th- thanks for the letter, Napoleon. Like, super awkward, right? <laughs> but Alexander uh. just totally betrays him, like, right? Like, d- historically, like, at least that's what happens. Yeah, the, the book does like a, a good job of that. And uh, that's just that's so historically accurate, right? The these guys just always these leaders always betraying throughout all of time. It just seems to happen over and over. They never learned their lesson. They never really did. And I think it comes down to all of this effort, all of this fighting in the grand schemes. It makes little difference, which is so sad in the grand scheme of things. Now, in people's individual lives, of course, it makes a difference. And it goes back to what you said, you know, in our previous talk about like the little man making a difference. Well, I think, you know, when we talked, we started a discussion about slave mentality versus master mentality in the last part. 
And I think there's something to be said about these people who are so powerful and in charge. They get to decide what's right and wrong, right? Like making out with the enemy leader, totally cool now, people. Everybody cheers and and let's do this, right? But when they're like hating each other, it's just like, well, you know, I wouldn't go 10 feet near an opponent like that. They're, they're deciding what's right and wrong. And you have Pierre, who is going through these reforms, trying to propose to the Freemasons what we ought to do. And the Freemasons are like, oh, no, we, we don't we don't want to lead like that. It's about looking internal and the self and compassion and pity and being a good person. And I think that kind of smashes his dreams of how to move forward, right? Like he can't lead the way that he thought he could. And he doesn't belong in the society that he originally, I think, joined to belong. He was the guy that joined to be a part of something. I don't know if I would say it was right or wrong, but I would definitely say that it is what is socially acceptable, like you said, or what can be the norm for people or how people are supposed to behave. But I don't know if they're setting the, the tone of, of more moralistically what is right or wrong. Maybe. I don't know. I, I felt it was just more that these are what the leaders can do. So now we can emulate them. And then let's talk about in between, though, right? I think there's a lot here to this. And I think maybe it might be more nuanced maybe than what I've presented so far. Um so, so Prince Andrew and Speransky, right? Like Speransky, the father of Russian liberalism, huge reforms in Russia. Um, they're the ones that are kind of defining that, right? Because Russia, I mean, to an extent still is, but was particularly known for a lot of bribery, right? Like, oh, you want to you wanna raise yourself up in the, the table of ranks from Peter the Great? Well, here's, you know, some money that I paid to this guy out in like the Caucasus, and now I've got a, a caucus... Uh, you know, a title is what they used to call it because you could just buy your way into nobility, if you will. Well, now they're they're sending these reforms where it's going to force you to do exams, force you to pass tests, force you to be qualified for the position that you have. And that's kind of a big deal for what is ultimately a society that deals a lot with nepotism and with bribery. Oh, yeah. The, having the, the qualification exams is something that is catching up in in Russia at this time because it they'd had that in Asia for thousands of years and they'd had that in you know the Middle Eastern part where you had to take exams to become doctors and whatnot and I think they're just finally you know Alexander saying hey we, we we've got to catch up to the rest of the world here and our government can't just be based on who is your uncle or your cousin or your brother's sister's dad like we need qualified people and the government starts hiring people based on you know more qualifications and their merits than just, you know, what their last name is. And I think that speaks a lot to society as whole is, as we said, we'll change the the social structure of how people are going to be assigned in life and treat one another. And, uh, you know, of course, eventually, spoiler alert to history, Russia is going to abandon all of this again <laughs> and start <laughs> over, uh, you know, amidst World War One. But it, it is interesting for a time period of nearly like 100 years in my opinion, it seems like Russia is kind of on the right track to have a more fair society. So here's the problem I have with this book so far. I, I'm getting frustrated with Prince Andrew. Like, I thought he was my guy, right? Like, when he... It wasn't because he wanted to go to war, but he's like, okay, I'm going to be... I, I'm disenfranchised. No, no, I'm talking about Andrew, right? He's the one that <laughs> went to war. should have picked Pierre. <laughs> oh, you should have picked Pierre. Sorry, sorry. So he, <laughs> I was teasing you. Okay, Sorry. Right, right. I got you. I got you. Guy. So he wanted to define himself because society wasn't doing it for him. So he'd go to war. And I get that, right? Like a lot of young people go through that sort of thing. And then he comes back and he, he has this chance at a family. He has it a chance at starting over and raising the next generation, kind of just straight up abandons them, right? Gives it, gives this child to his sister to raise. And then he's all like, just whisked away. By this reform, like, okay, I can define society so that should give me value, right? And then he meets Miss Live, Laugh, Love, Natasha, who's so one-dimensional, just plays the clavichord. woo we're so excited, like she can entertain. And now he's goo-goo-gaga head over heels for her. Isn't that funny and, how, like, th th it hasn't changed in 200 years that the guy goes for the, the he upgraded, right? He, he got him his new 20-year-old. It, it it's like, come on, even Tolstoy wrote this way. Like, we can't come up with anything new. It's so funny. I, I was hoping that 
he would be rejuvenated because of his enthusiasm for life. And I thought that his kind of changing character would have helped him and stuff. Uh, you know, and a little bit of the religious element sprinkled in there, Bob Tolstoy. I was so hoping for, for, for Andrew to have more character and growth development because it seemed to be heading that way, right? From the last, last chapter in part. And, and it just kind of, it <laughs> fizzles oh, out. Oh I was my very gosh. disappointed. And I agree. I, I was frustrated with this part in the book. Oh my gosh. You know what you just made me realize? Bear with me. I'm going to throw an idea out here live. Okay, let's do it. So why did Prince Andrew succeed where Pierre fell, failed with liberal reforms? Ooh. Is it, I, I don't know if there's a pure answer, but is it because he was directly involved using his hands, living his his goals as opposed to kind of like, outsourcing it like the the traditional aristocratic way was you know crap rolls downhill you tell your uh you know certain people who pass you know the, the work down to others versus andrew's the one that's going to get his hands dirty much like tolstoy did the way that tolstoy worked the land with his peasants right and tolstoy was also one about reforms and how you know he was very against uh, this is written early in his career so i'm gonna anachronistically jump forward in time and Tolstoy's life, but he did move forward with pushing what he thought was wrong with, you know, Russian Orthodoxy. And that that came to be a problem with the church. But luckily, Tolstoy, kind of one of the most important Russians that ever lived, uh, you know, survived it and didn't probably receive the ramifications that others may have. Tolstoy, Tolstoy also married very young, like he married younger girls and was attracted to younger women. Is Prince Andrew mirroring a little bit of an author? Definitely a possibility. I think that because this is before, I think, kind of his crisis of, of faith, that I, I think a lot of the religious stuff is coming through for, for Pierre and Andrew here of... <sighs> our, we, we pre, Predestination or fate, destiny, whatever, whatever you want to call it, I think that... Uh, as much as we want to do, according to Tolstoy, in this time of his writing, there's little we can do to influence our lives. Um, and that you may fight against your nature. Um, you may fight against human limitations, moralities, but there is nothing you can do in the end. And I see. I think we see that happening because Pierre is making the choices and, and he is squashing his, his love for the younger women where Andrew is not. And we, we see that kind of play out between these two characters. Poor, poor Pierre. I do feel, I actually felt more for Pierre in this chapter because Good. now yes. he doesn't, he doesn't fit in with his, you know, religious buddies anymore, which, you know, I, I thought was sad, right? We talked, you know, in the last chapter about how he doesn't fit into, and he is basically not fit into any other society, but at this ball, the way that like, he almost is just invisible. There's that quote, uh, it's not from Robin Williams, the person, but he said it in a movie, you know, a script written by someone else, but it says... I used to think the worst thing in life was to end up all alone. It's not. The worst thing in life is ending up with people who make you feel all alone. And I think that's the saddest part about Pierre to me is we literally have to see him just watch other people find happiness. He watches at the ball. He watches at his estate. He literally is just not engaged in anything, working with his hands like Tolstoy would want. And he so literally being punished. gets... Yeah. And isn't that sad that he has to then thus watch everyone else achieve what he can't? It is sad. Yeah. It breaks your heart, but it, it's real. I mean, because I think that's what happened. And I think that's what happens a lot. I mean, you know, good people, no no good deed goes unpunished. And I think that's kind of what happened to, to poor Pierre here. I think we need to talk more about Petersburg versus Moscow. We saw him kind of use this technique with um, Anna Karenina with the idea of Petersburg being the more European liberal area and Moscow being traditional Russian uh, uh, Slavophile type thoughts. Let's, uh, let's keep our pulse on that. Maybe let's talk about that more when it makes more sense as we keep moving forward. Part seven, starting out with our boy Nikolai Rostov being a slacker in the army, but still being very important. Dad was a slacker. You're a slacker. You always be a slacker. <laughs> was it Back to the Future with the guy that's always like, "You're a slacker, McFly." <laughs> yeah, that's what I was doing. Okay, okay. <laughs> Nikolai's dad's a slacker, right? 
<laughs> they're, they're in financial trouble all over the place. Well, he gets a letter to return home to help out with the family. So he kind of goes on a leave from the army where he uh, promptly starts yelling at their head steward, Matanka, and basically yells at them for finances, only to find out that it's probably not Matanka's fault. And he, Rostov, probably not so good with finances. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's not a slacker. He's a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's redeem ourselves with some hunting, right? That's clearly a compassionate uh, play here where he's starting to kind of come in to be the leader for the Rostovs, right? His dad's kind of getting old, passing the baton a little bit. And we start having some issues with the next door neighbor. Well, first of all, we have issues with our own family, right? Like, oh my gosh, my younger brother and sister want to go hunting too. So they come along. How dare they? <laughs> and then we go hunting and we kind of run into the Il- Ilyagins, if you will, the, the neighbors that keep hunting on our lands, the nerds. I mean, that was a big deal back then, right? I mean, if you had to protect your land and how dare they, you know, trespass on here and try to take our, our animals. I'd like to get what you think of it here in a second, but ultimately they end up at the uncle's house when they kind of get too far away from home where they sing and dance traditional Russian music and, and such. And everybody's really impressed that Natasha can ride saddle side and can sing old peasant songs, even though she's been raised French kind of raised the aristocratic way that she probably should know this Russian DNA type Customs and behaviors. I think that was important for her. We can talk about that. For sure. For sure. Now, uh, the Rostov parents, they need that cash, though, right? Well, we, I noticed when I'm editing this, I said that they're poor. I think we need to fine-tune that because it's not that they're poor. It's just they're bad with their finances, what I should say. They're they're not the the, the aristocrat rich, but they're they're not poor. I think, I think we phrased that a little bit wrong when I look back on it. And they're trying to marry Nikolai off into Julie Kerrigan, who is super rich now, apparently. Yeah, just out of the blue, right? Did, did you ever get, I didn't get that feel throughout, I guess, most of the story. And suddenly now they're like, oh, yeah, we're going to we're going to marry you off to this rich family. It felt a little out of left field, but um, maybe I just wasn't I think it was attention. real brief, but I think they mentioned like, what, what didn't they mention like her brother passed away? So she inherited the money. Oh, like- yes. Yeah, that was like back in what, like 400 pages ago. I, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't remember. It's OK. That. No, no, no worries. No worries. So, um. Rather than actually follow through with what parents want, Nikolai runs off with Sonia, essentially, right? He starts seeing her qualities. I love that. The romantic in me was like, yes! <laughs> Good for you, yeah. Nikolai. Well, it was a cute scene. Like, we we go off into this Christmas world. We have the mummers. I've never heard of mummers before. That's why I love reading. You learn a little bit more about these cultures. Like, what is that? And you kind of learn that it's kind of like Russian caroling, where they dress up like it's like our Halloween and then go out singing. It's it's interesting to learn about that, right? Why, why mumming, though? Like, mummy? Like, you're wrapped up because it's cold outside? I doubt it has the English translation like that, because I doubt that we're means the same thing as it does in Russian, right? Uh, so it means I, I didn't look that up, right? That I mean that's probably what the translation exactly is. No no idea. I thought it was just kind of cute the way that they dressed up and started to kind of like eyeball each other and grow closer. You know, so much of this book have had characters just whiplash back and forth, but Rostov kind of returns to Sonia, right? Like it's it doesn't feel unnatural to me the way that these two are attracted and finally they're pushed together through the uh, I, I guess you're going to do the opposite of what your parents say, right? So since they told me I have to marry some rich chick named Julie, yeah, I'm going to go marry Sonia instead. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I feel like we see the the Rostov kind of blossom here a little bit. This is probably the most informative we have about them as young adults. And we start to see a fulfillment for Nikolai, right? He's finally becoming his own man and not just doing what his parents want. He's not just going for money. He's having this evolution of what's important to him. And I think that a lot of us can relate to that as we go through our lives of breaking out our own and deciding what's going to make me happy for my job. You know, I'm not going to you know, work for money. I'm going to work for love or family or passion. And I think that the complications of society have been weighing on Nikolai for a long time. And he's finally pushing those aside and doing what he wants. And I love how he's evolved into his own man. He, he's always liked Sonia, like kind of like that. That hasn't really changed. He's resisted liking her, if anything. You know, the whole Matenka scene was a little bit weird because nothing changed even when he tried to fix their finances. And even in the army, he likes just kind of chilling, being important, but not necessarily having to do work. 
Um, I, I watched this show recently that brought up like this quantum thing that I was like, oh, what's that? And they talked about like this quantum Zeno effect where basically like if you continually look at something, um, it can kind of reset the state that if you constantly look at something, it actually forces the thing not to change. It's the adage, uh, a, a watched pot doesn't boil. And I started oh. to kind of get that feeling a little bit with these characters, right? Particularly like as we talked about in the last two chapters, not much has changed a lot of times with these characters. Well, when you think about Nikolai, we finally see some of that change, and it's gradual, so it feels very, very natural in the story. And I think with Nikolai, he's finally realizing that there is more than just beauty, uh, that that all it seems like all the other characters in the story are just going for the pretty ones, and mm. he's, he's looking beyond that because he kind of knows, hey, we're all going to get old and wrinkly one day, and I, I want to <laughs> marry for love, not just for attraction and not just for money. And that, that's a good, nice feeling. I think it's all going to go awry soon. And I'm very, very nervous for him. <laughs> uh, so we shall see. Well, he also kind of is like stepping into the role of patriarch, right? Like this is kind of, I don't want to say this is his coming of age, but this is his coming of manhood in a sense where he's trying to take over the role of hunting. And where would you say Nikolai is getting his happiness from? You, you don't think it's from Sonia? Well, I mean, he enjoyed his time at war. Like, he enjoyed his time away. He certainly enjoyed yelling at Matanka. He certainly enjoys yelling at his dad and and, and hunting real good. Like, and, and even, you, you'll notice the way it's written, he was, like, excited to argue with Ilyagin was the sense that I got. That um, I think our boy likes conflict. Like, I think he likes struggle. Oh, yeah, I, I could definitely see that. I relate to that. I, I'm one that uh, I, I enjoy sometimes a little good banter and stuff, but it doesn't seem that it's anything um, too grand or drastic, right? I mean, these are pretty kind of simplistic things. I mean, I know the war. I, I shouldn't oversimplify the war, but he was never in like really grave danger. I, I mean, he kind of has plot armor, but he he likes things that he, I think he knows he can win, and that's why he likes the the conflict within them. You know what I was really pushing for? I, I don't think I can make the argument, but like, you know, 1812 is coming, right? And, and Tolstoy's doing his research. I Were you hoping that this whole argument with the Yagans and like how they resolve it, were you hoping that this would be kind of a commentary on the continental system being like one of the main reasons that led to 1812? Could this, you know, this argument over money and, and when taxes are due and whose rights are they like I thought that would be a, a really slick way to have introduced the continental system but I don't think it works necessarily yeah I, I don't think there's maybe quite enough details there I, I think that you can make a good inference for it obviously uh you know Tolstoy is is writing of the past so he could have given us a few more hints about it um, but I, I think that it, it's an underlying issue because it's not his main focal point of the novel, and it probably would have detracted from that. And it, it, it's about the emotional journey of the of these characters, for me anyway. Well, I think it's about conflict, though, right? Like, I mean, the way they they take the wolf and then drag it, and they almost don't even see it as, like, a creature, right? Like, they're just trying to punish it, almost kind of like how you view the opposite side in war, and it's not until later when you see, you know, like at the Treaty of Tilsit that they started to see people for who they really were. You get to see a little miniature of that, of when you want something to be a certain way. You can almost mentally imagine and will it that way. Like he wanted to hate Ilyagin until he met him. And he's like, oh, actually, this guy's actually pretty nice. Like, <laughs> Isn't that how sometimes in life is you have these preconceived notions of somebody and you meet him like, wow. I was totally wrong about that, and it takes a big person to admit that. But kind of circling back to what you said with the wolf and everything of, of that that hunting, that hunting party, the hunting adventure is very standard in, in a lot of these time periods as the growth of a young man of, of showing manliness. And I, I think that a lot of times Tolstoy is playing with the masculinity of all these characters, uh, of both the men and the women. Uh, some of the characters he gives, like, for lack of better words, obviously he wrote it much better than me, <laughs> that I can convey it, but almost like that sex appeal where Nikolai and Sonia feel very, like, bland compared to some of somebody like Pierre or Natasha, who seem to, like, just sizzle in in my mind a little bit. Um, so I, I think that for these characters, uh, 
he he's prioritizing what what is important to them. And so for me, like I said, I think I think Nikolai is uh, enjoying the conflict, but he's trying to find his own person, and he's slowly doing that. And and he's growing on me. He's becoming a better person. At least I hope. Yeah, I'd agree. He's growing on me too. I think he's had the least amount of conflict, even though that's he may be the one that craves it the most. I would say. You'll notice there there's the you've heard the term the social contract, the idea that alone in the woods, we'd actually probably be really good people, but it's when you start putting us in cities and crowded areas, the scarcity problem comes about and we start to turn into jerks. We start to be very uh, self-interested and maybe even greedy at times at what we own and what is ours when we're pressured by society, right? Like we give up certain freedoms in order to enter into the social contract and into some social stability, if you will. Oh, yeah. So this is huge. You know, good old Thomas Hobbes here told us about the social contract. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I think that this philosophical idea of a social contract is is broken on a daily basis. And these characters are very, very uh, poor at upholding the social contract to each other in a, in a positive manner. Well, where I was going to go with that was that you'll notice that this chapter kind of gives these characters the first time to escape it a little bit when they go to the uncle's house. Like they're out in an oasis. It's the the whole Robinson's Crusoe, you know, castaway plot where they're by themselves. Uh, the uncle dresses in peasant clothes and they're totally cool with it. Like we don't need to dress nice. And they play the traditional Russian music. And all of a sudden they're they're getting connected to their roots and know their, their how to dance and sing the traditional Russian way. It's it's the very Tolstoy, Tolstoy way of bringing about Slavophilism or the traditional Russian soul and embracing that. When you'll notice when they've been in society, there's all these pressures about who they have to marry and and um, speaking French to, to appear cultured. This is the first time that we see characters, I think, kind of escaping that social contract and being able to connect back to their roots, for better or worse. That, that's how I took this Oasis scene. They're societal norms, right? And these things are the expectations of them. And when somebody isn't watching you, you will be your true self. And they're finally getting to be their true selves. And I guess that's why I, I think this is a very, very important part of the book. And maybe kind of the turning point where a lot of people are going to start liking these characters more and relating to them. Uh, however, I, again, I, I worry of, is this just a, a respite that is going to be, you know, a, we're, we're going to see a 180 once they get back to the war and society of that they're never going to be their true selves again like they were out here, you know, at the uncle's house. Moving into part eight with Natasha and Prince Andre getting engaged finally and Pierre starts his existential crisis. Yeah. Hello, Captain Obvious. We knew that was coming. <laughs> so he moves back to Moscow to find himself. He drinks, parties, flirts with girls almost in a platonic way. Kind of strange, but uh, he definitely lives a looser life in Moscow than he did with his wife. He's almost becoming what he hates. Like He's turning into these other characters that he loathed the first, you know, three quarters of the novel. Oh, come on, buddy. You can do better than that. <laughs> So that winter, Prince Nikolai Bolkonsky and Princess Maria come to Moscow because plot. And Maria seems to fall deeper under Prince Bolkonsky's rule. He becomes a little bit more abusive, a little bit more mean, and a little bit more old for sure, right? And uh, senile to the point where he's blaming this French doctor, the Metevier, to uh, get out of his house because he thinks he's a French spy. <laughs> I love it. Now, at dinner, he turns to a defensive posture, thinking that, well, Russia, we just need to defend our borders. Let let Napoleon take over all of Europe, essentially, right? And at dinner, Pierre tells Maria how Boris is now looking for a rich wife, including her friend, Julie Kerrigan. Dun, dun, dun. Soon, Count Rostov, Natasha, and Sonia arrive in Moscow, because plot has to happen, and... <laughs> Natasha has a difficult job of trying to win over Prince Bolkonsky and Maria for the wedding, right? They're they're going to look down on them Rostovs. They think they're better than them, maybe because they're more wealthy. So oh, they go to sure. visit. Well, yeah. and also Prince Andrew's kind of the most eligible bachelor in town, if you will. Oh, yeah. So they go to visit only to find Prince Bolkonsky still in his night-night clothes. Awkward. <laughs> <laughs> he turns I mean back then fast. it's awkward nowadays it'd just be like oh you're home <laughs> Cause, cause, yeah that's know, that's everyday COVID attire over here these yeah. days <laughs> <laughs> 
So soon they go to the opera, right? Where everyone observes Natasha and she kind of enjoys the attention in a sense and is invited by Ellen to join her box because everybody's allowed in Ellen's box. Am I right? <laughs> oh. Including her, including her brother who just so oh. happens to start to lay down his um, smoochy face and googly eyes. At Natasha. And he got the boot because he's been blowing some money. Daddy's a little mad at him. And he's secretly married too, right? So no shortage of scandals for this guy. But uh, Alain invites you know them over later for a little soiree at the house. And um, Another party. Rostov, Rostov tries to, Count Rostov tries to keep uh, Anatole away from Natasha, right? He's doing the guard duty for his daughter, trying to make sure that she's not getting hit. I mean, she's engaged, like... Come on, guys. <laughs> I, I, I love the, the intrigue between these characters of, of this. So just it, it's so perfect of how, you know, they just they had no tact. <laughs> no. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, Anatole, I, I'd say Anatole tactfully gets her alone and lays a smooch on her only to have his sister walk in. Like, it, it's clear those two were playing cahoots together to me, at least. Oh, OK. I, I, I can see that. Yeah, well, it turns out the next day, things are just in shambles as Maria Dmitrovna, her godmother, uh, got into a shouting match and is just like, yeah, we, we better not go back there. <laughs> but uh, Natasha receives a letter from Anatole who says, hey, you know, elope with me. right? I'll make everything OK. And Sonia decides that, yeah, I think I am going to elope with him. I don't love Prince Andrew anymore because we didn't already have whiplash from the back and forth with these characters. And Sonia he notices. Coming. He knew it was coming. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, Sonia notices and tries to stop it. And uh, interestingly enough, they lock her up in the room so that when Anatole uh, well, comes to, to pick her up, right, to elope with her, there's just the large footman, Gabriel, no hidden meaning there from the Bible, at least in terms of wrath, <laughs> oh, <laughs> stops yeah, him. Angel, and he's okay. Yeah. Yeah. He's got to take off in a sense. So um, turns out that Maria D Dimitrovna really good like actually hosts right like stops this eloping kind of prevents huge disaster already going to be a scandal that she was considering it but uh plays a much stronger role in stopping an elopement than any other character that we've seen who's tried to elope like and there's not really a shortage of that in this novel <laughs> and i was a little bit surprised that i was taken aback that like i liked that character because she came off as very abrasive oh yeah oh yeah well, um, and then the last little part of this plot is, no surprise, your boy Pierre comes along, is all sympathetic with her, and, you know, he, he honestly is enjoying his time just actively loving and, you know, thinks that he would get saddled with her. <laughs> I think your boy's going to get <laughs> stuck with Natasha by the end of this book, though. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. It's okay. You can learn to love someone, right? <laughs> Well, you know what? I, I really enjoyed the this chapter with Count Bolkonski's fall, like his, his fall into senility, senility, senality. Um, as he gets older, it, it's kind of funny watching him just totally forget that his future daughter-in-law is coming over to visit. And he just comes out in his night night clothes. Uh, it was hysterical to me watching him kind of just become all grumpy. I could do without the, the, the daughter beating. Right. Like, that's not so good. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess. I mean, in retrospect, if I look back, yeah, it, it can be amusing. I, I, I guess it was just, uh, man, that, that mean old man. They just, I'm like, why, why do you got to be so mean? Why, why do you got to be that way? Life's good. You're almost at the end. You won. <laughs> well, let's talk about your boy Pierre because he's a good person, right? And um, I noticed that they called him Piotr, so apparently not Pierre. So I think we we're wrong about him having a foreign name. I've just never seen Peter translated to Pierre before. Hey, first for me. But he um, kind of has a heart of gold here. I think he's one of the first characters that we've seen isn't looking out just for himself, right? Like, like the way he's looking at Natasha isn't for his own interest or his own gain. He likes her for her. And I think he actively, by caring about others, it's a, it's a form of showing active love. Yeah, I think we finally see those kind of morals come about um, that, that he's been wanting to express. We see him finally become his own person. Uh, he's being a little bit more sensible, realistic. Uh, I, I think that the, the the marriage and the money and stuff isn't playing a big role. Uh, he, he's got past his, you know, existential crisis or maybe he's in the heart of it and that's what's driving him forward. Did you think the uh, comet at the end of this section was his gnarled oak, the way that that Andrew saw this oak and realized that life 
he can find love. He hasn't found it yet, obviously. He just dropped her like a pile of rocks when he found out that she was being unfaithful. But uh, Andrew see, or, um, Pierre sees the comet at the end of this chapter. And I think that's kind of his coming of age moment where he sees it and he sees the beauty. He sees time being frozen, like this comet just stuck in midair almost, going back to like that idea of, you know, the, the quantum Zeno effect from last chapter. He sees how something can be in motion but frozen at the same time, and I think he's starting to realize how his life can be impactful for others. Oh, I like that. Yeah, the 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 frozen. I like that. Yeah, I think that. Yeah, I mean, it's the most famous scene in the book, uh, the, the the comet, because the comet was real, and we've talked about a lot of other real battles, and you know, Napoleon's real and the Tsar is real, and there there is a lot of you know um, historical fact in this fiction novel. But that is something that is very well documented, and there's a lot of different views on, you know, celestial bodies and the comets and stuff. And I think for most of Russian history and most of history of humanity, these are always used as, like, negative omens. And for here, I think that for Pierre, it's that he is going to do his first selfless act, uh, and and he's going to love somebody for them and not for himself. And so I think that the common is a, a, a changing of his, his character. What did you think about Boris in this chapter? Because when I wonder if I messed up the names earlier, because I don't remember saying Boris in my chapter summary, but he's the one that was supposed to marry um, Julie Kerrigan. And rather than just straight marry for money, because he is a ladder climber, right? Like, let's let's not let's not mince words here. But you'll notice that he was always thinking like, oh, tomorrow is when I'll marry her. But he kept putting it off because I think he actually is interested in love. But going to our social contract discussion, as soon as his parents pressured him, he knew he was he was, he was pursuing it, right? And But he knew he wanted something different. Tolstoy wrote him to still have personal individual desires. But it's when she played that jealousy card of like flirting with another man, he the social contract is one, right? Like, is there commentary here how at least in the the time that this was written, maybe even still today, that sometimes the social contract is stronger than our own individual desires? Oh, it felt very contradictory, right? Because you, you, you think that he's going to do one thing opposed to another. And I think that for me, I felt like Tolstoy was giving us the idea of you can sometimes make good decisions for the wrong reason, or you can make bad decisions for the right reason. Uh, and that nothing is simple. And no matter what you're going to choose or do, there are going to be there are going to be repercussions, uh, whether you, you have malintent or, you know, uh, uh, good intentions. Well, and, and everything you just said could be equally applied to Natasha as well, the way that she didn't want to play the game. Right when she oh, arrived, any of the characters, she's, right? I mean, it, it could be applied to almost any of the characters here. Yeah, They're well, all that, that's why that's what I was thinking as you were saying that is, and it's it's almost coming down to this was the opera scene, right? Operas are people putting on masks, pretending, performing oh, a narrative. I didn't even put that written, connection together. That's so good. Performing a narrative written by someone else, aka fulfilling your social contract, what society expects you to fill. These characters are stepping into the roles that society is writing for them. In a language that you don't understand, and these guys don't know how to communicate with each other either. Oh, mm -hmm. Tolstoy put in the opera just blew my mind to a whole new level. I didn't even think about that. That is so good. I would almost want a shirt that says, society made me do it, but Dostoevsky would be so mad at accepting that as a legitimate response. <laughs> well, he's dead, so, you know. <laughs> I, I think there's more to... I'm slow. I'm, I'm constantly wrong about this novel. I feel like because when we saw some of the earlier Austerlitz scenes and we saw how small people's decisions can make big impacts, I, I thought this novel was an argument for free will. And now we see how leaders have a big choice in life, and we think they sway things. But man, not this is going back to that quantum Zeno effect. Not much changes, right? Like, like. The, the argument almost seems like I'm coming to realize the social contract, like the bigger wheel, we step into it willingly as a free will choice. And then everything else is just what society demands of us almost. I, I agree with you, though. I think that you're right, that it is a, a lot about 
heaven's will versus free will, the 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 choice of the individual versus the choice of society uh, or, 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 you know, religion or, you know, the aristocrats or whatever. I, I think that there's a lot of delicate balance and moments in this story. Uh, it, it has uh, surprised me a few times here or there, knowing the history of kind of what happens. And uh, Tolstoy does a great job of writing some of these characters, not all of them, obviously. Uh, it's not a perfect novel, but it is very enjoyable and very surprising. I look forward to seeing how it sounds weird. I look forward to seeing suffering. I look forward to seeing how each character <laughs> reacts to, a lot about to the ramifications of joining the social engine, right? Because we see how in this chapter, Prince Bolkonski, he's suffering. And what does he do? He takes it out on others, takes it out on his daughter. Maybe in a sense, Nikolai Rostov is like even a more mild version, the way he took it out on Matanka in the last chapter and uh, the way he thought he would take it out on this wolf and the enemy, in a sense. And then you've got characters like Maria, who's the religious martyr. Her suffering is is funneled internal because she thinks if she's suffering, then that explains death, that explains the afterlife, it explains all the horrors of this world. And each character is having to learn how to deal with the horrors of this world in a different way. I'm interested in how he'll deal with the horrors of war. <laughs> how is this going to come incorporate back into the story? Because we've been away from the war for a long time now. Hundreds of pages, I feel like. How are we going to bring that back together? And that's where I think a lot of the suffering is going to play out. Maybe not directly, indirectly. Maybe we're not actually back in the war, but they're going to be hearing, you know, the the horror stories. And that's how it's going to affect them some and, and maybe alter their judgments and their choices and their beliefs and how they're going to treat one another. Uh, we'll, we'll see. I'm excited to see. Well, where now it you goes. know why I'm so upset that we just skipped right over the war of the fourth coalition because there wasn't going to be enough like action unless you brought in the continental system stuff um, until 1812, right? So now you'll notice the book very quickly accelerated to eight. We're on the cusp of 1812, right? Yeah, the, the the big the big push, and then you know we'll get to Waterloo, and it'll all be over. So here's the question: What are the top three battles you're looking for from 1812? Out of curiosity, well, we got half this book left. We're seeing war. I mean, we better see Battle of Bordino, right? Okay. I'm thinking um, Leipzig as well would be a really good one. Leipzig, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, th I, I think those are my two picks. What are you looking forward to? Uh, any. <laughs> I, 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 I enjoy the historical writing of these battles, knowing how they really played out. And I love the human element that's added to that because sometimes, let's admit it, history books can be a little bit dry and oh, sometimes boring. You. How uh, dare you? <laughs> so I, I like the little spice. So it, and anything I I, I'll, I I would like any of them because I think that he writes well enough to where, you know, it can be the most boring. Nothing battle happens, but we'll still see some uh, character growth and intrigue. All right. Part nine. Isn't it a little funny how Tolstoy is just like, hey, I noticed that you saw how I was whiplashing you back and forth here's what I'm doing with this novel and just totally kind of info dumps like the spirit of the novel, like his thesis of history just gets dumped on you for the beginning of part nine here. And it's kind of strange how it comes out of nowhere, right? Almost like the, the ghost of Tolstoy descends into the narrative of the story and just sits down and says, Hey gov, let's have a cup of tea. And I'm going to tell you what I think really what history is and what it means to us as a people. It, it's a little jarring. Definitely. Yeah. Well, it's it's definitely the most intrusive one he's done yet, I would say. And and to be fair, if I had like a, a really strong, it feels to me that he has a bone to pick with the historians of the time. And, and I obviously don't know the firsthand sources that he was reading. We have hundreds of years of uncovered and debated over what history has been. But I guess it comes to the question is, what is history, right? Because I think a lot of people have unfortunately a dry look at history. Even you've made the, the classic joke about history books could be boring, right? And, you know, what is history? Is it just great people and how they became great? Is it just a bunch of facts? Oh, I, I hate history books for the most part. So many of them are just so condensed where if you don't look at primary sources, and I think that's probably what Tolstoy is looking at and why he has such maybe a, a an eagle-eye view of what is going on, that he he's seeing firsthand 
through these primary sources just, you know, a few decades after the war has taken place and he's reading Napoleon's journals and he's reading the czar's journals and he's reading newspapers and maybe even doing interviews. There definitely could be people alive at this time period. And I think that he's getting a, a better account of how people felt and, you know, coming to that realization, what was the point of all of this? What was the point of, of France and, and, and the, the Prussian war? It just, it doesn't feel like there was a, a, a positive outcome for anybody. Yeah. He definitely lays on the fatalism feeling a lot in terms of, you know, the choices that we have are kind of illusions and uh, all the interconnectedness impacts things. And I agree a lot with what he says, too. You know, there's a very old saying that uh, a man can't step into a river twice because he's not the same man and the river's not the same, right? Like things change. And I think that's true for history. I don't think that statement's true for everything, but I think for, for <laughs> history, we have different lenses as time goes on, right? Like if we look at even just how the Civil War and how we've treated racism over time in America, the way we look at it now ain't the way we looked at it 50 years ago, right? And I think Agreed. Tolstoy is kind of experiencing that same thing. And I think challenging some of the things. Now, with that said, he, Napoleon, beginning of European nationalism, I would say, at least the big movement between now through the Second World War, in my opinion, and, and Tolstoy is still in this big push towards nationalism, towards patriotism. And I think he still falls victim to some of the thought processes during this movement in terms of, you know, Russia's the best. And if we just have the Russian soul and emotionalism, that's going to override this war science and strategy. And uh, you can definitely get a feel for um, things that were victims of the time, I would say, from, from a historical perspective. I think that one thing that Tolstoy is doing here for us as a reader of the novel is he's presenting it from a, almost a, a biased, unbiased, and I know that doesn't make sense, kind of view of what is Russian nationality? How important is it to the Russian identity? How important is it as Russia moves forward together as a people or not together as a people? And I think that this, this book, this novel is questioning that of how important was this war to creating who we are? And do we want that to even be something that we're remembered by or that is going to be a defining factor of this? And we see it in these kind of characters as we move through here of, of this part nine of of that these small men versus these great men, as you mentioned before, and what differences are they going to make? What it, it, Crypto not makes a difference at all, but President Czar Crypto can make a big, big difference. And I, I love how he is taking the, the, the history of it and embedding that, uh, you know, historical fiction into it to give us, you know, a kind of a different perspective. He definitely goes deep. Right. Because multiple causality is an admitted thing in history. And I think I don't know if I don't know what, you know, what sources he was reading. Maybe like you said, when he's reading a primary source, it's making an argument for this is the primary cause and multiple causality is definitely a thing. And I would even say there's an even a little bit of an argument there of are the great men really all that great? Because they talk uh, there's those those Tolstoy interludes where he's just like, yeah, um, you know, they're kind of forced to do a lot of things. You're not totally free as a leader. Your schedules are determined, the meetings and the discussions that you have. Like, he, he does bring up some fair points about multiple causality and interconnectedness that might kind of get lost in a thesis when a historian's, I think, making an argument for a particular interpretation of historical facts. And we could take and look at, you know, Tsar Alexander there, right? Polstoy seems to be um, a, a little bit, you know, biased and, and positive towards the czar, but he doesn't ever come out and say that, you know, worshiping the czar is a good thing. He doesn't ever come out and say that these guys following the czar's lead, you know, without questioning anything is a good thing. And he does point out a couple of times, like, basically, these guys were morons for following the czar because the czar didn't know what he was doing. You know, he was making bumbling mistakes all the time because he wasn't a military man. And he was going up against one of, if not the greatest military genius, uh, you know, in, in, in modern history. Uh, so it it is interesting how he plays back and forth with these great men of were they truly great or not, or mm -hmm. has has history rewritten their egos to fit what we think they might have been? Because none of us were alive. None of us have perspective of truly, you know, what Tsar Alexander was like or Napoleon. This is the best talk we've had yet so far. <laughs> a, a good way I've contextualized this, I've been thinking about this, to your point about the great man and how great are they and how much choice they have, is... 
I would almost compare this a little bit to the story of Abraham Lincoln. Did he choose to free the slaves? Or is it the sentiment of America, right? Historians are now arguing a lot of different ways of interpreting of how much did the black slave narrative push the upper hand of the leaders? How much did, um, you know, the politics of the time, like there's a lot of different ways that you can break things down historically. And I think to be fair, Tolstoy is probably challenging some historians on, look, Tsar Alexander had a lot of other outside influences that you're probably not recognizing, and the interconnectedness makes it impossible for one man's will to truly have controlled or affected so many things, such as with Napoleon getting a cold in the next section at the the Battle of Bordino, right? Yeah, I mean, it's those little things of the secret message being found. If that's found or not found, that's what makes the difference, not whether maybe Napoleon told his troops to go east or go west or retreat or advance. It's those other little things that are the the, the big add-ons. You know, it's that, you know, one rice, one piece of rice, one piece of rice, and then something that finally breaks the camel's back. It's, it's not that big, huge sledgehammer. It's the tiny little chips away that make the big difference in the grand scheme of things. And I think we see that in, in Napoleon's characters here of them, you know, as you said in the beginning, kind of whiplashing us back and forth that are driving this narrative. And I feel like we'll continue to talk about this. I guarantee this is not the last time Tolstoy is going to interject into his own story here. But Napoleon enters Russia in part nine here, right? And Russia is just busy partying. And I feel like Tolstoy kind of, I don't know, did you get the feeling that he was kind of playing up that Russia was kind of caught off guard? Like the narrative, like we didn't know Napoleon was going to invade. Like it felt very sudden. It felt like they weren't impacted. But at the same time, when you look at history books, like, I mean, Russia and and Europe are constantly at war during this time. But since like 1910, there were information being fed to Tsar Alexander about Napoleon. They'd been making uniforms. The new musket was being developed. They even talked in this section about how it accidentally fired off, kind of like bringing his ears. Like these are all references that that things were happening behind the scenes. It wasn't just like a, a total shock, I should say. Well, we're in the heart of the beginning of the first industrial revolution and things are starting to move faster. And I think that Napoleon, for me, the way I can interpret it is he's setting up Russia kind of to be, for a lack of better terms, because I don't know how to articulate myself, kind of the bumbling idiot so that there's the good, strong redemption. Because we know how the story ends. We know Napoleon eventually loses and turns back from, you know, uh, uh, Russia and, you know, kind of his tail between his legs and has to slink home with, you know, 90% of his forces decimated. We know that eventually he's going to lose the Battle battle of Waterloo and that he's going to be exiled. We know all this. And so does Tolstoy. Mm -hmm. And for me, I feel like he's trying to to purposely downplay Russia's ineptness, right? Because now they can come back even stronger when they do, quote, win or Napoleon Uh, loses, however you want to view it. And to, that's an actually a really good point because that also plays into the nationalism. They won because Russia wanted it more. They won because the Russian spirit fought harder. Like it all plays into that point. And that's true. Tolstoy did know the output of the war. Yeah. And he, he's, I mean, writing this book for, you know, what, what's his point? What, what is his purpose? Is he doing this to make money? Is he doing this to, you know, to inspire more Russian nationalism as we have, you know, and this is being written 1860s, a lot's going on in the world and the United States and in Europe, a lot's going on, you know, with fatalism and communism and all these things are happening. He has a point that he's trying to get across from this novel is I don't think uh, what he's trying to say is I to the Russian people don't forget your history. We are a proud people and we can move forward being those proud people, even with the mistakes that we've made in the past. So we have Balashov, right? Who Alexander gives him his message like, hey, back off of my soil, you know, get 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 back. And he goes to deliver this message to the French army. He kind of goes through a couple layers until he gets to Napoleon. And Napoleon, I love the way, I love the characterization in the scene where Napoleon just like does not care what what his message is. And he even fails to deliver the actual true Alexander message to Napoleon. But I mean, it kind of comes back to the, does the boot listen to the ant that it's about to squash, right? Like like you said earlier, Napoleon is the king of Europe, right? Like he is the, got the baddest army. They're, they're thinking they've got the numbers. They've whooped them five wars in a row, essentially just undefeated. Uh, Napoleon's 
mentality and nationality of how I'm going to make one Europe all under my system and then I'll just retire and it's cool. Hey, I'll go back to peace. Uh, his mind is probably bigger than his own army is at this point in time. Yeah, his ego is probably beyond him, but he, nobody's challenged him to this point and still nobody does. And I, I feel like there there's a few references uh, in the beginning of this part to Achilles, right? And I feel like he he's purposely telling us that this is going to be a Greek tragedy that's not going to end the way that, that we, we we want it to. Yeah. And then up next, we have Prince Andrew, who's dropping Natasha like a like a bag of rocks through a Kleenex. And we see kind of like a different side where we see he's kind of starting to hunt down Anatole, showing that he's not really as hard on the outside, maybe as that he is on the inside. Because why would he do that if he truly just didn't care about her? And at the Bolkonski house, we have the Count and Maria kind of arguing. The The abuse continues to grow. She continues to grow more scared. I, I don't know about the translation. I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to like rethink about abuse here. And am I interpreting this wrong to think it's physical when it's just verbal? Either way, she's scared, right? Like if I'm reading between the lines, this is not a healthy relationship between a daughter and a father. Feels like there's a lot of junk to position in this section, right? Where we go from the verbal kind of abuse to the violent abuse of the war, that there's a lot of foreshadowing going on here by Tolstoy, where he's taking this one piece of, you know, yelling and screaming and arguing and, and the, the meanness of it, and then you see that executed in the war and how that it, 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 it the way you are at home is how you're going to be on the battlefield. And I, I love how this is executed through this part of the novel. This is, this is truly one of the highlights. If, if the last section was the greatest of the, the character development, this is the highlight of the war element for me for the book so far. No, absolutely. I completely agree with that. And you even see how Maria, interestingly at home, makes the argument that they're just soldiers of God. They don't make God's rules, right? God gives the rules and they execute them. And then you see Prince Andrew doing the same thing with the army. He's like, it's better that we rank and files don't make the rules. We do better when we just execute, when we just believe and have the passion. Like they're both making the arguments almost of execution and falling into like a bigger force, a bigger movement and downplaying how much free will impacts that. It's funny that you say that about what they believe, because this is Kind of to me, the part that Tolstoy is kind of snubbing his nose a little bit at history where he doesn't consider what the Russians doing are wrong, but he does write it in a way like I think a Russian of the time might feel a little bit insulted. At least I would of like, wait a minute, we're the reason that we're losing is because we're partying and, you know, they're spreading all these rumors and everything. And the, the misinformation is one of the big reasons that Russia is struggling in the war because they truly don't know what's going on. In, in, in Prussia at the time, they don't realize that they're losing and they're just partying it up back home. Like that's, that's probably one of the real enemies is the enemy of the state, right? <laughs> well, I wonder if we can interpret some of the, the enemies being themselves where they don't agree, right? Like they're constantly bickering. They don't agree. And like when I've read that um, history book, the Russia against Napoleon, they do talk about how there was an argument between an offensive and a defensive strategy. And you can see how like a unified Russia is causing a problem here. Yeah, exactly. And, and we see that, you know, take place between the czar and his generals as well and we I, we see that you know come to fruition more in the next section when uh somebody gets fired <laughs> <laughs> so meanwhile our boy rostov he's back in the army he longs for sonia but he's the big man now right Ilya and other 16 year olds are looking up to him and uh now he can trust oh his instincts right like we just go by passion too as they kind of uh, surprise ambush this other French guard and when they capture this guy and, and the, the Frenchman kind of surrenders like you see Rostov get a little bit broken when he sees like how scared he is or how how similar maybe he is to himself like he's he's not the enemy that I think he's picturing in his head and I think something that's worth kind of tracing to is like that great man argument I've noticed that our characters are getting promoted they're having more connections. They're becoming more important. I wonder, are our characters getting less choice too? Like their free will matters less be, because Rostov has to take care of Ilyan, because he has to take care of the army, he can't do what he wants, his free will of Sonia, right? Our own characters, as they become more great, are they going to start to lose their agency in this book? I never thought of it that way. For me, I thought that they've evolved past just, as you said a second ago, 
living by their passions as a young man would and becoming wise in their choices. But seeing that the restrictiveness of military, just like the czar has his day planned out, a general probably does, and a lieutenant, and a major, they don't get a lot of choices because there's always somebody above them that's telling them what to do. And all these guys seem to be guessing themselves as well. So I, I like that interpretation. Well, I mean, it, it kind of happens to a lot of the characters, right? Natasha, this is the scene where she starts to get more religious because of the neighbor. And you see she starts to give up some of her choice. This is what her religion says that she's supposed to do. And then even the religion, they give up some of their choice to what the state kind of tells them to do. There, there's, I shall, I'll say this, there's a heavier interplay between Russian state politics and the church and what its power was. I know uh, this, the novels talked a couple times about this recent break. Uh, you know, Catherine the Great did do a lot of changes in terms of reform, but there still is a lot of, you know, control from the state and, and the religion thing. The point being, I guess I kind of went off on a tangent there, is that everyone is starting to lose control to this bigger force throughout this whole novel. Every character, every every army, every regiment is giving up power, in a sense, to these bigger forces pushing it along. Oh, I mean, there's the, the interplay of all of these cosmic events kind of happening. We literally have a cosmic event with the, the comet, and we have the greatest, you know, czar to them at the time. I mean, Alexander is very, very well loved and respected and liked by his people. You have Napoleon, who, you know, is loved and feared by his own people and the rest of the world at the time. There's just, there's so much going on here, um, and, and all on the eve of, you see the foreshadowing of the, the destruction, the fall of, of Moscow coming. Yeah. Yeah. Now the last character that we haven't touched upon is Pierre, who goes to kind of like that. I don't, I don't know the right word to use. Maybe it's like rally, but where the czar comes up and talks and gives his war speech and everybody feels impassioned, that Russian soul to want to get involved. And uh, Petya almost gets kind of run over as, as they're all trying to volunteer and Pierre volunteers too many men because I don't know, it's, it's the Tolstoyan mythology that passion overrides all. And there is the old David Hume quote about how the intellect is subservient to emotions, uh, but it's definitely played up a lot, I've noticed, with starting with this section, or maybe just because Tolstoy finally told me what he's really doing, I finally understand what he's writing, but it's definitely played up a lot, I, I feel like, in this chapter. Yeah, and I, I guess I kind of glossed over it quickly. I just felt like it had been the same old song and dance of, you know, Alexander or Napoleon's going to come in and they're going to give their, you know, their speech and it's going to rally the troops and they're going to finally win one and wait till the next part because we will find out because you already know what's going to happen. <laughs> so it just, I don't know, it, it, it feels like um, the dramatic irony of the story is wearing out on me because I already know what's going to happen. And like the, the, their their rally speeches don't do any good. These guys are still, you know, going around kind of like bumbling it. It's like I said before. Well, let's find out what these Russians do at the Battle of Borodino, one of the bloodiest battles in all the war that you and I have been looking forward to. All right, so part 10, again, I, I guess Mr. Tolstoy is just going to introduce his chapter <laughs> as he kind of tells us about the causes of events and how there's kind of like a chain reaction, interconnectedness, uh, inter interconnectedness, whatever, that word, to this world. <laughs> <laughs> is, is Tolstoy participating in the Battle of Borodino? Is, is he he's there? No. <laughs> well, apparently he's participating. Like he but there. I mean, Napoleon, who was there, he clearly didn't participate. He didn't raise a single weapon oh. or sword. He was sitting there with a cold and it didn't impact a single thing. Highly disagree with a few of the statements in this chapter, but let's let's go through. I still like it. I just I don't see it the same way that Tolstoy does. So August 1812, right? We have the invasion coming to Smolensk, which we got to talk about first, right? Because that was pretty bloody. Like, finally, we stopped to fight for a little bit. But uh, Prince Bolkonsky starts sending ho like messages home to to Maria, like, hey, guys, um, you got to go. O occupation's coming. You, you need to split. And I think we see people interpret this different ways, right? You've got the people who don't acknowledge it. Who, like, you know, like Prince Bolkonsky knows it's coming. And he's just like, yeah, whatever. You've got like the the peasant who's sent to town, Alpatyich. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. And he has uh, got cannonballs and gunfire going off and still doing his shopping as if there's not occupation coming to the, to, to the land. Uh, you got a different 
different views on what does occupation mean to my life. Yeah, and I like how Tolstoy is kind of setting up this to be the centerpiece of the novel, because obviously we know that this is the battle that is going to be the turning point for Napoleon feeling like he could, he, he has won, and he's going to just push his way to Moscow. So Prince Andrew comes to Bald Hills, and he sees, I think it's Bald Hills, where he sees everything's kind of like in disrepair. Like, Yeah, he's in Bald like, Hills. So, so things are kind of like overgrowing and such. And uh, he sees a lot of man flesh, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, everything's in a disarray. And he's like, whoa, what is going on here, people? The peasants uh, have risen up. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's a little bit of a home bickering there that I didn't find um, super exciting. It, it, kind of like you said, it, it, it's still the bickering of, of internal Russia fighting, whether it's the politics of offensive, defensive war, or even just within the family of, of what's best for our family. You kind of get a, a mirror of home life and war life, I think, throughout this. And we have a very important scene of the novel, right, that is also a turning towards back towards the, the east of Moscow is the Count finally dies um, and asks for Mariana's uh, forgiveness. And we, we see the shift here of the novel moving from Napoleon and the west to the east. And I think there is a kind of a, a, a feeling that changes as we move through this part 10 of um, dourness, right? Everything seems to be a little bit more soured now at this point in time. It's kind of like Maria is wishing for freedom a little bit from her father, right? Like they, they said it's abusive. Uh, to me, I took that as physical. I don't know. But I, 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 it's an escape that she's looking for. And then when she's trying to lead the serfs away from Napoleon's oncoming advance, she's like, look, I'll give you the grain reserves that are usually, you know, for the, the masters of the land and such. And uh, I'll give you shelter. It, it was a very conflicting scene because this just came after this freedom thought from Mario, from her father, her slave, like her, her master slave mentality almost. And here she is trying to get the peasants, the serfs to follow her, to escape Napoleon. And they're like, no. We're going to stay here. And I kind of, when I was reading these sentences, I don't know, maybe it's my translation. I was having a hard time interpreting why. Because they talked about how they'll wait for destruction, they'll wait for freedom. Like, were they, at this time, Russia still had serfdom. France had abolished feudalism, I, I believe, if I haven't completely mixed up my history here. Were they looking for freedom from Napoleon, or did they view him as the devil and his destruction, or did they view him as both? And, and it was just a very hard scene for me to understand um, how they interpreted freedom the way that Mario was. I this is one of the few times that in this novel in particular, we see that Tolstoy is taking a clear stance on class divides. And I think that he is hinting at that for some Russian lower class peasants, that Napoleon was a liberator. He was coming in and they had heard rumors that, you know, the the first estate had been abolished basically in France and that the third estate, the 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 lower class people were given more freedoms under Napoleon and they were treated better in Napoleon. They paid less taxes under Napoleon. You had the ability to move up in the military and great rank and notoriety and you weren't stuck like you were in Russia. I think that this is a little bit of Napoleon um, um complex coming out in in Tolstoy's writing of saying, hey, you know, Napoleon wasn't seen as a bad guy by everybody in Russia. And then there's still some that just maybe like drone even who just felt loyalty just to his other friends. Like, what are you guys doing? That's what I'm going to do. Like, I, I, it's a very humanitarian pathos that we explore here, I would say. Yeah, agreed. Okay, so back to our story, Rostov and his army arrive where the peasants are kind of like not letting Maria go, they're keeping the horses, and uh, again, the Tolstoyan mythology, apparently one man, who, who is rich, he's leader of the army, but he comes in and just like puts the peasants down, like slaps one, I think, does he, he, he slaps drone, tells him to be arrested, it's like, go back to your houses, and I guess, to me, it was a little bit too on the nose that like, we're still pushing this emotional charge is what wins the day. And, and it, it just, it felt very strange, but I also felt very strange because it's just like, he just had this scene with Sonia and now he's dropping her like a pile of rocks <laughs> through a Kleenex for the, for um, Maria here, which don't get me wrong. I can see them together. I think in terms of characters, but it's just like the whiplash on these characters is rough. Uh, yeah, for sure. It just, uh, it, it feels like 
college, right? Everybody's going this way and that way. <laughs> um, one thing that I found striking this is the, the, the extreme violence that seems to be um, really coming about in this. We, we've talked about violence throughout the story. I mean, literally half of the novel's name is, is war, which you, you know, indicative with violence. But the extreme violence on the lower class people and now that, that everybody is like accepting to use violence as a means to an end, uh, it, it was not lost on me. Um, that that you know they they were doing this because they thought that they were in the right, and I think it it screams to the desperation that has now entered into the mindsets of they realize we're in trouble here. We we have been you know placating and playing this off for so long because we thought that we you know we were the best and we were going to beat Napoleon at his own game, and now he's knock knock knocking on the doorstep, and uh, they don't they don't know what to do. They're at a loss. You'd think there'd be more unity or just, um, I don't know if, I don't know if the term self-preservation is correct because you had like Bagration here was writing the letter. Um, you had the Russians, right. Fighting under Bagration. You had Kutusov, but then you also had like this foreign, the toy, I don't know how to pronounce the name, but it was kind of like the, the I think there was more German individuals under his lead. I think it was more of a foreign part of, of the army, but there's even a divide between themselves and the Gratillon's writing to the emperor, knowing the emperor will read it saying, Hey, um, you should, you should ax this guy. You should, you know, put, you know, control under one person going back to that conflict that we constantly see in this novel. And, uh, you know, something that's not apparent that I don't think they mentioned in this novel is that, you know, one of Alexander's main, philosophies of, of rulership and it's not unique to just him but he was very enforcing of this is that he shouldn't have just the power of or any one advisor's control and the army split up right between these and here you see where they kind of do away with that finally and do agree that finally that wartime you do need to kind of have one leader one martial law type of approach and uh, you see him kind of shift the power to one individual I think that's where we see here that this is definitely more of a story and less historical because I think in history, and again, I don't know what Tolstoy's, you know, primary sources were, but I believe that historically these, these men of power, they aren't going to allow anybody to question them. Uh, everybody is a yes person. Uh, then, then you're, you're going to be, you know, beaten, jailed, killed if you question the leaders. Because remember, these people are anointed by God. And I think that we have a very complex world at this time where, you know, you have people that are still believing in the divine rights of kings. Uh, Napoleon, you know, w was basically self-crowned with by the Pope. Uh, and and I, I think that, you know, that's where we see that this is very much historical fiction, that it, that is coming about in, in in this section in particular um, as we see this complex narrative happen and unfold in these battles. No. One thing I'm, I, I don't know the timelines exactly either, but I do know that Russia had a lot of younger people promoted in the army. Well, that's due to attrition, but it did bring in new blood in a sense too. And I think there is, he hasn't called it out directly about the young leadership that's brought in. And again, I don't know if that's till later on in the war, but you do see him clearly playing up the senality of certain characters, both in terms of Count Bazukov, who passed away, but was, or not Bazukov, uh, Bolkonsky, who was getting a little crazy, right, with, with Maria. And it was, it was funny at times and kind of terrifying at others. Uh, but here you have even the generals talking about, you know, Kutusov as he gets older, this He's been around for a while. He's been serving in the army and still kicking for some time that there's definitely commentary on age here. We I don't feel like we've gotten enough about the youth side, but it's all been reflected in this emotional, instinctual decision making that the army's doing to win the day. Yeah, I don't think it's just the youth, though. I mean, right, you have uh, Julia and, and, and Maria uh, that are supposed to be friends and, and Julia's, you know, talking behind her back and they're having all these parties. And it seems like Again, Tolstoy doesn't write, you know, women very well, and we've said that before, but it isn't just a, a youthful thing. And I think it comes back again to that it's it's a Russian thing, that this just is embedded in their national identity, in their culture, that this is how they're just expected to treat one another. And uh Tolstoy's calling it out on that. And I'm I'm it's very brave of him to do because I'm sure a lot of elites read this and go, How dare you, sir? How dare you? We are better than that. <laughs> well, Tolstoy, master of triggering people, never afraid to ruffle a few feathers, right? So moving into ruffled feathers, finally, the Battle of Borodino, right? We, we get there, and I actually think this was probably the highlight of action for me, just because 
I don't know. Was was I projecting much? But in terms of Ravetsky's redoubt, uh, you know, like the idea of fortifying this area and it changing hands and putting this bumbling idiot Pierre, who's always a fish out of water, continues to be a fish out of water, even war, right? Like he walks up on this cliff and is just like, oh my gosh, it's so beautiful. And I love this redoubt. Oh my gosh, cannonballs hit for fire. And like everything hits the fan. Like it was, it was actually quite entertaining, if anything, for me. I mean, you could picture this, right? The poor guy gets up out of his tent and he's got his coffee and he's yawning and he's getting this, you know, stuff out of his eyes. And next thing you know, it's sensory overload with, you know, fire and loud noises and the smoke. And uh, it just, it, you realize that this guy has no clue what he's doing and that, that Russia was promoting these youths because they had nobody else. If you read the um, war journals of people who lived through that, like if you read some of these history books, they talk about how you couldn't hear anything. The the cannonballs were going off every second. The entire day was nothing but chaos. And we see that in terms of how um, Pierre sees things, right? Like he sees literally like this guy's brains blown out in front of him, legs being blown off. P- people don't even know what army he's in sometimes as he's stumbling about. And um, you can see a little bit of the argument from Prince Andre. Maybe we were a little unfair earlier. I don't know if we were being unfair, but you do see how the absolute chaos. Napoleon wasn't directing every single battalion successfully. He had his cold. By the time, you know, troops ran back to execute the orders, they were literally either impossible or stupid to do. It it is impossible to control everything. So why do we pretend how much our free will can really impact all the interconnectedness, particularly when it comes to war, I think actually played out pretty well for what I think is kind of his thesis for this book. Yeah, and kind of as have we said before, he does attribute a lot of this, you know, chaos on both sides to Napoleon. And uh, I think that, again, he's trying to portray the, the, the Russians in some positive light. This is a Russian novel. And, you know, he's not French, obviously. But I think that the disorganization of the battle and the chaos and the things that are going on here in the Battle of Borodino is is a little unfair by Tolstoy of, of Napoleon being, you know, inept in, in, in being a general here. Uh, he, he's kicking the Russians' butts all over the place. And yeah, he makes a few mistakes here or there. But I mean, his big mistakes don't come for a couple of years. He is a little stretched thin. You know, his supply lines are a little bit far. And as you said, maybe he's not directing every single, you know, regiment, garrison, group of individuals perfectly in the right way. But for the most part, the guy knows what's going on. And it just shows how ill-prepared the Russians were for uh, Napoleon's invasion. I kind of look forward to... I don't even know if it's in this novel, but I kind of look forward to seeing if Scorched Earth is better described just because this is by far not the first time it's used in warfare, right? But it was used so strategically in advance, particularly for Napoleon's troops, to your point about being very strategic. They won the horse battle for most of the wars. They won the wars through legs, not through arms and guns. That this is the first time that, I mean, it's kind of like when you know the move before the opponent does. Russia knew what what Napoleon was going to do. And the way they held out at certain um, redoubts to allow, they sacrificed some men to allow others to retreat. The way they scorched earth, the way they um, out-manufactured, let me use the quote, manufactured them on the um, horses front for for what was an army that was better staffed. Um, I I think it says, says a lot to the strategery but I think that the chaos in this scene alone, it backed up Tolstoy's mythology, if you will, because you even had Prince Andrei before going into this battle. He was talking about how it doesn't really matter what the, the leaders do as long as the rank and file do their best. And, and I think that's represented well. But I think to your point, you got to represent so many different angles and and leadership does matter, right? Like, I'm sorry, Napoleon kicking everyone's butt across Europe for the past are we at 14 years? years? 14 was it, was it, years, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that wasn't an accident, right? Like, there was superior uh, decision-making happening. So it, it goes both ways, and that's just the complexity, is I feel like Tolstoy's too far over on one side of the chaos and lack of free will mattering that I think it, it, I think it underrepresents 
some of the great men to an extent, but I think it does expose that you do need to give more credit to, to the rank and file and emotion in a sense too. So I, I don't know. He's, he's right in some ways and in other ways, I think he's underrepresenting a view that doesn't fit his thesis. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that he's trying to say that, especially in the battle here at the end, is that the Russians, you know, lost the battle, but won the morale victory. Mm-hmm. And that mm-hmm. Napoleon is devastated that it cost him so many men that to him, it feels like a loss because he had such decisive victories time and time again for over a decade that in a certain point of view, this could be seen as a loss to him, even though most historians count it as kind of a wash. Uh, that that neither side won, neither side lost, uh, because the loss is so great on each side. But the Russians delay him from getting to Moscow, so they're going to see that as a moral victory. And I, I think Tolstoy does a good job on portraying that, even though you know, I, I think that he's a little bit harsh on Napoleon himself. You know, it would have been like a really cool experiment because I, I do think Tolstoy has really good points. Um, imagine in an alternate universe, everything pl- in the entire world played out the exact same up to this moment. And you know how I think it was Borodino where he held back his Imperial Guard, a.k.a. like the strongest warriors, like they were the best fighters, I think the most well-equipped. Um, yeah, the they, elites. They, yeah, yeah they, they were held back, right? And they're like, should we go in and crush the army? And he made a decision not to send them in. If he had sent them in, would the war have been over at that point in time, right? And to Tolstoy's great, I think a good, really good point is imagine an alternate universe where he did send them in because he didn't. Imagine if he had sent them in and they crushed the army and then how much different perhaps the narrative could have been about how his, you know, superior skills and then and, and thought everything through really shined as opposed to it being kind of like a, a both sides claiming victory, even though like this was just like the bloodiest battle in that Europe's almost ever seen at this point, I want to say. Yeah, this is definitely, I think, one of the biggest battles up to this point in time uh, based on just sheer numbers alone. But I think that one thing that in our hypothetical here is would would Napoleon have done that in our hypothetical again we're doing what ifs now so we're kind of off track here is if if Barclay were still in charge uh he's been recently replaced historically and in the novel um I think that he would have I I think that uh he he didn't respect uh Barclay and I thought that he would have ran right over him but I think he's growing a little hesitant because he realized that the czar is smartening up and putting better people in charge that are going to make you know better decisions so uh yeah, I it's a, it's a good uh you know alternate history idea well it, it plays to Tolstoy's great mythology here of once we know the result would we have backwards rationalized why that happened because of these decisions and he's kind of saying, nope, guys, come on. Remember, it's all chaos. Stop trying to justify your opinions. And I I think that's actually quite intelligent. And we know that the Russians do retreat anyway, a lot slower than what the Tsar wanted uh, as, as they're trying to get back to Moscow to fortify for that last final push by Napoleon. So I don't know. Uh, it all come down to the winter anyway. <laughs> Let's find out what happens and see if we get my scorched earth. Book 11, Volume 3, Part 3. I was really excited about this because he opens up with how mathematicians kind of like break down things to measure it. And he talks about historians doing that as well. And then he goes into one of Zeno's paradoxes. Crypto, do you remember us talking about Zeno not more than a couple of books ago? Yeah, name sounds really familiar. Uh, Isn't that like you can partition things off, right? Yeah, that's when we were talking about how things, uh, if you take too many measurements, it seems like they don't change, right? Like with the comment that we were talking about that. Well, here he talks about the Achilles paradox, where every time, you know, a slow moving person moves X feet, the faster moving person moves Y feet. And it just seems like every measurement, the person should never be able to catch up because of how many measurements are taken to your point. And it just feels kind of reassuring when the author kind of like reaffirms what he's going for in the text when you're reading it. Good point, sir. And that in itself, I think, is worth a like and a subscribe if you have not already. But more, I think, to Tolstoy's point is if you take a man out of context, it changes a lot about history, doesn't it? In the actual story, we have Kutusov and Benningsen who discuss their situation and they go back and forth before ultimately deciding 
we got to leave Moscow. Yeah, exactly. I love how this kind of shows the that you you retreat one day and attack another. And this idea of sometimes it isn't always great men, like we pointed out so many times before, um, and that they they believe that they have a chance to win this fight if they only have their opportunity, which they're kind of saving up for. We see it come about later. And it shows that discrete events, like trying to break down to just this specific decision. And I think that even you can even apply that in our real life, right? Like when we first started this book, we said, this is the war part. This is the peace part. And to that point of trying to break things down from a discrete event standpoint, you start to see how he's blurring the lines and saying how that's not even possible with even, I mean, it's a large book. I mean, mine's 1400 pages, but I even feel like sometimes you just can't divide and start at a point and have it necessarily always make sense to the perfect structure that you're trying to create in your mind. And Tolstoy got us, right? Because we read this and we were so guilty of it as war or peace. And the literal title is War and Peace. And I think that if you kind of reverse of what's going on of how we read it, and I feel like I want to read this again and think when the fighting's going on, that's kind of the peaceful stuff happening in the book. And then back in Russia, when it's all the soirees, that's actually the war. These people are in the warring class of one another. And I kind of like that idea of maybe going back and re Re relearning how to read this book as truly war and peace and where is the war really taking place and where is the peace really taking place? You know, when we look at the Rostovs in this part of the story, they're trying to escape Moscow, right? And I think they have like a couple of cartfuls, four cartfuls, something like that of their stuff, material items, worldly items. And that's when they also start opening up their home to the wounded soldiers and that's when they start to realize we don't need this stuff, or at least there's kind of a contention over, you know, how much stuff should we bring. But eventually they kind of have their mind changed to do the quote unquote humanitarian thing, the right thing, which is dump our stuff and help people, human beings get out of the city is the most important thing. I think I think there's a lot of character growth here from a Rostov family perspective. Oh, the biggest part, growth of the whole story, I think, is we finally see that Tolstoy is saying is that you can change and you can be better people and put in the the eye of adversity, good people will do the right thing. And then it's coupled also with us discovering that like kind of like that whiplash of Prince Andrew's dead. Just kidding. He's here amongst the wounded. <laughs> and it's interesting how Sonia sees Prince Andrew, but she's like, OK, we got to protect Natasha. Let's let's not tell her right away that Prince Andrew is here with us and he's wounded. Doesn't all that kind of feel like a red herring, though, because the focus really is on Napoleon's finally going to arrive and Pierre is like got to make this kind of crucial decision of the story of does he try to assassinate Napoleon? And is that where true good intentions can lie, do the best for the Russian people? And that's a, a big conundrum that happens uh, the internal struggle for Pierre of what can I do to help my people? I think it's true for the whole town, right? Because... Because, okay, so the Rossos forego stuff for people. I, I think that's a good thing. You have, here's what's interesting. They're trying to get people to leave. There's traffic congestion on the bridge, some him hawing. And they threaten to fire cannons into the crowd if they don't hurry up and cross the bridge. Like, <laughs> that, that started to make me scratch my head a little bit. Like, I get we're trying to evacuate people, but to turn the, the cannons and, like, threaten to fire upon them seemed a little drastic. Like, I guess like, I guess they're, like, trying to save more people by threatening them, but uh, it seemed rather dramatic to me. <laughs> yeah, maybe a little bit dramatic, but I think that sometimes, as the saying goes too, war brings out the worst in some people, and they're looking to save the greater good over the one. Did you know that you were going to get a PhD in how beehives work for this chapter? <laughs> <laughs> no, I did not. But I can see, you know, the the collectiveness of it and it's a, it's a good it's a good analogy. I kind of like it. It was super cringe at first, but he eventually won me over with it and I'm like, "Wow, this this I'm learning a lot about bees right here." And it was kind of interesting to think about it. But uh, also when you compare that to some of our earlier points about the leaders being elected, right? In bees, you got a queen. Right. You got a monarchy even in the beehive. And when the monarchy's not in charge, how do people make decisions? And I think, you know, he's obviously lining up some of the dominoes to talk about whether people can act independently, whether we need a monarchy here. It's it really sets up the story pretty well. And I thought I was gonna hate it and trash it, but I'm like I was like you in the end. I'm like, okay, all, all right, Tolstoy, I follow. <laughs> I really love that the ramping off of this section, it felt kind of 
I know we've said there's been so many highlights, but this book is so huge. It's it's hard to say that this is the highlight or not a highlight. But when Pierre finally saves someone and saving a life um, by tackling uh, Makar, he's made a choice that life is more important than assassination. And I think that's when it finally clicked for me, like, oh, he's going to give up his this notion of, of assassinating Napoleon and knows that saving a life will do more good than taking a life. When he tackles Makar before he shoots Rumball, the French soldier, and even the French soldier, who ought to be his enemy, see that in humanity, too. They're like, oh, you saved us. You must be French. Your name's Pierre. <laughs> like, they also, I think, saw humanity in the, oh, well, he saved a life, but they interpreted it not as a life is more important than death. They took it as like, well, you're saving French. French lives are important. <laughs> well, I guess, yeah, it does, it does come apart that these lives are more important than others. And that's been, you know, something that's been prevalent throughout the entire novel is the ranking of human life of who is more important based on where they were born. Yeah. And, and I think this is a theme for this, like you said, for the book, but particularly this, this book 11 here, because in the distance, Moscow burns and now we have the burning building with the child inside. And rather than save yourself, uh, we have a character that puts himself at risk to save the child and ultimately gets arrested as a result. So so he's actually, I, th I think this is a good humanitarian argument that he's putting life before death here as well and putting others even before himself. And not just Pierre's, but the French soldier and him kind of come together to save the child and that, you almost see that glimmer of hope like, oh, so Russia and France can work together when it truly matters. And I, I think that Tolstoy is making an argument that no matter how small or how little you think you are, you can be a hero to somebody. Well, I wonder, too, you have, you know, Hegelian logic that says freedom comes from society. It's a societal construct, which I think that Tolstoy has kind of been attacking through this whole book. And I think this is kind of that switch to almost kind of like more of a Kierkegaardian, Kierkegaard, where freedom comes from within. When you are no longer bound to the social engine and you make your own rules of what you want to do or what you think is important, I think there's an argument here that that's true freedom. And if you believe that, then I guess the question is, is Pierre discovering his own humanity now, finally making a choice at once he what he wants to do? Is he no longer spending money the way that others tell him to spend money because ever since he's come across this money, he's been told what to do. Uh, ever since he's had uh, aristocracy in his blood suddenly thrust upon him, uh, everybody wants something from him. And now I think we kind of see Pierre making his own choices. And, you know, even with the Freemasons, they were kind of telling him what important this was in life. I, I think he's finally realizing that the, the subjective truth that what he decides and comes from within is what allows him to be a human being or to be free even. And it kind of like all ebbs and flows, right? And that this war has been thrust upon everybody. And now it is, you know, thrust finally into the heart of the aristocrats of Russia. And they are having to make some hard choices that was only in the distant, those choices being made by other people earlier in the story. So uh, I think that everybody's involved, whether they know it or not, is the, is the argument that I think Tolstoy is making. Whether you're up on the front lines or back at home, you are being effective at some way or another. I wonder how much of that is comparable. That argument right there is comparable to Napoleon, where he's making his own rules. But we view Napoleon, he, he's a ruthless dictator. I think most people think negatively upon him, but I think some, you know, they, they know he was a great military genius. But the difference is he chooses it for destruction, conquest, and ultimately drives his nation to to rags, right? They're exhausted from a decade straight of war. But Pierre chooses to give life, to save life. They're both great men. But which one do we actually view as great? Is it is it the one that has the morals first? Is it the one that has the nationalism or the culture first? Uh, I, I know Tolstoy is going to go more into detail on this, but I think these are some good questions of what's the difference between these two great men who have found their own freedom? I'm excited to see what comes because we know that He's going to start attacking history a little bit here, and, and particularly historians. But I think that we're so historically removed from this by hundreds of years that it's all about perspective and whose perspective you read. If you look at 
certain documents and, and primary sources, you're going to see Napoleon as a tyrant. If you look at other things, he becomes a little bit more of a humanitarian and that he did a lot of great good and that he was this military genius. And it all just comes down to perspective of what Tolstoy is saying throughout this novel of the Russian perspective versus the French perspective. All right, book 12 or volume four, part one, the final volume opening up with oh shocker another <laughs> soiree who saw that coming right <laughs> how long have you been waiting to say that because i know you love the soirees <laughs> and this one in particular right because it's a little bit juicy well ellen is suffering from a disease i i, I don't even know if i'm pronouncing <laughs> it correct but is it angina <laughs> pectoric i feel embarrassed saying that word i had to look it up I, Full honesty, I looked it up and it says that it's basically a heart condition, like kind of like a heart attack. And I'm like, I did. Yeah. Oh, you're doing the literary thing where the person's disease is representative of what's wrong with them, right? Her heart is broken. It's torn between all these different men and it's maybe not even there, or a black heart, if you will. Yeah, it's it's a little bit too spot on. You're like, oh, okay, Tolstoy, we see what you did there. And people will talk about how there's uh, probably a cover up of medicine to cover up a. Uh, uh, possible early pregnancy there, but I don't know. It wasn't super interesting for me other than it was the trifles of society that I think, I think he's shaming her a little bit, which, uh, again, presentism, presentism, but I just didn't find it that interesting. But, um, we do have a letter that arrives about Katusov's victory at the party from Borodino. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Only to find out later that Katusov abandoned Moscow. Boo. Boo. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, it was either lose Moscow or lose Moscow and the army. So we can fight another day. Yay. <laughs> Yeah, like we talked about before, it's if you save the people, those are just buildings they can be rebuilt. I mean, it is kind of sad, though, that that. Moscow has been a hub of culture and art and music and writing for so long, and it seems to just be thrown away, at least how I feel that Tolstoy is saying, that we're, we're so focused on uh, all these other things happening in the story that this is the death of Moscow, but not the death of Russian people. I think it also shows us how war isn't necessarily all consuming to life. I think it becomes a big part, but you can see how these people still have gossip talking about how Ellen is going through this crisis in her life and you've got the war, which is, should be a crisis in everyone's life. It's interesting how he co-mingles the two. And even um, Nikolai kind of co-mingles his life here where he's working for the war, right? Like he's sent to go get, uh, to buy some, uh, what is it, horses from Varenza. And then he's like, well, I'll go to a ball <laughs> while I'm here while at war. Uh, it seems a little bit weird how we're even kind of commingling both sides of the war and uh, parties, if you will. That's what I love about this fictionalized history is it feels so ridiculous at times, but it's so good because you know this was probably happening the only time we really start talking about like total war is when we get up into the 20th century with the world wars when everything about everybody's life revolved around this war and for these people it really didn't until it becomes knocking on their door and Tolstoy is telling us this history of these people that it didn't matter until it matters and then they truly start having to make some tough decisions. Right. This book does bring up some good questions about total war, because there are some people that make the argument that this could be the first total war. There are some people that make the argument about partisan warfare that we saw, obviously, to your point, bigger and much more defined in the later world wars and such. Um, but he is, regardless, at this time, doing a very important thing, which is winning the war with feet, which is the cavalry, which is the Russians used to just destroy the French at this point is by outmaneuvering them, right? And that's why the part of part of why the French army just falls apart. And at the same time, you have Nikolai kind of giving the googly eyes to Maria here, and he wants her, but she's kind of grieving, which is a bigger deal in Russia. There actually was like a predefined period that you're supposed to grieve for him to be hitting on her, but I think you still get it, even from the Western eyes. Uh, but you still see how he prioritizes love and 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 his his attraction to her. And ultimately, do you think he gives in? Um, he wants her, but he wants to say no because that means he's he's getting money. He's getting help, right? He's marrying up in terms of class, which he wants to reject so bad. Do you think he's giving in to the social engine? Because ultimately, he kind of gets talked into allowing the, was the aunt to kind of hook the two up together, essentially, during this questionable period. 
I think he does. I, I think that war doesn't negate societal norms. It may change them in after the fact, but while it's happening, society and people are slow to change. Uh, I, I think that uh, the ugliness of what they're trying to do comes out, but no, I, I think that passion is squashed sometimes by war and society and it just so happens he gets a double helping of squashness <laughs> do you think uh the sonia story backs that up because first you get that letter where you're like she's setting him free and i'm like oh okay so if you love someone you set them free type of thing and then you get the backstory that she was pressed into writing that letter so the societal pressure that sonia you need to tell nikolai he can do what he needs to um i think kind of to me that backs that up don't you think Oh, for sure. Yeah, I, I think that it's the, the the same thing of what we see come later of who to blame. And they start, you know, pointing fingers, the blame game, because that makes it for easier for them to get away with things later in life. So let's jump back to Pierre, who's arrested here. He doesn't get along with his fellow prisoners. He doesn't really get along with the French soldiers at first. And uh, there's this weird trying scene that uh, it's probably worth a talk on its own, but it wasn't terribly interesting in effect. But to me, at the end of the day, uh, here's another more interesting thing for me is the, the firing squad. He's put up against it almost as if this was written by Dostoevsky, who, again, everybody at this point in time in the 60s, they've read, you know, Crime and Punishment, 1860s, uh, they've read Crime and Punishment, which came out in 66. Uh, everybody knows the, about the Dostoevsky biographical take about him seeing life more clearly after the firing squad. I felt like Pierre kind of went through a similar thing where Pierre has pre-firing squad Pierre, and then there's post-firing squad Pierre. And, and I guess post-firing squad quad pierre finally meets his yoda his his platoon <laughs> yeah all right so it, like it's pierre before is uh killing people is bad but pierre afterwards like getting killed is bad <laughs> it's like his his realization of killing is is bad regardless of who it is um and he finds uh, he finds peace with this realization right I think so, because he kind of starts to prioritize life over death, right? The saving the baby over killing Napoleon, even though there's that strange, um, remember the numbers game, like the 666 to kill the number of the beast, Napoleon. And you'll notice that he was even prisoner number six at this point in time. I don't know if he was doing that on purpose, but there's clearly a shift in his priorities at this point in time. I think there's a little bit of God element there and, and he has faith in God and um, he accepted his own death and thinks that, you know, he's probably going to go to heaven. So uh, I, I think that there is, hey, if if I risk it all, it's OK. I'm, I'm going to be fine. All right. Well, now we got to bring it down a notch. Uh, Mario, <sighs> don't do it to me. Don't do it to me. We've been she waiting the whole <laughs> becomes best friends with Natasha. It's, you've been teased multiple times, uh, but ultimately, I think. You know, you, you see these two come closer together. The two women come closer together over death. And we see Prince Andrew getting ready to pass away. And there's some interesting dynamics here with his son, right? Because he receives his... Last rites. Wait, is it last rites? No, it's final unction, right? Was was he... Yeah, yeah. He was Christian Orthodox, right? So, so if he receives his uh, f uh, final unction. Yep. And um, that last scene where he chooses who to kiss. What do you think about that? I think it, again, it goes back to that hierarchy of ranking. Um, who do I love? Who do I love now? Does it say that he loves somebody more than someone else? I don't know. Well, it is, does he have to say it though? Because is that kiss him coming to grips with the son that he never loved? And he's now realizing how important love is, seeing all this around him. Like, you know, he spent so much time in his life chasing politics, chasing the army, chasing various different things. He ignored his son his entire life, didn't really give love the priority, the spotlight that it needed, quickly threw uh, his, his lover away once he found out that there were some questionable things happened. I think he is doing the stereotypical thing where he's looking back on his life and realized that he should have cared and loved more than what he actually did. Yeah, so it's just, I guess it's the, in extreme circumstances, everybody finally realizes that you should put family first over work or anything else. And yeah, he's getting that on his deathbed. And, but does it make up for it? A life of 
longing, a life of loss, a life of unfulfillment? I, I don't think so. I don't, I, don't think, I don't think you get away that easy. Sorry. Sorry there, guy. Sorry there, Prince. I don't think, I don't <laughs> think it's his redemption. No, no. I don't think it's his redemption because he kisses his son and then his son, he chooses to hug his mother which I think is symbolic of the death and rebirth cycle. He's saying, don't make the same mistakes I did, son. And his oh, mother, okay. and he's going on to hug his mother as a sign of showing that he does have the the goodwill to love and put others first, potentially, is, is one way to interpret that. Oh, I like that. Yeah, so he's going and saying, all right, dad, I'm lis- I listen to you. And it's it still gives the dad a win, which I guess is fine, uh, but... I don't know. It, it just it feels like a cop out. Like, all right, you sucked your whole life, and now at the end, you you get a pass. So I guess it's not necessarily a pass, but I understand what you're saying. Well, do you think do you think he was mourned, right? Like, there's characters that still loved him. They mourned him, and if you lay that over in this chapter, we also had Ellen's death, who is almost like chastised, right? What does this say about the lives that they chose to live? Because there's obviously some things Prince Andrew did correct. He obviously meant more to some individuals than Ellen did, who constantly just thought about herself and pushed herself forward. Sure, Prince Andrew did that well. Sure, he was pushing for societal needs, but he still made connections on a level that Ellen was never able to, who, you know, the Karagans, they're just totally self-absorbed. I think we have to take that as part of the picture, too, that maybe he's not perfect, but he did some things better than Ellen. Let's let's admit that. <laughs> no, no, I totally agree with that. Yeah, that that's a no brainer. Um, I guess it's just everybody has their own different reasons for doing things, and I guess his passing is is very relevant because they are reacting to their loss because they're the ones losing here, right? He he's not losing; he's dying. So it's it's more of I guess that the mourning of of his son and and the wife and everybody else. Um, they're, they're the ones that are left to pick up the pieces after his death. And not that he did anything wrong. It, it, I mean, I guess he did. Uh, but we're not. none of us are perfect. And maybe that's what Tolstoy is trying to say, is that even at the end, you can have redeeming qualities. Uh, and that we all maybe die too soon than we should. And so take, t- take every day as it's your last. I could, yeah, I see that. We see a lot of the three questions with Mr. Tolstoy. We'll get more into that as we move forward. So book 13 or volume four, part two, I need to have a conversation with Mr. Tolstoy in real life because there's so many things where I wish I understood better. You know what I mean? Like things are phrased in a way where he's up on a podium In, in a book, you're on a podium, you're shooting out information and we don't necessarily get the chance to say, well, hang on. What do you mean this by that or this by that? And that's part of the problem with reading these books is some of these some of these things I'm like, mm, Mr. Tolstoy, can we can we talk about this a little bit? And also being 170 years later, <laughs> there's just some things that are just have changed a little bit, right? Yeah, well, I struggle with this uh, volume four, part two in particular, because it, it yanks you out of we just had all these deaths. We just had uh, all the, the burning of Moscow. We had a lot of highlights. And then we suddenly like leave all our main characters and we're going off on a side quest here. And uh, that was very, very jarring for me. So um, I guess it's good because now we get to see, you know, focus on these other things that have been going on and that adds realism to the story. But I still definitely struggled with it. Well, he, he goes into more of his philosophical things, which is fine. And he's really bent on showing us the small, discreet events. And now he, we, we talked earlier about what's the difference between um, Napoleon and Pierre and what makes one great and the other just an average man. And here he, Tolstoy is attacking a little bit of that with the idea of, well, even if they are great men, people still go towards the resource area that would have logically made sense. They don't need a leader to tell them to do the most obvious thing. And I would love to have a conversation because it's just like, what company functions without a CEO, without decisions rolling up? Like the the decision makers aren't necessarily there to agree that it's the best decision if there is such a clear answer, but sometimes it's to get everybody on the same page and the engine working together that some of these arguments, I'm like, do I understand what he's attacking? Because some of it felt either sidelined or straw man. Like it, it wasn't clear to me the discrete events and looking at it within history, if that really articulated the, the, the defense of a great man, if that, does that make sense? 
It does. I, for me, I guess it was kind of the same thing, but I was looking at more for that historical philosophy of things are always going to repeat themselves. And I feel like he's critiquing Russia a little bit, as, as well as the French, obviously. Uh, but kind of that idea that uh, the, the, the Russians are so disorganized and they don't take this serious and that it hadn't been for more like the French failures, Russia itself would have failed. Uh, but yeah, I, I guess he, he just, he's, he's critiquing uh, what he already knows happens. So I guess it's a little unfair, but yeah, I'd like to have a conversation with him too and, and ask him why he chose uh, at this particular point in the story. Cause I feel like things were ramping up and I feel like it's a hard break of, of the story to come back to those things when he could have tacked it on in, in the epilogue more, which he, we know he already does. And we'll talk about later. You know, he shows from it, from a pure historical standpoint, we do have a lot of new officers promoted. We do have a lot of new energy coming into the ranks and to kind of make the argument that they're making separate decisions that Katusov was trying to hold them back. I get that. But sometimes for me, it felt like it was just like, well, the Russians wanted it more or because they were Russian and they had more energy. Uh, that's why the decision was right. Like it felt too often that it was just like nationalism was the answer, I thought sometimes. And that, you know, you and, you and I living 170 years later know that we don't look at nationalism the same way as we do back then, right? Like we've changed our ways about the belief of of where does that sit in a global economy. And, you know, at that point in time, that that's not what we had. This was like at the forefront, right I mean, we aren't too far removed from the upcoming, you know, turn of the 20th century when we start hitting some major changes. When Tolstoy's writing, you got to remember 69, even though he's writing in the 1812 uh, war, that that we start to see some industrialization, we start to see globalization, and we start to see uh, nationalism put to almost very destructive ends in the future. And it's not just nationalism either. It's this patriotism for nationalism. And I think that those kind of go hand in hand. And he he has this idea a lot through the novel, and it's coming to heavy fruition here in volume four, part two, is that the French soldiers are the heartless, cruelest, most terrible people that are pushing upon their nationalistic agenda on the Russians. And that it's the poor Russians that are having to march home to, to protect their homeland from these invaders. Uh, and he, I think he does a good job of that, but he just, he's pushing home that ideology heavy, heavy, heavy. And because it has changed so much over time, because time has passed and it's not the same way it is, I, I don't think it's fair to critique him too heavily on that because he is writing from what he just knows at that time period. Right, right. Well, he, he, he does some great things. Let's talk about some of the things that are really good. I thought it was really interesting when he talks about, um, okay, so Napoleon, he, for the past decade, takes over, you know, you win battles, you win wars, right? Napoleon comes in, he pushes European ideals, mentalities upon the people, changes the organization of who's in charge. Bada boom, bada bing, people love me. We got a new city, right? Well, we don't see that with Russia. We see Russia rejecting that. And we also see with Borodino a change in where when we win a battle, that doesn't mean we win the war. For some reason, Napoleon won uh, in terms of like strategic positioning Borodino, but lost the war as a role, a Pyrrhic victory, if you will. And I think Napoleon is, or Napoleon, Tolstoy is absolutely correct in calling out that, hey, this doesn't fit the traditional model of history. It doesn't mean history is wrong. It doesn't mean historians are wrong. It means things are changing, right? And he starts to go into some of the partisan warfare and stuff like that, which became huge, right? With World War II, with Vietnam War, like, like well, depending if you classify as that, but it became a bigger thing moving forward. The rules changed. That doesn't mean that historians are wrong, which is what I think the conclusion he comes to. And that kind of felt strange to me, the argument he was making, I guess. Well, I think he's making the argument that Napoleon changed those rules and that great men do matter. Maybe they just don't matter as much as they think they do in their own heads. <laughs> <laughs> well, they certainly all agree we're in the we hate the English club, right? <laughs> it's just, well, the Russians want to trade with them, so... I don't know. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> so let's go to the characters in the story, of Mr. Tolstoy, right? We we have <laughs> we have Pierre as a prisoner. He's been a prisoner for four weeks as their captive. He's finally starting to fit in a little bit. 
with the French being able to kind of like mediate between the prisoners and the, the French uh, officers, if you will. Um, and, and we continue to kind of meet with uh, Platonov, who becomes kind of like our spiritual guide, if you will. And we have, um, I, I think, the three questions argument here, which if you remember, if you've read Tolstoy's later story that he writes, this is this is big for his philosophy. You got to read that story. Because I think it's core to what Tolstoy believes, which is the three main questions that you have to answer in life is, what is the most important thing to do? Who is the most important thing to do it to? And when is the most important time to do it? And Platonov, Platon, uh, he keeps kind of Platon. showing that, yeah, yeah, Platon, he's the one that keeps showing uh, the answer to that. Do you, do you agree with that? Oh, for sure. I think that he really teaches those the answer to those three questions to Pierre of you need to live now, you need to avoid toxic people, and you you need to to relish in the fact that you can be a good person. And I think that this is arguably the most character development that we get for Pierre throughout the entire novel, and that uh, he truly understands human empathy at this point in time, but he just had to have his eyes open for it, which is kind of interesting that it happens in like the depravity of society, right? He's like in prison learning how to be a better person. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's his three questions where answers were the most important thing to do to, is to help. The most important person to do it to is the person next to you, your neighbor. And the most important time to do it is now, right? And even like with like the scraps that the French were taking away that ultimately they're like, okay, well you can do it. And Platon's like, oh, see, the French aren't all bad. Like, I think we see this is, like we said, this is post firing squad Pierre. And he's starting to see freedom and happiness from this. He's starting to finally get enjoyment out of life uh, from this freedom and from finally understanding his three questions and finally kind of getting the answer from Platon uh, of how to live life. So all of this goodness is happening, right? And then we get the marching order to come in for the prisoners. And then we see kind of all of it start crumbling down on them. I think it does for most, except maybe not for Pierre, right? Like the French soldiers aren't free, right? They're still restricted to the social engine, military orders of what they need to do. But Pierre, he, there's something about the sky in this book. The way he looks up, he sees the higher power, right? And he feels free. Like this is for the this is one of the first few times post firing squad Pierre just continues to not feel constrained the same way everyone else does, even though he's lost freedom of choice, I guess, in a sense, with having to do this march. Yeah, you know, I think that he's, he's looking up and looking towards the future for the first time for himself and not just the betterment of Russia. It, 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 it's more than just him. He's finally realizing that there is greaterness out there. And Kutusov finally kind of celebrates as the French start to all collect towards Smolensk. Uh, yeah, things aren't going to go out good there. <laughs> Big bada boom coming. <laughs> Book 14, Volume 4, Part 3. Tolstoy is now our narrator, officially. <laughs> he He's going to tell us that you win wars through... The spirit of your country, I don't know, I don't, yeah. not feeling that one, but I feel like there's a lot to what was happening in the war at this time, and Tolstoy knows that, but he chose, I, I think he chose not to represent, you know, the decade-long war that led up to this event. Uh, a lot of Europeans focus on the climate of, of Russian winters at this point in time, uh, the the lack of prepare, preparation Napoleon had, because up to this point, countries, you win wars, you take over capitals, they give up. Well, that didn't happen with Russia, right? So Napoleon himself was unprepared for kind of trying to hang out in Moscow. Uh, I, I think he represents a decent amount on that side, but there's a few things that I think that aren't represented for why Napoleon lost. And it wasn't just because Russia didn't give up and it wasn't just the Russian spirit that made them win is what I would say. I know that Tolstoy is our narrator, and I don't think that he was confused because I think he was a genius, far smarter than I, but it almost feels like he's intentionally being confused himself. Like he, he wrote himself the narrator being confused and oversimplifying the war because he's looking back and studying history and thinking, wow, this is how you win wars. And Napoleon's rewriting the guide to winning wars. Mm. And even the new guide doesn't win wars. And he's saying that this oversimplification isn't going to work anymore. And I think that he, he's poor. He, he, through the whole story, he's trying to portray 
the Napoleon and and the French as the bad guys. He's depicted them that. Even we've talked about before that you know the language itself is is supposed to be the uh, language, the, the French language. And I think that here he he's trying to say that no matter what, this is all kind of like tragic. Um, and that we don't know how history will play out with great men or not great men or or any of these things. Okay. Okay, I can see that. And I, and I, I, I do see that because if we look at the partisan warfare discussion here, uh, you and I living 170 years later can apply that. Of, of how right was Tolstoy here? Absolutely right. Right. Like the partisan warfare, particularly with like the, uh, the German Wehrmacht when they were kind of going in through Eastern Europe. Uh, it was a big deal and, and it played a big role in slowing down armies. And we saw lots of times recently here um, with how important it is for countries to never give up fighting, right? It's like that old Winston Churchill quote, the nations that go down fighting rise again, but those who surrender tamely are finished. And I don't think it's, <laughs> I, I don't think it's honestly just a comment on patriotism. I think it is a comment on uh, how war force, warfare is changing and how much individuals can uh, all contribute to the spirit of what co countries can accomplish, if you will. It's not just the great men that direct them. And you're right, Tolstoy does uh, direct us with specifically kind of putting up ideas and then ripping them down later. Like that's, that's kind of like his goal of this whole novel, it seems to me, is to put ideas out there knowing he's going to attack them later on. And this is really the culmination of all of those ideas, right? Because to take Churchill's saying, yes, it is a rallying cry. It is to boost morale that we're not going to go down fighting. And this idea that, you know, we're not going to surrender, but there's so many things changing. And Napoleon has changed so many things. And I think that, that, that Tolstoy is saying, hey— if we keep fighting, we may lose today, but we'll get to fight tomorrow. Uh, we just we can't give up hope, and I think that's really what Churchill saying is is going for here. And I think what what Tolstoy is saying is that uh, we may lose our city, but if we don't lose our hope, if we don't lose who we are, then we can continue fighting, and we won't be oppressed by the French, and we can rebuild, and we can be better people because of it. They're not they're not going to bring us down. Where does Petcha play into that narrative, right? Because he starts real wide here with like this philosophy of war and how people are part of it, right? And then he jumps into an individual, Petcha, who's come to Denisov's army. He's supposed to go back, but when he hears that they're going to run these raids and run for intel, he's like, oh, I got to stay. I got to be a part of that. Because he believes he's got this view of heroism that he wants to accomplish, right? So he's like, okay, I'm going to stick around. I'm going to participate in that. And that's how I will be a hero. And he goes in and, it, well, even that night, remember uh, going to the sky thing, he re he looks up and reaches up to the sky and feels free. Like uh, his thing above, like the sky, like you remember Prince Andrew looked for it. Pierre looked for it in the last chapter. Uh, uh, the Andrew references from Austerlitz, if you recall, after he almost nearly died, Pierre, when he got his moment of grace uh, of post-firing squad. And here's Petcha. The night before he goes into this raid, looks up and sees the sky and sees how beautiful it is. And I think he's surrendering to that bigger power. Uh, the question is, what is that bigger power? Can we define that, or is there one bigger power for everyone? Um, that's that's pretty deep right there. I don't know what to say to that, but I'll, I'll go back to one uh, comment you made just a moment ago of, I feel like Toy Story is making an argument that historians glorify war. I know that when we look at a history book, a lot of times the chapters are divided up by wars or time periods are divided by wars. When I did my own curriculum, it was 1865 to 1914. Why? It's bookend by wars. Everything is about war here. And I think that he's trying to make a point that there's more to life than that. He's trying to illustrate that it's about people and not these grand events. Um, and it, it it's easy for us just to fall into the norm of, you know, there's the War of 1812, and then there's this war, and then there's this war. And that life is a lot muddier than that. It's not so clear as just jumping from war to war. Do you think, so we talked earlier about in the in two chapters ago with Prince Andrew's death and him um, kind of the death reverse cycle with, with his son getting a second chance. 
Well, here's a young generation, Pecha, who goes in and it's like, it's almost shocking how fast he just gets popped dead. <laughs> it just, it happens so quick for a character that I thought was going to have more for him. Do you think, um, Tolstoy, to your earlier point, is ripping down one of his previous arguments, that it's not just that Pecha wanted it, that there's there's more to life and there's a bigger element to it. And do you think this makes us re-question what it takes to accomplish things in life? I want to say that it's just a plot hole, but yeah, I, he seems to be breaking his own narrative. And I think that Tolstoy is saying that you don't always get what you want and that uh, it, it, it's hard sometimes to appreciate uh, the depths of suffering and that you can want something so bad and it can be ripped right out from underneath you. Well, or, or is it the death of wrong ideals, right? That the putting your faith into something that, that isn't really true or honest, like the great men, the, the belief, the Russian spirit. I, I don't know what you want to call it, but it's almost like it's the death of that to give birth. Because if you remember, who do they free? They free Pierre, who is putting life first, who is putting his his new way of looking at life into action by finally being freed. So again, you have the end of one thing and the beginning of another thing with how they free the soldiers at this point in time. Yeah, that's some good insight. And we do finally see Pierre, I think, appreciate the depths of suffering and that, that the death has finally allowed him to be free. Because I think he's internalizing it a lot through the, the few previous volumes that we talked about. But I think finally now... Uh, it being forced upon him, uh, we we see a spiritual awakening for him. And it's it's kind of strange how Tolstoy puts a flashback here back to Platon again. We've read the uh, God Sees the Truth but Waits short story that's kind of interjected here. Uh, it, it felt a little bit like rehash of, of, you know, okay, so we got it. Pierre's choosing love. He's choosing life. We got it. <laughs> kind of got repeated here to me. Uh, only to come back to Napoleon not being great at the end here as the French army kind of starts to fall apart. Uh, I don't know. I, I didn't have too much new insight. It felt like a little bit of stuff that we've kind of covered, just kind of confirming that, no, this is true. The French army is really falling apart. And yes, I think Tolstoy is making an argument for uh, putting life before death, even like the senselessness of war, which doesn't sound like new information to me. Yeah, it's a little bit of rehash. It feels like it's just a, a backhanded almost compliment of the success of the Russians when it's really the failures of the French, like we've said. Well, and then Kutusov, to your point about, or to our point about life, is he didn't just crush Napoleon. Like his point was preserving life as opposed to destroying it. And this is way before a lot of his arguments that he grows into. I just don't know how much of it was in this text, but eventually he starts putting out papers about how Christian armies or Christian nations should disarm. Right. There's no point to kill other people. Um, bold statement, Mr. Tolstoy. Uh, but I, I wonder if this is kind of like the not fully formed vision of that. But I wonder if this is the seed. You know what I mean? Like him seeing I think he really respected Katusov. I think he wrote this book because of Katusov and seeing how he prioritized life and putting that even even to Pierre and Pierre, we said, was even maybe a little bit of a analog for Mr. Tolstoy himself on some levels that uh, you see that he's really starting to grow that seed of what is most important in life and how to nurture it. Agreed. All right, book 15, volume four, part four, last of the numbered books per se. Uh, let's flip back to the Bolkonsky family, if you remember them. like We haven't seen them since Prince Andrew's death, but we had to have some time to mourn where Maria and Natasha have grown together, right? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I ask you a question. Let me, let me throw you a question. <laughs> okay, do you okay. think Do you think that these deaths are bringing out the best qualities of people? I think when a death happens that in real life and literature— it changes people and allows people to almost like you want to reflect on them. But I notice sometimes, I mean, I don't mean to be rude, but it, it people become more self-reflective looking at themselves and it's not bad. Like we say the good is celebrating that person in their life. But I think a lot of times what it really does is allow you to focus internally of, am I still doing the right thing? What did this person do that was best and what should I take and, and adjust my life to? Uh, which I don't think is bad, but I think some people may take it that way. And 
I think it continues that death and rebirth argument that we've kind of talked about in a couple of different books, because with Prince Andrew's death, anew is the relationship with with these these female characters, Natasha and Mario. And I think also with Pecha's death, like one of the, I don't know, I thought he was kind of like a mediumish to big character to me. He's part of a big character's family, at least, we'll say that. That it's the also the last that we see of warfare, right? It's the end of death and opportunity for growth moving forward. So I guess to answer your question, uh, now that I've wandered off enough, is I think this is a chance at new beginnings for a lot of these characters. All right. To answer your question then, I, I think that for Natasha anyway, uh, she has matured because of these deaths. And I think that that happens to a lot of people in in, in fiction, nonfiction, life in general. But sometimes for me, I feel like Tolstoy writes women very poorly. And I think that if we look at the best iteration of one of his female characters, it's Natasha at this point in the story, that she's finally kind of embodied uh, what is to Tolstoy the ideal woman in the 19th century Russian setting, um, that she is not simplistic anymore. Um, she's a little bit still complacent, but uh, she's grown uh, beyond the expectations of the societal norms that have been placed upon her. And that's the betterment of all society as we move forward as people. Let's talk about um, Kutusov, actually. Let's wrap that storyline up. Because it is kind of sad that the ending of these numbered sections is where we finally see the death of our favorite general, if you will. Um, the man that prioritized life over death. And I still argue is probably the reason why Tolstoy wanted to write this story is, is I think Tolstoy saw something in that character. And we see how everybody was pushing him, you know, onto Krasnoe. And we kind of just really skipped over Smolensk. Like, I thought I thought Smolensk might be the final battle because that's where, like, what was it, like 80, 90% of the city was just absolutely razed. Like, the entire town was destroyed. And, and I thought that would be the continuing of the whole destruction into rebirth type of mentality that we see in a lot of this book. But it wasn't. We just kind of gloss over it. But I guess that's kind of what this book's doing. We started out in a soiree, focused in on people, focused in on the assassination of, of one person, the discussion between two families. It was very small. And then we start to step back into bigger philosophical ideas. And we're no longer in a person's head, such as with uh, Auschwitz and like a very detailed battle, which was probably the most detailed battle. I thought, you know, Smolensk would be like this too as like a grand finale, but it's the opposite. Tolstoy keeps backing up and going up to the big ideas. And to me, I think his backup from Kutusov is how Kutusov was representing that Russian mentality, that ideal mother Russia, right? Like it's, it's the idea of, of giving birth to a new land and a new beginning. And honestly, even for Europe, right? Like, like Russia has always been connected with Europe to defeat Napoleon is to change Europe. It's not just a Russian victory. This is a change to all of Europe. And I think this is like Tolstoy's backing up of what Kutusov's role was in changing to changing a continent's history and in future even. I think it really it comes down to him trying to squeeze in at the end here how we all different experience war and that these few crucial deaths like Pris Andrew um, is really going to push thinking about our own death. Uh, you figure that he had plot armor, right? He was going to make it to the end and Tolstoy kind of subverted my expectations of the novel killing him i kind of you know it was hinted at obviously um throughout the novel that so many times he was about ready to die and that you know he was longing for that escape um from from life that the death was the next chapter for him and now he finally has it um but as i said i think it kind of finally we see the best in some of the worst characters because of of the death here at the end pulling everything together I think I think he did a good job with it too, right? Because he even zoomed in on like you thought like Rumball was a throwaway character, the one that uh, you know that Pierre saved. But you see how here when like they cut like the French soldiers that are discombobulated and come in, they clothe them, they feed them, they look up at the same sky. There's that sky thing again together, like the bigger that we're under something bigger than just us. I think he does a good job of tying together this that uh, 
this novel is so broad. It's amazing how many different connections that, that you can make and, and that we've missed, right? Like there's people out there that are probably wondering, why didn't we talk about this? And, and either we didn't have time or whether we just didn't pick up on it possibly, right? Like Tolstoy did a good job of showing how connected uh, the novel can be compared to how connected life can be, how we've seen these characters before, how they can be under something bigger, and how small characters' actions can lead to very different outcomes in life. Yeah, I agree. I think that the deaths, you know, all kind of parallel one another and zooming out and in and out in so many times throughout the novel, it is kind of hard to keep up with everything. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're pushing hours and hours of the discussion here. Uh, I think on a broader scale, as we kind of zoom out here, uh, the French retreat at the end, um, these terrible situations, it's a very dramatic time period in Russian history. Uh, but it, it, it's a brief sequence of seeing, you know, what people have become uh, of these different families that we've been following for a decade now, um, you know, back and forth, back and forth, um, that, that we all have a lot in common and that it's going to pave the way for a better future for the Russian and French peoples. Well, and then I wonder, too, how much of it is a lot of people write about how a lot of the 13 to 14, 1813, 1814 campaign are, you know, German led or foreign led that it's not necessarily just a Russian story at that point in time. You know, we didn't get Battle of Trafalgar and stuff like that. Like, like. Tolstoy is keeping it to the Russian story, too. So I guess I didn't realize that when I was getting into this novel either. But uh, Pierre, hmm, where do we start with Pierre? Because his friends are dead. His wife is dead. That was cheating on him. Um, he sees young boys being killed. He sees his country being ravaged. He has every opportunity to become depressed and into himself. But that's not where Pierre goes, right? He, he's grown as a person. He he has seen the worst and doesn't want to be a part of that. It hasn't tarnished him, which is incredible. And you 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 root for the guy now, like, wow, so stained of all these terrible things, and you're still going to be the optimist. That is incredible. And I think that's where Tolstoy is saying is, is be a Pierre. <laughs> well, and, you know, now that he's got this new perspective, he's a lot better at how he manages his money and how he uses it. You see, when he comes back to Russia, a lot of people you know, just flee back into Russia, the pole of Russia. You know, if, if Faulkner is this writer of the pole of blood, uh, Tolstoy is the writer of the pole of the Russian spirit. And we see that that Pierre is not alone. Other people believe in getting back to life, too, as, as Moscow springs back into the energy that it once had. I guess my final thought on that is when money was so important, it was kind of elusive. And now that he's found a greater call of life, things start to get better for him. And that's uh, so Tolstoy, right? We've talked about that so many times in this story and in his other stories that when you aren't looking for those materialistic things, better things will come for you. And, and finally, now Pierre has uh, the right insight to life and he's going to have a better life and, and hopefully make Russia better as a whole. Yeah, I wish I wish Tolstoy went into more detail because some of it, I, I wanted to know more about what Pierre found. Like, okay, so he saw his wife. Right, not wife at this point in time. He saw, he saw Natasha and he didn't recognize her at first, right? Because she looked old and withered, like, like she didn't take the stride yet, right? You started talking earlier about how she became her own. I don't think, I don't think that happened yet. I think she saw a new rebirth with Maria, but you see how worn she is here, and it's only once that these two kind of finally reconnect does he, I think, I think, influence her to kind of maybe. Natasha's always been about herself and what can be right for her. I think that I think it's only in the next section that you see her rebirth. But uh, I, I think she's kind of like that one that is saved by others in a sense. Maybe. I, I don't know. I, I could see that. I think that um, I think there's some truth in the simplicity of uh, the lies that we tell ourselves of how we're going to be. Um, she has matured. I think that the, the what what sustains your happiness and i think that natasha in particular has seen that she doesn't need others to sustain her happiness and i guess that was kind of my point earlier is that she's mm -hmm. matured in what she needs and okay. now that she knows that she can finally have that yeah we, we see it come mean, up, it's a slow process 
And and I don't mean to say that, like, I, I hope that didn't come across as me saying that you were wrong. I'm just saying I didn't see it yet until the next chapter, because it's in epilogue one notes here. Let's just go ahead and move into epilogue one da, 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 transition uh, <laughs> that this is when I finally saw her care about others. And maybe that says something about me. Maybe that says something about me that my definition of living is when we look into others before we look into ourselves is that's kind of like, I think, a a higher plane of existence, a higher plane of living. I follow a lot of Kierkegaard's philosophy and theory for that, uh, which may say more about me and and my standards. But it's in this chapter when they have the children. We zoom ahead, uh, was it seven years after the War of 1812, I think is where Epilogue 1 kind of kicks off. And we see her looking after her children, looking after her family. She's no longer the self-interested Natasha. For, For me, this is when I click to say, oh, okay, so this is the new Natasha. It only took until after the book was over, we had to go to the epilogue to finally get her growth, for me at least. Well, we see finally that a relationship built on friendship and that when you are living your life and your relationship for your other, you know, you're self-sacrificing for your family, that you're going to have all these good things, I think is what Tolstoy is trying to say. Um, and, and we get a glimpse into Pierre and Natasha's uh, marriage. And, you know, we it, it's not happily ever after, but it's better after. Um, and, and then can you have on the, the other side, uh, there's a lot of tragedies that have led to this, especially uh, Nikolai and, and, and Mara. Um, and uh, there, there's, there's a lot of baggage for everybody. Uh, it just doesn't feel like that it's has the nice little neat bow that I wanted. Uh, and I didn't expect this, you know, epilogues, usually you get uh, all that closure and we really just get more of the story. It's not a traditional epilogue. So I do want people to know that, that um, and maybe you've already read the novel or you're going to read the novel. Uh, th- this is not an epilogue like you would see in a modern novel. This is very, very different, um, you know, being written, you know, 170 years ago. So be, be wary of that. And from Nikolai's perspective, he also gets married right, to to Maria. And what do we think about his growth as a character? Because he still struggles with family. She still is the one that sacrifices, and it's kind of sad the way Sonia sacrifices. It's like, it's like, even though you sacrifice, you don't always get what you want, the difference between Maria and Sonia. But Nikolai, I think, is trying to be a good person. How, how did you take his growth here at the end? So I looked at it more from a broad point as the novel is closing here and we're zooming out that... Natasha and Pierre are when you make the free will choice. And I know that we're not completely into the religiousness of Tolstoy, but I still think that it, there's a hint of it here, as you've mentioned several times before. And I think that 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 these two, Nikolai and Maria, are the idea of like predestination. If if one is free will, one is what will happen in these two different relationships. Uh, and that sometimes you don't get a choice in the matter. Yeah, I can definitely see Maria being that idea where she prays to the higher power. Right? We talk about what is that higher power. Hers has always been defined as God. And she finally gets that happiness. And, you know, Nikolai was rejecting the social behavior for the longest time, eventually married up because I think he really did care about her. Uh, but we meet at the Bolkonsky's house. We have the youngest Nikolai at that point in time. There's something to be said about young Nikolai, Nikolai, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but but Prince Andrew's son, yeah. right? Yeah. And he has that that dream, right? Like, we need to talk about this dream here because, because what does that mean, right? Like, how, how did you interpret how he viewed his father and how he viewed Pierre at the end here? I think he cares, uh, and I think that he realizes that caring is difficult and that his father had a lot of hard choices to make, and... Whether right or wrong, um, I think that he realizes that life is made up of a lot of tough choices and all these different combinations get us to where we are. And that uh, I think I think that he forgives. I think there's a little bit of forgiveness there. Uh, But I think that he realizes that um, it's difficult to be a father. Because he didn't he didn't I mean. Nicolay, Prince Andrew's son, he didn't have a father, right? His his father passed away, and even when he was alive, wasn't there for him. And he has that dream about Pierre. And Pierre, interestingly enough, is kind of, uh, I don't know, when we talk about the ideas of liberalism and conservatism within Russia, we see them kind of at ends here. And I don't know if I was supposed to take it this way, but, you know, Pierre is throwing off 
you know, there's references to a whole bunch of things here in terms of the Decemberist, uh, the, the Freemasons, like Pierre's throwing off the shackles there. And it's almost heartbreaking, at least the way I interpreted Nicolet's dreams, to see that is he having visions of being the great man, of wanting to be a great man? And where does that play into the picture of Tolstoy's whole argument here? Because it would be heartbreaking to think that he's going to change the world and become like the next Napoleon, or is he going to throw off societies and become the next Pierre? And to me, it wasn't clear how to interpret that and what that dream meant, I guess. I don't know. I'd love to hear uh, people watching you know, what your interpretations were of that one. But uh, I, I think this was, goes back to our earlier point about uh, this being a public discourse, right? Tolstoy writes it down, and it's up for us to figure out how to interpret it. And to me, this was part of that whole argument of death and rebirth, of the next generation has the ability to make that choice. And we see the choices put between them. And, and we can see how, even like when they talk about historians, uh, they change their logic, whether you believed in it because of cultural reasons or whether you believed because of free will or whether you believed that nature, you know, history happens because of great men. We all have different ways of interpreting how we got there. And here we see the youngest generation kind of being the, the choice between conservatism and liberalism is there for them. And I think that comes down to maybe this is an argument of choice and free will. And uh, it seems like he attacks free will, but he also supports it at the same time, too, at certain points in the novel. There's two things there. I think that, yes, I think Tolstoy is struggling with predestination and free will. And the other thing is, I think he's struggling with why do we give so much attention to these great men? And I think that throughout the novel, we've made this argument several times, it kind of wraps it up here at the end, that while Napoleon was a wrecking ball I think a lot of this would have happened without Napoleon, that it's all these little tiny things. It's it's the people, it's the boots on the ground. It's the normal people that are the driving force behind history, not great men. Yeah, he absolutely attacks the great men relentlessly through this book. But I wonder how much of that was more relevant at the time, right? We're, we're looking at this 170 years later. I don't think many people ha totally believe in that great men mentality anymore. Um, you know, we talked earlier about, you know, Alexander and Napoleon. Some people may have viewed them as being appointed by God, but their decisions are still human decisions, right? They may be guided in some regards, but they're still people. And they're being attacked, not only in this novel, but in 1966, Dostoevsky came out with Crime and Punishment, a great discussion on the great man and then the will to power, if you will. And I wonder how much of that was in the social consciousness at the time. That just it, Maybe I'm not totally in tune with exactly what that consciousness was, but it felt very strange to me from a modern presentis presentism perspective. So it's hard to critique because I know that it's a little unfair because I don't totally understand the social norms at the time, if that makes sense. All this philosophical stuff almost feels like background because there's character stuff still going on in the epilogue. Um, we have, you know, the Count Rostov die, um, the family starting to split up, the, they're in financial ruin. Uh, you know, we, we have all of these things that are still progressing in the epilogue, which is so crazy to me. It'd be like, I just read like nearly a thousand pages. Like, when is it going to end? <laughs> well, in... And this is the last time we see the characters, right? Because epilogue two, we ain't getting no characters, right? So this is the last time we have for growth. And you, know, you question some things with how uh, Nikolai still kind of showed his anger here. And there's still room for growth, I guess, in a sense. But, um, you know, the death, uh, again, just another example of, of the end of one thing means the beginning of the next generation. I don't know. It, to me, the ending of this book felt a little unfair to the reader, because I felt like a little bit was rehashed, a little bit was like, well, we kind of have already talked about this. Maybe there's a little bit more nuance there than I'm giving it credit for, but uh, I, I can't be the only person that felt that I was just like, okay, Tolstoy, let's wrap this up. I feel like you've talked about this. I think you need a fresher angle for discussing it for me personally. And he didn't have that fresher angle because we've seen it in so many things of, all right, Nikolai uh, goes back to the farm, gets his hands in the dirt, and things get better, and he becomes out of financial ruin, right? You work with your hands, and life's going to be good. I'm like, all right, I've seen this song and dance before. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, just, I felt like it was almost rushed for a thousand-page book. Even in this book, novel. It, even in the yeah. novel, I've seen it. <laughs> Yeah, it it, it, it it feels rehashed and rushed at the same time. I don't know if that makes sense, but I guess 
I was expecting more out of an, an epilogue, knowing that there were two of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, let's let's move into epilogue two, the grand finale, which, um, you know, t- I was expecting more plot, but but nothing happens. It's all philosophy, and and I'm just gonna put it on the table right now that I think Tolstoy. I think he did some really brilliant things with here. Some things didn't stand the test of time, but that's not his fault. I mean, that's just kind of time in older novels. But there's some parts that I just didn't totally agree with. I think some of the stuff should have been worked into the novel earlier. Uh, I thought he had some really cool philosophical ideas and appreciate what he had there. But there's just enough that's just like, it's a little off. Like, I'm like, I just don't understand exactly the hang up that Tolstoy had with this sometimes. I felt like a lot of it came down to he has so many things crammed in here. I don't think that there was ever going to be a perfect ending. I don't think that us readers now or readers back then were ever going to be content with that. I mean, how could you follow up arguably one of the greatest novels of all time with a, a happy ending or an unhappy ending that makes some people happy? I, I don't think that was possible. But you have all of these power struggles of great men and not great men. You have all these conflicts, you have character growth, you have loss of life and death and how that, you know, changes us as a people. You have high society, low society, French society, Russian society. Uh, I I don't think that there's anything that a historical fiction novel could do to satisfy all of the readers. Um, And I don't know if we deserve that as a reader. I, I don't think that, that Tolstoy has to give that to us. I think that he leaves us wanting and yearning more. And I think that's the true nature of why this is arguably the greatest novel ever. Okay. Do you um do you think that there's any resentment from Tolstoy's side of maybe how he wrote Napoleon? Like like it felt very tongue in cheek the way that like he'd be like you know, he's described as grand, as grand, chance, chance. Like, like he's almost like attempting to be a little snide with the description of how pff, Napoleon's just a man, right? Like, you guys got to stop building him up, which maybe at that time in history, he, he was built up more. And the great man argument was a bigger ideal back then. But it felt like, um, so some of it was was really good, but it also felt like the fact that it was, Tinged that, that that there was a, a shade of resentment to the glory Napoleon received that it felt like I wasn't getting a purely open discussion sometimes with how much he wanted to attack uh, Napoleon at this point in time. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that Tolstoy, in my interpretation of it, is great at writing fictional characters and didn't struggle writing nonfiction characters, but Napoleon feels like he lacked a soul um, or emotion. He was like a robot or just a, 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 he was a plot device, even though in the, the story in the novel, he's arguing that he's not a plot device. Like that's how detached I think Tolstoy wants to be from Napoleon in this story. I, I like some of the arguments, right? Because you had the uh, the devil in the steam train example that I thought was really cool with, okay, you know, when we're looking at history and we're trying to understand how did this happen, I really like the devil in the steam train because it's just like, okay, well, do we try to explain how locomotion works, right? Like how, how that works? Or do you try to disprove that the devil exists, right? And, and I just, I would love to have seen that actually woven into the narrative with the characters, obviously not the train part because they didn't exist yet <laughs> in 1812, <laughs> but, but the idea, right? Like, like, like does, do you have to have knowledge of something or do you have to like, like knowledge of a system or do you have to have experience of it? It's kind of the a priori posteriori uh, discussion here is kind of what I thought. And I'd love to have seen that pushed further into the knowledge. Like, I don't understand why it was tacked on as philosophy at the end. Cause I don't think, I think he's an author. I don't think he's a philosopher for the most part, but I do think he does have great philosophical ideas and, and I, maybe I'm attacking the negative parts too much, but I don't know why that is. Cause I thought there were really good ideas, but maybe it's cause sometimes you hear nothing but praise for a novel, but I, I think it's okay for us to criticize. You can love every word of this book and still talk about how some ideas weren't either clear or didn't make sense, I guess. In regards with Napoleon, when I think about that, of he's making this argument that great men sometimes don't matter as much as they think they do, and that 
history cannot be altered that much by one individual. But then Tolstoy goes on to argue that in his other stories, and again, we're critiquing him as an author, and I don't think we're critiquing him just as a novel, and that's the difference, is he's saying, well, in my faith, if, if you know, God comes to earth as, you know, Christ, he is that single person that's powerful enough to change the world. Uh, and why wouldn't we want to have the free will to have the ability to change the world and the betterment? So people can't change, no single person can change the world in a negative way, but if they change it in a positive way, that's okay. And that's one of the kind of big things that I got from the novel, and I don't think that's fair. If, if one person can change the world and they have free will, they can change it for the better or for the negative. And that being of a different society doesn't make a difference. And he's saying a little bit of that it does. He, he is putting that, you know, spin of, you know, national pride patriotism in there that we've talked about before. And I think it's okay to critique, uh, you know, the, the novel and love it as, as well. When we talk about free will, the, the do you have the ability to change the future, right? The definition of one basis of free will. Uh, some people talk about free will, about being able to choose what you want. Uh, we're talking about actions, right? He has this like empiricist type view. Like he'd get along really well with like Locke and Hume, I think, because how do you know what's good or bad until afterwards? You have him taking a very like scientific approach to, to it, I think, almost like kind of like Wittgenstein or, or, or Bertrand Russell would, the way that he looks at this. And I really appreciated that side of the way he broke down, you know, a history. This this had all the markings to be like one of our favorite novels because of the historian philosophy combining here. But it's almost like, um, remember the the story, The Bet by Chekhov that we read? Oh, yeah. The, that's a great one. <laughs> Lock well, me if away. You remember, <laughs> if you remember, one of the main words that's really important there is a priori. Can you know something before it happens? Or do you have to experience it? The empirical and Pierce's view. It's kind of like that here where he talks about like from a historical standpoint, are they acting and do we talk about them to, acting upon behalf of morality and even understanding what is the good of morality here? And then when we separate it, because, you know, remember Tolstoy is writing this in mid 1860s, looking back on something that happened in 1812, you know, 1814 years, decades ago. And does that remove us a little bit about how we view orders, how we view free will at that point in time and what someone chose? There's that strange analogy about the log, about which way do you move the log and the one that when the log went the way, one of the eight people said it was going to go this way, that that's the person that gave the orders. It felt like a very strange conversation to me that I wasn't really sure I understood exactly. Um, but to me, it, it came down to this idea of how do we know empirically mathematically figure out what's the right moral law or free will way of choosing things. And historians can't do that and look back at like, at, at, it's almost like historians can't discover first cause. They can only describe events as will. And I completely agree with some of the things that he said in that section. I, one thing that the novel feels like it leaves out is that a lot of times morality comes from a place of faith uh, and it oversimplifies things where this novel is trying to make morality out of the choices of people and very difficult situations. They're in a war and it, it, the, there's life and death and suffering, but there can still be good also. Yeah. There's so much in this novel going so many different directions. I feel like that Tolstoy is just trying to say in the end, uh, you have to try to make yourself happy, uh, whether that is based on your own faith or your own morality uh, or whether you're being selfish or not, that may or may not happen. Uh, that because the free will of one person is going to interact with the free will of another. It's very, the, the, the truth is subjective type of argument. I feel like sometimes uh, which needs to go further in order for it to be truly valuable, because otherwise that's just very crackerjack philosophy, if you ask me, that you, you need to go further into why is truth is subjective here. But um, I, I think I think when we look at this, we need to also talk about translation because I don't we don't bring that up every time we talk about a translated work because I mean it's it's just a redundant statement. Uh, it's not like we don't know it's not translated, but when he's talking about 
the word power, when we talk about elected individuals and delegated authority and free will, um, he, he uses power multiple in multiple different situations. And for me, I'm like, I constantly wonder, like, I'm like, is this translate the same in Russian? Because when he says, okay, power means this here and power means the opposite here. So it means we don't understand the word power. And to me, I'm like, well, I, I just, I wonder how much of that is translation and how much of that is just like, well, the word power in this context doesn't mean the same as in that context. I think to me, at least in the English translation, it seems like he was bewitching himself with the definitions of words as opposed to what words represent behind the scene. And, and when you're comparing words, it's not the same thing as comparing what they represent in different contexts, I think. The final thing to say is that I, I love the novel. Uh, I think that there's always going to be something lost in translation. Uh, it, I don't think it's perfect. Um, I definitely think it has a good argument to be the greatest novel of all time. Then uh, that's saying something. I mean, it, it depth the top three, top five. But I think it's what you're looking for, uh, what you're looking to get out of this novel is something as well. If you read a different translation, that is going to get you to, I think, a different destination. And Tolstoy wouldn't have written it that way. I don't think that he would have known it was going to be translated to you know, English and, you know, Dutch or, you know, Mandarin or Japanese, because there is going to be something lost there. But I still think that you can get something important out of the novel that we can grow as people and that uh, we all can make a difference. Uh, this was not one of the greatest novels to me, but that doesn't mean that I don't see that it's one of the greatest novels to others. And I don't disrespect it. it. There's some things that I honestly think objectively should be would be updated if Tolstoy were to rewrite it today. You know what I mean? Like like looking at certain elements of what we consider socially acceptable is not how it would be presented today. But Tolstoy future-proofed that, right? Because he even in the book talks about that, about how we change throughout time and the further distance away we are from things. There's the argument and the fallacy of presentism. Presentism, but I can't say the word right now. But I, I think that's rather brilliant. So I think Tolstoy pulled off something very remarkable. Um, my dissatisfaction, yeah, maybe part of it is is the flaw of presentivism. And maybe part of it is just I just didn't really enjoy some of the writing. I, it felt very backy forthy. I, I didn't feel like it progressed and maybe rehashed things more than I would have liked. But that's just a personal thing. I'm not saying they're objectively wrong, per se. So I don't know. Good, good. Very glad I read it. And I think it definitely has a place uh, in world literature for what it accomplished. Um, I guess I guess maybe it just what didn't hit on all cylinders, but maybe I need to read it again. I don't know. This, this was just a first pass for me, right? Definitely should be on a list of to read, right? It doesn't just because we rank something, whatever our opinion is, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't read this novel because you might get something out of it or you might hate it. And that's OK, too, because you get something out of it. <laughs> yeah, well, if you sat through a five hour not, uh, discussion and didn't read it, I'd love to hear who you are. <laughs> and I'd love Thank to you hear for your subscribing. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on for those that did read it, which I'm assuming is most of you at this point, what your th the, what your thoughts were on the novel. Um, thought it was a great novel. Tell me what you loved about it because that would help me maybe see some things that maybe are I didn't interpret correctly or maybe I just didn't see correctly. Love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below. Make sure you hit that subscribe if you spent this much time with us. There's probably other novels that we can uh, discuss together to probably help each other out, get the most out of our readings. My name has been Una. I appreciate the time that you guys have spent here today and appreciate you guys for, uh, you know, just sharing your thoughts and such. So peace out. Peace.